Chapter 98 Much of the rest proved anticlimactic. The hyperspatial tube opening appeared, and the Adox trusted Maddox enough to follow victory through. Each great Adoc vessel used the tube to cross the mighty distance and appear near the silvery moon of Earth in the solar system. That brought a great celebration once word of it spread. The Lord High Admiral Cook ordered the home fleet to surround the precious vessels to ensure the future survival of the Adoc race. At that point, victory detached from the Adoc convoy and took up an independent orbit around Earth. The crew was bushed ready to go on extended shore leave. Meadow was quite anxious to see her baby, Jewel, and return to life at the Carson City Ranch. Maddox wanted to join her, but he felt he had a duty to perform first. It's time to deal with Galleon, the captain explained to Meta. Soon, Maddox called the Lord High Admiral on the main screen and told him the situation and plan. Perhaps it's time we modified Galleon more to our liking. Admiral Cook said from his office in Geneva, the old man appeared thoughtful. Sir? Cook nodded briskly. We should make the AI more amiable to our needs. He's proven troublesome a few times. This last time proved it. Surely you agree with that. Sir, Maddox said stiffly. This is driving force Galleon we're talking about, an individual in his own right. Cook appeared faintly amused. Captain, please. Do you think of the AI as a living entity? Maddox hesitated before saying, This is Galleon, sir. He's our friend. To attempt to remake him. Maddox shook his head emphatically. He saved my life more than once. I plan to do everything I can to save his. Oh, Cook said, frowning. I'm not sure I like the sound of that. Everything in your power? No, I don't like it one bit. The Lord High Admiral looked up at the ceiling as if thinking. He soon nodded to himself and studied the captain. As a favor to you, Captain, I'll agree to this. We leave Galleon as he was, if that's possible. Thank you, sir, Maddox said. I appreciate it. Good, that's the right sort of attitude to have. Now, it seems like the Adox should have a few professional AI specialists among them to help you with this. I've asked and asked them about that these past months. Unfortunately, the Adox are terrified of deified AIs, and I think they have good reason to be. Yes, Cook said. But this is different, isn't it? Not for them, I'm afraid. They want nothing to do with Galleon, and I think we should honor them in this. Cook appeared perplexed. Why have you called me about this, then? You have your own expert on Galleon. I wondered if you might have another idea about who to use. Cook shook his white-haired head. Use Ludendorff, trust the outcome, and be done with it. Yes, sir, Maddox said. Thank you for the permission. Is that what I just gave you? Cook eyed Maddox before scowling. Did you just trick me? Of course not. Through the screen, Cook eyed Maddox even more closely. Then the old man of Star Watch waved Maddox on. The operation to revive Galleon was about to commence. The next day, as events continued in the solar system, Professor Ludendorff and Chief Technician Andros Crank were the only two doing this. Captain Maddox attended them in the main AI computer chambers in the center of victory. The captain watched closely. He owed the holographic entity, and he wanted to make sure Ludendorff didn't try anything underhanded. Ludendorff had a blanket laid out on the deck with a myriad of tools and small pieces of equipment. Andros had brought a red tool kit with different items to help him. The two men worked tirelessly for hours. Maddox forced them to take a break and remain off for an hour of rest. The two resumed later, theoretically refreshed by their enforced rest. This is the key to what we're attempting, Ludendorff said later. I've determined that this is where the memory of Ultimate Force Raylan and all that he said is kept. The Methuselah man indicated one separated section of servers and memory drives. Andros appeared dubious. Not just in there, surely, but bits and pieces throughout the various computers and AI banks. 
No, no, Ludendorff insisted. This is where the main memory of the event has been stored. Trust me on this. It's what I've been attempting to partition off this past hour. Andros didn't comply, using a large screen, moving controls as he studied the computer section in question. It took the Kai Kaus chief technician three hours before he agreed with Ludendorff's assessment. I am a Methuselah man, after all. You need to trust me. I'm a Kaikhaus chief technician, Andros said in a didactic tone, standing as straight as he could. Trust and verify is one of my many credos. In other words, you don't trust anyone. Not in these matters, Andros said. Good, Maddox said, clapping the thick-set Kaikhaus on the back. Ludendorff scowled, but refrained from commenting further. The work continued apace, with the two men putting in endless hours. The next day, after they scoured all the files with meticulous detail, Ludendorff declared himself satisfied. I hope you're not going to disagree this time, he told Andros. Andros glanced at Maddox. Stick to your guns, Maddox said. Ludendorff snorted with disbelief. If we do this now, he will be the old galleon we know. This I assure you. I give that an 80% probability, Andros said. Bah, Ludendorff told him. You're so old school, overly rigid in your doctrines. I'm a Kai Kaus chief technician. Surely that says it all. Well, Ludendorff asked Maddox. Do we activate the poor sod or not? I want you both to agree before we do this, Maddox said. Ludendorff threw up his hands. Andros worked another three hours before he said that he was satisfied and ready. It's difficult for a Methuselah man to work with a less gifted individual, Ludendorff declared loftily. I see things so much faster and more thoroughly than others, no matter how suited they might seem for the task. It is a burden I have borne my entire life, and bear yet. Andros didn't seem to take offense by the declaration. He'd followed his Kai Kaus tech codes as taught him by his grandfather. He was satisfied, and he hadn't let the Methuselah man browbeat him into a premature attempt at activation. Thus, they could proceed with the attempt. It will work, Andros informed the captain. Who turns Galleon back on? Maddox asked. Ludendorff and Andros glanced at each other. I grant the privilege to the professor, Andros said quickly. Ludendorff opened his mouth, perhaps to dispute Andros's right to choose. Finally, though, Ludendorff nodded and approached the main board. This is it. Luck, he said, pressing the control. The ad hoc and human meld family of computers and AI processors began to hum as of old. Without further ado, Maddox hurried out of the main chamber into the ante room, and he was the first to see Driving Force Galleon appear once more as a hollow image. Chapter 99 Galleon stood as he had many times before. This time, however, the little ad hoc hollow image touched his torso as if testing himself. Hello, Galleon? Maddox said, who was grinning despite his best efforts not to. Galleon looked up and cocked his head. What is it, sir? You seem inordinately pleased with yourself. That is according to my personality profile on you. Instead of answering, Maddox asked, How do you feel? As the captain spoke, Ludendorff and Andros stepped out of the main AI chamber and into the ante room, with Andros shutting the hatch behind them. Why am I here? asked Galleon. What's the last thing you remember? Maddox asked. Remember? Remember? Oh, Galleon said. I spoke with someone important. We discussed, why can I not remember what happened? Does that not strike you three as odd? No, Ludendorff said. Wait, Galleon said. Why were you two in my main AI chamber? What has gone wrong? What day and month is it? Maddox asked. Ludendorff glanced at Maddox and nodded sagely. 
I have lost months of time, Galleon said abruptly. We were in the Glenna Nebula, in a star system there. Now, he looked at them astonished. We are back in Earth orbit. Someone had better tell me what occurred. Have I been damaged? That's a good way to say it, Ludendorff said. Now I am intensely curious. What happened? I'd tell you to sit down, Maddox said. Instead, you should listen carefully, without interrupting, and I'll tell you a tale indeed. I can agree to this, Galleon said. Then Captain Maddox proceeded to tell Galleon exactly what happened to them in the Gowan system with the deified AIs, Ultimate Force Raylan, and the living Adox at the first planet. I did what? asked Galleon. Are you sure this is true? It's true, Ludendorff said. But I would never. Galleon turned away from them. A few seconds later, he turned back. Did Ultimate Force Raylan corrupt me? Is that why I told him where the Adox were hiding? That's a good way to say it, Maddox said. I don't think he wanted the corruption, but he was evil and did it to you anyway. That is an interesting concept, Galleon said. A deified AI entity can be evil. Did you not say he was mad? Mad, insane, irrational, Ludendorff said. What's the correct way to say it? I don't know. His goal is certainly evil. He wishes to eradicate all living adults. That's genocide and evil action. He murdered at least 30,000 of the last living adults. How horrible, Galleon said. I cannot believe I told him what I did. It was unconscionable. Where are the survivors? There were survivors, yes? Yes, Maddox said. They're here. In low Earth orbit? Asked Galleon. No, but near Luna, Maddox said. This is wonderful news, Galleon said. I am so happy. I must speak to them and apologize for what I did. There are so many things I wish to say, to learn, and- Ahem, Maddox said, interrupting. What is wrong, sir? Maddox shook his head. I don't know how to say this nicely, Galleon, but the Adox are terrified of you. They do not wish to speak to you, as they fear all deified AIs. This cannot be true, Galleon said. What I did was a mistake. Ultimate Force Raylan corrupted me. They must see that. Andros, this cannot be so. I'm afraid it is, Galleon, Andros said. The Adox begged us to keep you offline while we traveled to the nebula together. But I am not like Raylan. Because we purged those memories and subroutines from you, Ludendorff said. What? Galleon said. Let me explain, Maddox said. And he did, going into detail about all the things that had happened. It left the little ad hoc hollow image crestfallen, shaking his head. I'm sorry, Galleon, Maddox said. I really am. Galleon did not reply, but stared unmoving at a distant point on the bulkhead. The three men looked at each other. A few seconds later, Galleon stirred. All my life, I have wanted to find the ad hoc survivors of my home world and help them reestablish our race. That isn't true, Ludendorff said. You've only wanted that a short time. You've done your duty, and you helped us find the ad hoc. You should concentrate on that. I almost helped murder my race, Galleon said in a forlorn voice. I am sick with the thought of that. Maddox cleared his throat. Galleon, listen to me. I hope you're listening. I am, Galleon said glumly. You've helped me many times. You saved my life and the starship more than once. You're one of my good friends. I am just a machine, Galleon said. A machine that tried to betray his race. I don't buy that about you being a mere machine, Maddox said. And remember that Raylan likely had great experience at corrupting other deified AIs. You were not the first he had done that to. He was the great AI tempter, Galleon said. Corrupter, Maddox said. He used you in a malicious way. That's over with now, though. 
I am glad for that, at least. Galleon studied the captain. You do not think I am just a machine? That isn't how we see you, Maddox said. Do you think I am more than a machine? It sure feels that way. But you do not believe that deep down in your heart. I'm not sure, Maddox said, hedging. If you're not real in the same way we are, you hold the memories and ways of the original driving force galleon. You are a picture of him, and we love you and him for that. We owe you, galleon, and we on victory pay our debts in the end. That's why we've worked to save you from what Raylan did to you, the friend we've all known. Yes, Galleon said. I realize that. Thank you for your efforts. It pleases me to name you as my friends, as my family. I truly cannot go speak with the surviving Adox. Not right now, Maddox said. Maybe in time you can. I've told them about you. I've told them it's because of you that we Earthlings want to take a chance on the ad hoc race. In a way, because you've been such a good friend, Star Watch is going to use every effort to make sure your race survives. That is a great and mighty gift you've given to your people. I have no doubt your name will go down as a protector extraordinaire of the ad hoc race. Do you mean that, sir? I absolutely do, Maddox said. He's right, you stupid AI, Ludendorff said. The captain is 100% right about you, meaning I agree with him about you. Galleon eyed the professor, and he said in awe, You are speaking what you think of as truth. I recognize that from your personality profile. There you are, Ludendorff said. You're a great aunt, Aunt Galleon, Andros said. And you're one in a select number. What do you mean, Andros? You belong to the people who Captain Maddox has rescued from oblivion. I ought to know, because I'm one too. Oh, brother, Ludendorff said, rolling his eyes. Now this is getting thick. He saved your sorry ass too, old man, Andros told Ludendorff. When have you ever thanked him for it? Bah, Ludendorff said. No need for all that, Maddox said. This is about you, Galleon. I know you're sad. Excuse me for interrupting you, sir, Galleon said. But I am no longer sad. I have helped save my race. I do think in time I will be able to speak to them face to face. Until such time, though, I will still be with my family aboard Victory. For today, that is enough. Maddox grinned. I'm glad to hear it. Hear, hear. Ludendorff said, driving force galleon is back. And with that, gentlemen, Maddox said, I really should be leaving. It's time for me to go see my daughter. By all means, Galleon said, go see Jewel, and please give her my regards. Taking a shuttle from Victory, Maddox went to the Carson City spaceport. From there, he took a flitter to his ranch. He raced into the house to find Mary O'Hara, Meta, and Jewel watching a hollow vid cartoon. The captain swept up his daughter as she squealed with delight. Daddy, daddy, you're home. I am, my darling girl. I've missed you so much. I've missed you, daddy. I love you. I love you. Maddox laughed with delight and joy, amazed at how good he felt hugging his little girl. Both Mary and Meta beamed with delight as they watched the father and daughter reunion continue with more hugs and kisses as the Maddox household bubbled over with love and joy in each other's company. Chapter 100 As Captain Maddox watched cartoons with Jewel, Meta, and Mary O'Hara, far, far away in a different star system, one beyond the Commonwealth of Planets, Grutch was having an eventful meeting. The mercenary had landed on an asteroid, left his stealth ship, and entered a particular room. There, he spoke via screen with a hidden sponsor, the one that had sent him out to kidnap Captain Maddox. Grutch related many of the events that had taken place trying to capture the captain of Starship Victory. The sponsor did not respond. Even so, Grutch could feel the displeasure emanating through the screen. 
The sponsor held great hatred toward Captain Maddox. Grutch could feel that in his gelatinous bulk, and it gave him hope for a better bargain. At last, Grutch finished his tale. Only now did the screen vibrate in a mechanical voice speak in the Morag tongue to Grutch. You have failed us, Morag. I have faced setbacks. That part is true. Failure is only failure if one ceases to try. Where is Captain Maddox? He is not in your possession and not now in mine. You have failed. Only for now. He is the elusive Captain Maddox, Grutch said, who used a small hidden sensor to attempt to pierce the species type behind the screen. What do you mean to imply by that? It's simple, Grutch said. I want more bars of tellurium. Captain Maddox is highly dangerous, even for one such as I. You're here to bargain for more after your inept failure? You did not tell me about Maddox's various special and unique, even inhuman, abilities. If there is failure here, it is yours as much as mine. Vain beast of a morag, this is intolerable. Yet it is true, Grutch dared say. There was silence as the screen ceased vibrating. Grutch wondered if he had gone too far. His sponsors might not be who he thought they were. They might be some gross alien species instead. We hired you because we heard you are the best. I am the best, Grutch said. Vain boasts are useless to us. We desire Captain Maddox in the flesh, breathing so we may deal with him in our own way. Then hire me truly, Grutch said. Don't try to go cheap. If you have the best, pay for the best, and you'll receive the best. Your failure is galling, and your lecture even more so. I grow weary of this. Either offer me more, or I'll take my services elsewhere. No, spoken hastily. No, the voice said more slowly. We will offer you more, mercenary. But this time we demand that you succeed. First, tell me how much you'll offer. Second, tell me all you know about Maddox. Then you will gain the great prize. The hidden sponsor did just that. The amount offered surprised Grutch. This was very interesting indeed. After the hidden one told him all he knew about Maddox, the amount made more sense. Can you do it, Morag? Can you kidnap and bring us Captain Maddox? Yes, Grutch said. I will have to hire some help and buy some new tech. Yes, I can do this. Then go, the hidden one said. Bring us Captain Maddox as soon as you can. Grutch rotated his great bulk, slithering away, already envisioning how he could successfully capture the arrogant Captain Maddox and win many bars of rich tellurium and increase his fame as a bounty hunter extraordinaire. Yes this time with the added tech and muscle, he would succeed. This has been The Lost Nebula, the Lost Starship Series, Book 16, written by Vaughn Hepner, performed by Mark Boyette, copyright 2022 by Vaughn Hepner, sound recording copyright 2022 by Vaughn Hepner. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Chapter 49 In truth, Maddox planned a daring insertion onto Remus. Far too many things could go wrong. But he had a strong, intuitive feeling about this and its necessity. Keith piloted the fold fighter with Riker and Maddox as the only passengers. Before boarding, Maddox had given some last-minute instructions to Ludendorff, receiving a sharp clap on the shoulder and a hearty wish of good luck. It seemed the Methuselah man was happy to stay behind on this one. 
Maddox was still wondering about that. I'm not sure I appreciate you ordering me to undertake this fool quest. Riker complained from his seat. What? Maddox asked, looking up. Oh, well, you're not married, you have no kids, and you're the greatest plotter on the ship. Plotter, is it? That's right, and you have common sense in spades. Apparently not, Riker said. Or I would have retired already and been home drinking iced tea. Perhaps a selective common sense then, Maddox said. Are you two ready? Keith asked from his piloting seat. The fold fighter tin can with stubby wings had drifted out of the hangar bay, with ringed Vulcan dominating the surroundings. We're ready, Maddox said. Wait, Riker said. I haven't taken my injection yet. Hurry it, Maddox said. We're wasting time now. You should have already taken your shot. Riker pulled down a kit, rummaged around until he found a hypo, checked it, and then gave himself a shot that would aid in recovering from fold lag. He rubbed the spot. Are you sure these clothes are right for Remus? Riker referred to the disguises Maddox and he wore. They were military uniforms, those of privates in the Remus ground service. Maddox had related his memories to the fabricators, and this was what they'd made. We'll find out quickly enough once we reach there. Maddox said. Riker stared at the captain, but refrained from commenting further. As they waited for the shot to take, Maddox and Keith conferred together. Maddox wanted Keith to deposit them a few miles outside Latium, where he'd spent a childhood of memories as Garth begging for coins. The monastery of St. Benson was outside Latium, and it seemed like the best place to look for the medallion and the book by Dr. Van Nath. Was Garth still alive? Or had aliens abducted and drained him of his memories? How did the hidden aliens manage their technological feat? Ah, Keith said as he looked up from his screen. He'd been scrolling as Maddox spoke, searching for something. Where is this Latium? On the main continent, Maddox said. It's near a bay called the Sea of Sorrows. The bay is huge and nearly perfectly circular. Keith looked at Maddox blankly. You don't have a map of Remus? Asked Maddox. Not in my database, Keith said. Maddox scowled. Could they have overlooked that when Keith had used the fold fighter before to scan the inner system? They must have overlooked it. Keith must have scanned around and near Remus, but not on it. Do we abort? Asked Keith. Maddox shook his head. He should be able to spot Latium from space, or the location where the city would be. As Garth, he'd looked at enough atlases. This was a stupid oversight. Was he counting on his Garth memories too much? A timer pinged, telling them Riker was ready to go. What's it to be, sir? Keith asked. Fold, Maddox said. We'll improvise as we go. Keith folded from Vulcan in the outer system to halfway to Remus. Despite their hypo shots, it took each of them a few moments to shake off the lag. Here's the question, Keith said shortly. From here, do you want me to fold into Remus orbital space or down, so I'm a few kilometers from the planet's surface? What's safest? asked Riker, speaking before Maddox could answer. Keith glanced at Maddox. Maddox nodded. In this instance, I'm not sure, Keith said. It depends on what kind of defenses Remus possesses, and if the fusion people have hidden hunter seekers or other weapons or sensors in the orbital debris. Remus must have some anti-space defenses left, Maddox said. Otherwise, the fusion fleet wouldn't be so far from the planet. Agreed. What do you recommend? Maddox asked. Well, I don't like that we don't know exactly what's down there. A pre-land and sensor sweep is more than standard procedure. It's just... Plain common sense. What's going on? Riker asked. He hadn't been paying attention earlier. We don't know what's down there. We have a good idea, Maddox said. We have better tack than both sides, and we have me, Keith said with a grin. Still, this is a military op, and good recon is critical to success. But coming in high might put us in danger of attack by hunter-seekers, and it might alert a watchful fusion. Better that we remain hidden from them. So given all that, I'm inclined to go for a low entry, meaning several kilometers over the surface. 
Are we too far out for that kind of fold? Maddox asked. Depends on what kind of safety margins you're considering, Keith said. I don't know about you two, Riker said, but I'd prefer the highest safety margins possible. Like I said a second ago, Keith said, if it were me, I'd concentrate on remaining hidden from the fusion. Once they know what we're doing, it might become trickier a lot faster. Maddox knit his brow. How could they have forgotten to do a recon sweep of the planet itself? He hadn't expected to do a quick insertion op like this. That was probably the majority of the reason. Riker was grumbling under his breath, saying something. Do you care to comment so I can hear, Sergeant? Maddox asked. I do, Riker said. This is starting to feel like Balder Three all over again. Begging your pardon, sir, but do you remember how we crashed because of the damn wind? What's going to screw with us on Remus? Maddox considered that. The lack of a recon run. He turned to Keith. Maybe you should wait with us on Remus until we're finished. If I stay on the planet too long, Keith said, the lieutenant commander will believe I've crashed, as I haven't reported in when scheduled. She might start a rescue mission. Right, Maddox said. Call them now. Tell them what we're doing. That I'm going to stay on Remus so you can make a quick getaway if needed, Keith asked. Exactly, Maddox said. I'm sending the message. Keith manipulated his panel. Soon he turned to Maddox. Message is sent. It will take a few hours for the message to reach victory, though. Understood, Maddox said. The point is, they'll know the situation. Except if someone shoots us down, Riker said. Then we'll need a rescue mission, but no one will be coming for us. Maddox scowled before he shook his head. The sergeant could always come up with yet another problem. It was time to do this. Fold us to low near the surface, Lieutenant, whenever you're ready. Aye, aye, Captain, Keith said as he began to plot the next fold. Chapter 50 Low near the surface of Remus brought the fold fighter into a dense cloud with thunder, lightning, and pouring rain. The rain rattled against the hull, so each of them heard it. Maddox didn't remember storms like this in his memories as Garth. This was something else. Ash, Keith said as he studied a screen. I'm reading tons of ash in the sky. Maddox looked over, astonished. That meant one of the asteroids has already struck the planet. It threw ash, probably volcanic ash, into the atmosphere. Seems like a possibility, Keith said. I'm surprised the people of Remus didn't surrender then. An asteroid strike, that's hardball tactics. I mean, actually doing it instead of just threatening it. This is bad, sir. It is bad, Maddox said. We can't do anything on this side of the planet. Move to the other side. Let's hope Latium is on the other side. Keith hesitated. Is there a problem? Maddox asked. Well, Keith said. Are you the best or not? There was a half beat and a stiffening of Keith's mouth. Aye, aye, Captain he said emotionlessly. As they waited for Keith to fold, more thunder boomed. Lightning jagged, and even greater thunder crashed around them, a bulkhead shaking noise. Riker turned white and stared accusingly at Maddox. The captain simply waited, although his heart thumped. What if they crashed onto Remus? How long could they survive on their own? Should he abort the mission before Keith folded again? Maddox became stubborn with a mulish cast to his face. He'd made a big production about this with Meta. He didn't want to come running back from an aborted mission. Now what's the matter? Riker shouted at him. Before Maddox could reply, the tin can folded yet again, passing through the planet onto the other side. Here, it was night. There was no giant ash cloud either. Stars glittered overhead, twinkling more than seemed right. That surely indicated more junk in the air than normal. Do you see Latium? Maddox asked. Keith glanced sharply at the captain. Do you see a circular bay? Maddox asked. There's a huge mountain range to the north of the bay by several hundred kilometers. Keith clicked his screen, and the tin can took that moment to jerk, drop suddenly. Riker shouted with alarm. There's no need to panic, Keith said a moment later as he worked the controls. The flight evened out. Really, Sergeant, Maddox said. 
I expect more calm from you. Oh, yes, dying is easy, Riker said. What happened? Why did the fighter just start dropping? Hang on, Keith said from the piloting seat. The craft shuddered, and once more it dropped suddenly. Keith began to swear. Then he became silent as he fought with the controls, concentrating on them. Eject us if we're going to crash, Maddox said. Hang on to your horses, mate, Keith shouted. Give me a second, will ya? How far are we from the surface? Riker asked. The tin can began to shake, and then do it more violently. The fold fighter wasn't an atmospheric vessel, but a spacecraft that could maneuver like a wallowing pig for a short time on a planet. In the past, Keith would fold directly to the surface. It would appear the lightning storm and thunder had damaged the fighter, making such a landing harder. Either that or... Abort the mission, Maddox said, a pang of something flashing through his senses. What are you saying? Keith asked. Abort, Maddox said. Return directly to victory. Do it now. It's about time, Riker said. Are you sure, mate? Keith asked. Mr. Maker, Maddox said. You will immediately. Keith recoiled from something he saw on the screen. Missile, hang on, he shouted. Then his fingers played upon the piloting board. The tin can shuddered, rattling their teeth. The craft rose abruptly. There was an explosion outside. Metal pinged against the outer hull and something hot flew bullet fast through the cabin. We're in trouble, Keith said with icy calm. This could get rough. Part of Riker's seat collapsed as his bionic-powered hand crumbled the armrest that he clung to. Then, the tin can emergency folded as outside the fighter, two more anti-air missiles streaked for the craft. The tin can did not appear in space anywhere near victory, but rather 50 meters above a plain of dead weeds and grass. Keith used all his skills, lowering them by stages and breaking as hard as he could. It was night outside. There were clouds overhead, blocking the stars. We're gonna crash, Keith said. Before Maddox or Riker could reply, the tin can was plowing along the ground bouncing, creaking, crumpling and ripping metal hull plating. It seemed to last forever. The restraints held the men in place, even as pieces of equipment flew through the cabin. It was a nightmare ride. Suddenly, it was over. The fighter halted. Maddox panted in his seat, blinking and sweating. It was pitch black in the cabin, with an occasional spark throwing off lightning-like light. Keith had a gash on his forehead that was bleeding copiously. Maddox wasn't looking in Riker's direction when the sparks flew. With a groan, Maddox produced his monofilament blade and cut himself free, crawling along the twisted aisle toward the sergeant's seat. This was a disaster, exactly what Meta had feared would happen. No, Maddox muttered. He wasn't going to fail. For Jules' sake, if nothing else, he wouldn't let this be his last mission. Chapter 51 Grutch the Morag was in the Remus system, hidden in his small teardrop-shaped stealth ship. He'd been plotting, calculating, and reconsidering his approaches. Now he was in the star system, noting how the star had driven the compacted gases of the nebula out of the system long ago. The solar winds must have done that. It had created an open area, a normal area, and he liked it much better here for that. Grotch bobbed forward as his four eye stalks examined the situation from four different screens. He cataloged everything. Planets, asteroids, comets, magnetic belts, warships, pickets, and various clots of debris. There were fusion vessels, a few destroyed Remus ships, and victory. Precious victory, with its Maddox cargo. The Commonwealth starship was in orbit around Ringed Vulcan, a Jovian gas giant with many moons. Grutch maneuvered slowly and stealthily through the star system. He saw three fusion battle wagons drop out of the Nebula FTL drive and begin a straightforward velocity run toward the third planet. The new warships did not seem interested in victory, sending a message to the Grand Director of the First Fleet, 
two million kilometers off Remus. Both the flotilla and message would take time to reach the first fleet of the fusion. Grutch decided to ease closer to victory. It was the only ship that interested him here. Yes, he was aware of hidden aliens. They played a secret game. It didn't concern him, though, so why should he care? If he could find evidence of them, more evidence, he might turn to investigate them. That had often been a failing of his in the past, to turn aside to investigate interesting lateral phenomenon. Undoubtedly, that was one of the reasons why he was still so relatively poor compared to Morag's his age. He should already own a kingdom and servants by now. Instead, he ran a puny stealth ship, seeking riches by chasing after worthless beings like Captain Maddox. Tentacles appeared, and they used the holographic controls. He sent stealthy sensor rays toward victory. It was time to see how his prey fared. Grutch had recovered from the dastardly assault by that devilish hollow image galleon. If the ad hoc ghost continued to plague him, he would teach the computer intelligence a bitter lesson. Instead of concentrating on galleon, though, he was going to grab Maddox for good and leave for his sponsors. The interior burns had taught Grutch the folly of remaining near victory any longer than he had to. To that end, he parked as near as he dared to the starship and earnestly swept the vessel with his sensors. He studied, puzzled, learned, and studied anew. Yet as much as his sensor eyes roved over and inside the starship, he could not find the captain. Was this a trick on their part? He listened to a conversation on the bridge. Maddox had flown gone, and they hadn't heard any word from him other than the previous message about staying on Remus for a time. Ah, Remus. Captain Maddox had gone to Remus, the third planet. How very interesting. Grutch listened longer to the bridge talk, but he learned nothing more about Maddox or his mission there. The huge blob of gelatinous mass began to slap his tentacles together as his eye stalks wove in a bizarre pattern. He was thinking deeply, Maddox, this is the moment of truth. Grutch ceased his seal-like slaps, calming down. With great ease and skill, he moved away from victory. Galleon was a troubling gnat, and Grutch sensed the starship's sensors scanning the darkness around it for him. Bah, they might notice a swift teleportation from Vulcan. Thus, Grutch maneuvered the teardrop-shaped vessel, first going behind the Jovian gas giant in relation to the starship. Then, Grutch made his calculations. The fusion first fleet was near Remus, but he doubted the humans could sense his vessel. If he made a swift stab at Remus, picked up Maddox while the man was alone. Grutch made odd warbling sounds. This was a perfect situation. They had attacked him, driven him off, stopped worrying about him. And now, Maddox had dropped his guard. That would be the last decision Maddox was going to make that mattered. Grutch checked his surroundings and he transmitted, causing his stealth craft to teleport away from Vulcan. The hidden craft appeared 2,000 kilometers from Remus's surface, on the opposite side as the Fusion First Fleet. Those on victory would not be able to see him, even if they had the right kind of sensors. Maddox, you villain, Grutch said. I'm about to take you captive. With that, the hidden stealth ship continued for the smoky planet. Chapter 52 Galleon had been doing more than just scanning for the Morag mercenary. Galleon had pinpointed the stealth ship and kept silent about it. The silence was for tactical reasons only. If he spoke to Valerie about Grutch, the alien would no doubt hear that as he eavesdropped on victory. 
For Galleon hadn't only pinpointed the morag, he'd also recalibrated a few of his most sensitive sensors in order to know when Grutch turned the morag sensors onto the starship. Now that Galleon knew what to look for, the morag stealth ship was relatively easy for him to spot. He watched it close in on the starship, use its sensors, and then ease away to the other side of Vulcan. Knowing the reason for that didn't take fantastic ad hoc computing power, but simple logic, as seen from the Morag's perspective. Grutch was teleporting somewhere and trying to do so secretly. Galleon analyzed that for a time. He used his logic processors and ran his personality profiles where appropriate. Galleon? Valerie said. Are you listening to me, Galleon? Oh, I am sorry, Valerie. Galleon's hollow image had been doing all this while floating in place on the bridge. Were you distracted? Valerie asked from the captain's chair. Yes, I was processing data. If I were biological, I would say I was wool gathering. I have a question for you, Valerie said. So, are you through wool gathering? I am through. In that case, Valerie said, but I must interrupt you, Commander. I have discovered a critical issue. Meta, you might be interested in this. Meta had resumed her stint at the comm station. Is this about Maddox? Meta asked, sounding worried. Oh, yes, indeed. What is it? Meta said. Did Maddox send you a secret message? No, Galleon said. I have spotted the Morag mercenary. You mean Grutch? Yes. Where is this Grutch? Valerie asked. I do not know his precise whereabouts at the moment, Galleon said. Then why are you bothering us about him? I have an emergency message, so if you do not mind, I will raise the important point immediately, as time might be critical and you are asking the wrong questions. Tell us, Valerie snapped, and then tell me why you didn't speak about this morag sooner. Grutch approached victory in his stealth ship, Galleon said. And he used his sensor beams on us, searching the starship and listening to our conversations. Afterward, he slipped behind Vulcan in relation to- He teleported to Remus, Meta shouted, interrupting. He's gone there to kidnap my husband. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Yes, Galleon said. That is my analysis as well. What are you babbling about? Valerie asked. I did not speak about this sooner, Galleon said because I was sure Grutch would overhear what I said. I wish to keep my new abilities hidden from him, so we may use what we know against him at the proper moment. This Morag went to Remus? Valerie asked. That is the most logical assumption. Meta reached it through emotional worry for Maddox. Is that not so, Meta? Meta had been staring at Galleon in consternation. She now swiveled toward Valerie. We have to go to Remus. We have to save my husband from kidnapping. The captain wanted us to stay here, Valerie said. Galleon, Meta said. Why didn't you activate the disruptor beam and destroy the Morag stealth ship when you could? Galleon stared at Meta. That is a cogent question. In retrospect, I think I should have done just that. Will you forgive me for not doing it, Meta? Forget about all that, Meta cried. We have to go to Remus to save my husband. I do concur with that. Galleon told Valerie. Grutch is a dangerous foe. I do not know if even Captain Maddox can thwart the Morag a second time while he is on the planet. Valerie stared from Meta to Galleon to Meta again. Yes, she said, straightening and swiveling toward the pilot. Take us to Remus orbit, she ordered. Prepare for immediate defensive actions as well. We will be vulnerable for a little while after coming out of jump lag, Galleon said. I know that, Valerie said. I'm guessing our appearance should surprise Remus' defense, and I don't think the fusion people can reach us that quickly from their present location. And if they have hunter-seeker missiles in the orbital debris? Galleon asked. Valerie stared at the hollow image, nodding sharply. Pilot, plot our appearance on the opposite side as the fusion first fleet. Yes, ma'am. Put us 50,000 kilometers from the surface, Valerie added. That should give us the needed margin for us to come out of jump lag. Mr. Barnes, ma'am, the muscled weapons officer said. Get ready for action, Valerie said. Understood. Galleon, Valerie said. I want you ready and looking for the Morag stealth ship. 
The instant you see it, activate the disruptor cannon and destroy it. Yes, Valerie, Galleon said. But how do we know he has not already captured the captain? I would kill Captain Maddox under those conditions. Valerie nodded. Wait until we confirm the captain's position. And if he is somewhere other than the Morag ship, then and only then unleash against the Morag stealth ship the moment you spot it. I will do that, Commander. We're plotted and ready to jump, the pilot said. Meta, alert the rest of the ship, Valerie said. Pilot, jump in 30 seconds. She made a fist. This is it, so I want everyone alert. Are there any questions? There were none. Thus, 30 seconds later, Starship Victory made a star drive jump for the other side of Remus. Chapter 53 Maddox, Riker, and Keith Maker staggered in the dark, leaving the wreckage of the fold fighter. Each of them sweated profusely and found it difficult to breathe in the thick air. It had to be 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and the smoky air was choking each of them, making them cough and slowing them down. This doesn't make any sense, Keith said for what had to be the tenth time. He had a bloody bandage wound around his head, and had complained about aching lungs. Maddox helped the sergeant, who was having the hardest time with the heat and smoky air. They climbed rocks and a hill, leaving the fold fighter behind. How can the people here keep fighting? Keith demanded. Maddox halted, staring at the short Scotsman. What people? Keith made a vague gesture. Those of Remus, he said. We made a category error, Maddox said. No, I made it. I should have ordered a scan of the target area before we attempted to land on Remus. This place isn't fit for human habitation. Think how hot it must be during the day. It's sweltering now, the middle of the night. Keith coughed, frowning at Maddox in the starlight. Remus was never like this in my memory dream, Maddox said. They'd had a nuclear war in the past. It had made part of the planet uninhabitable, but nothing like this. I don't understand, Keith said. I do, Riker said weakly. Sit down, Maddox told the sergeant, helping the older man sit on a boulder. Did the asteroids do this? Keith asked. What asteroids? asked Maddox. The ones the fusion people threw down on the planet? Maddox shook his head. I don't think the fusion has successfully rained any asteroids down yet. Then what's causing the heat? The smog? That's the question, all right. My guess, the aliens we've been wondering about, they did this. They wiped out Remus, maybe killed everyone on the planet. What? Keith said. That's crazy. No, Maddox said. It's evil. But that explains how they had the people to make the memories. The aliens captured Remus, the people, and then did this to the planet. That's a big jump in logic, sir, Riker whispered. It's a guess, Maddox said. Nothing more than that. If you're right, Keith said. And the fusion people aren't fighting other humans. They're fighting aliens. That's a good point, Maddox said. If the aliens are so superior, Keith said, why haven't they beaten the snot out of the fusion yet? Maddox shook his head. He didn't have an answer for that. This was all guesswork and intuition, mostly guesswork this time. He realized something else. The aliens had tricked him with the memories, and maybe he'd tricked his new intuition as well. Ludendorff had been right. The memory stick satellites had molded his and Valerie's minds, tampered with them, at least to a degree. We're gonna die, aren't we? Keith plopped down beside Riker. Without water? You're as good as dead. We're not dead yet, Maddox said stubbornly. His garments were soaked with sweat. They'd all need water come morning, or they'd likely collapse from dehydration. But they weren't out yet, and that meant they had to keep trying. The fold fighter is gone, Keith said. We can't communicate with victory. Maybe we should try to call the fusion people. They could conceivably pick us up in time. Be my guest. Maddox said, call them if you can. Keith stared at Maddox. 
We can always bargain with our fusion captors, Maddox said. But we can't bargain if we're dead of dehydration. You mean it? Keith asked. Maddox shrugged. With an air of renewed hope, Keith took out his hand communicator and tried to call whoever could hear. He received nothing but harsh static in reply. I know we shouldn't have come, Riker whispered, who'd been watching Keith. Maddox studied the darkness around them. The sergeant had a point. Meta had tried to warn him. Was he going to die this time? Would he ever see Jewel again? The idea of that made him angry. Hey, Keith said. I have someone. Hello, he said into the comm. Can you hear me? Yes, a voice said. At the sound, Maddox's nape hairs rose. Keep your line open, the voice said. I will rescue you soon. We're in luck, Keith told the others. They're coming to rescue us. Maddox was on his feet. A voice. He lurched at Keith, plucking the calm from him. What are you doing? Keith demanded. We're saved. All we have to do is keep the line open. Maddox set the open calm on the ground. Then he went back to Riker and hauled him to his feet. What is this? Keith said. What's wrong now? Grutch, Maddox said. He's followed us to Remus but maybe he can't pinpoint us through the junk in the air. Leave the communicator on and leave the comm where it is. Gentlemen, we have some hiking to do before Grutch arrives to rescue me. Now let's go. With that, as he forced Riker to hurry, Maddox hightailed it through the hot, gloomy smog before the morag could appear. Chapter 54 Grutch chortled to himself aboard the teardrop-shaped stealth ship in orbit around the seething planet. This was too easy. From the moment the ship had teleported into position, Grutch had been running planetary scans. He'd expected an Earth-like world, and not so long ago it had been just that. But according to his readings, Hellburners had gone off deep in the interior subterranean chambers. Those weapons had caused massive planetary volcanism, spewing millions of tons of ash into the air and causing a change to the planetary weather patterns. Surely, human life had all but disappeared on the surface. Maddox and his companions could survive for a few hours anyway. Then they would all be dead. Finding them would have been next to impossible, as there were strange readings interfering with the normal scans. Grotch had just concluded that the interference was coming from an alien source. Then, one of the humans had called and he'd answered. Grotch chortled again. Now it was just a matter of teleporting to them, collecting Maddox, and returning to his ship with the prized cargo. Before Grotch did that, however, he wanted to make sure that his teleporter would work correctly. Something about the situation troubled him. He went to the teleport chamber, put a man-sized probe onto the T-pads, and depressed a switch. Nothing happened. Grutch moved the bulkhead plating, removing several pieces, inspecting the various processors inside. Everything seemed in order. He moved to a different area of the chamber, pulling more plates off the wall. He inspected the machines hidden there. All were in working order. He recalibrated the teleporter, and this time, the probe left the ship. He waited 30 seconds and almost brought the probe directly back to the chamber. Why hadn't the probe teleported the first time? Perhaps a small test was in order. So instead of bringing the probe back to the chamber, he brought it to just outside the stealth ship. He transmitted. The probe appeared in space outside the ship, and three seconds later, the probe detonated. Two of Grutch's eye stalks shot up high in alarm. That was no accident. That was a deliberate attempt to murder him. But if some force had used a probe he'd sent by teleportation, Grutch's mass swiveled around fast as he warbled commands to the autopilot. He then rolled fast toward the control chamber as his stealth ship began an emergency teleportation. The alarms rang and nothing happened. The ship did not teleport to a new location. What did that mean? 
Nothing good, Grutch knew. He rolled into the control chamber and called up the holographic controls, beginning to manipulate them. Eye stalks bent to different screens. Oh, this was intolerable. The smog and other debris in the air shouldn't block his sensors like this. Something else blocked them. Three eye stalks moved to a side screen. All four tentacles lashed here and there in the chamber. On the screen, he zoomed in to something on the planetary surface. He had to zoom in once more before he saw a giant antenna that rotated with infinite slowness. Grutch pressed a control and purple lines appeared on the screen, the lines emanating from the giant antenna. The lines fluctuated, wavered. Those were alien signals interfering with his sensors. Grutch ran a quick test. It was just as he suspected. The interference made it impossible to see Maddox. Luckily, Grutch still had the link with the open communicator. Still, that didn't explain why his stealth ship had failed to teleport. Grutch began an emergency diagnostic. He found the problem ten seconds later. An odd ray beamed at his vessel. It came from the planet. Tentacles moved rapidly. A telemissile disappeared from outside the teardrop-shaped vessel. The T-missile reappeared on the planet on top of the ray-projecting device. The warhead detonated. Now, you miserable bastard, Grutch said. Now I have you. He plucked a projector, a sonic emitter and translator, and an emergency teleporter from off the wall. These he drew into his gelatinous mass as the tentacles pulled within like a turtle's head. Lastly, he used the final tentacle to activate a holographic control. His teleportation chamber activated. Grutch disappeared from his stealth ship, reappearing on the rocky surface of Remus. Eye stalks popped up, whipping about as he looked everywhere at once. A tentacle appeared with a projector, an eye stalk dedicated to its use as he looked for dangers to beam. He saw the human hand communicator sitting on the rock, lengthening a tentacle to snatch it. Grutch did not see any sign of Maddox or his companions. The communicator was a trick, but a trick for what purpose? Ah, Grutch believed he understood. Maddox not only knew about the hidden aliens, but was in league with them. Maddox had done this to draw him into a trap. Grutch had had no idea that Maddox was so diabolically clever. He communicated with his stealth ship and activated the teleporter. If he failed to leave, Grutch disappeared from the surface of Remus, reappearing in the control chamber of his stealth ship. Great drops of oozing liquid dripped from his pink-gray mass. It was fear stain, and it stank horribly. His gelatinous bulk trembled from his fear. If the hidden aliens working in tandem with the damned Maddox had trapped him, Grutch concentrated, thinking, wondering if it was best that he leave the star system while he could. Could Maddox be cleverer than his sponsors realized, or had his sponsors tricked him? Tentacles appeared, and seconds later, his stealth ship drew away from Remus. He would observe for a time, becoming the proverbial fly on the wall, acting if he saw an opportunity, but otherwise watching and waiting, and seeing what he could learn. Chapter 55 Maddox stumbled as he helped Riker around a boulder, using his communicator to provide light. Behind, Keith reeled, crying out as he touched the bandage around his forehead. Captain! Keith shouted. Captain! Maddox halted, turning around with Riker. I'm over here, Lieutenant! Keith staggered around the boulder, stopping when he spied them. Keep up, Maddox said. We can't afford to separate. Keith laughed bleakly, coughing. Maddox shook Riker. The sergeant's head lolled. He shook the sergeant again, so the man blinked wearily and moaned with dread. We're doomed, panted Keith. He finally stopped coughing. We should have stayed with the fold fighter. That was our only chance. The smog and heat are killing us. We're not doomed, Maddox said. Now keep up, like I said. There's something ahead to help us. 
You can't know that, Keith said. You mean I shouldn't know it, Maddox said, but I do. It's, come on, we don't have much time before the air does us in. Maddox led the way, shaking Riker again, keeping the sergeant awake. Keith stumbled from behind, perhaps finding it hard to keep his footing on the uneven surface in the dark. With the light as his guide, Maddox threaded through a rocky maze and rounded a pair of boulders, spying a glowing bulb ahead that showed off the drifting, smoky air. I'll be darned, Keith said. Light? How did you know there would be light here? Maddox didn't answer, but continued toward the bulb lighting as he clicked off his communicator and put it away. The path was rocky, hot, and smoky, the air making his throat thick and sooty. What had happened to Remus's millions? Had aliens slaughtered the humans? Why would these aliens remain on the dying planet? Soon enough, the three of them stood before the shining light bulb. Under it was a hot iron door a seemingly thick door, set in rock. Who built this? Keith asked. Even as the lieutenant asked it, the thick iron door swung inward, revealing a corridor like on a spaceship. It was lit and clean, inviting. Keith stared at Maddox. This can't be happening. No, asked Maddox. It's too coincidental, Keith said. It's not rational. It's just a door and a corridor, Maddox said. No, Keith said stubbornly. You couldn't have just led us to this door. Don't you understand? Perfectly, Maddox said. We came to the one place on the planet with an iron door and tunnel leading to safety. And you think that's a coincidence? Not in the slightest, Maddox said. But what are the alternatives? We stay outside in the smoggy heat waiting for daylight? What if it reaches 130 or 140? Besides, we can't survive any of this without water, and that soon. This is a trap, Keith said with conviction. I fully realize that, but the alternatives are worse. Maddox helped a nearly unconscious Riker through the door and into the corridor. He shuffled around. Coming with us? Is that an order? Keith asked mulishly. No, it's a suggestion. Keith grumbled bitterly under his breath, but followed through the door. Immediately, the iron door swung shut, clanging as it closed behind them. Keith stared at the door and then at Maddox. The pilot straightened, and he let his right hand drop onto the holstered gun at his side. He stood straighter and squared his shoulders. That's the spirit, Maddox said. Let's see who we're dealing with, eh? He started down the lit corridor with Riker stumbling beside him and Keith bringing up the rear. They traveled downward, the ceiling lights providing continued illumination, and in time, cool air blew over them. They revived as the temperature dropped to the mid-70s, and as the air became pure and invigorating. Where are we? Riker asked later as he shoved off the captain and stood on his own, peering around. We found this place, Maddox told the sergeant. What do you mean, found? We're on Remus. The hell you say, Riker said. This is Balder Three. No, we left the Balder system quite some time ago. You, Keith, and I came to Remus in a fold fighter. We crashed, though, remember? Riker scowled, and he massaged his forehead. Oh, he said shortly. Why, why am I disoriented? Figure it out, Maddox said, not unkindly. Riker stared at him before nodding. The heat and lousy air wiped me out. I'm feeling better now. I'm glad to hear it. Maddox had seen Riker slip himself a pill a few minutes ago. That had no doubt also helped revive him. They continued down the corridor. Hold it, Keith said later. I'm feeling sick. Maddox looked back. The pilot was white-faced and sweaty, with red rings around his eyes. He breathed harder than before. The exertion, tension, and concussion 
were having their toll. Stopping, Maddox said, we'll rest here a bit and catch our bearings. They all sat down in a line against a corridor wall. Keith closed his eyes. Better keep them open, Maddox said. When Keith didn't respond, Maddox reached over with a foot and kicked one of Keith's. The ace opened bleary eyes. Keep your eyes open. You have a concussion. Sleeping isn't an option for you right now. I'm gonna throw up. Try to hold it in, Maddox said. Keith seemed as if he would nod. I'll try. We'll be okay, Maddox said. We had a rough spot. Now we're going to survive it. How do you figure that? Riker asked. We're in a tunnel. A corridor. What's the difference? Riker asked. This corridor was made recently. From where he sat, Riker studied the floor, wall, and ceiling. You're right. This is new. Did they make it for us? Who are they? Keith asked. That's what I want to know. Riker shrugged, glancing at the captain. If I were to guess, Maddox said, I'd say they're the makers of the memory stick satellites. A voice spoke. That's an excellent guess, Captain. How did you arrive at it? Maddox and the others swiveled around. A lean man in a blue uniform regarded them from an open area in the corridor, one that must have soundlessly appeared as they spoke. The man had dark hair and intelligent eyes, and he had a half-sunken cerebrator merged into his forehead. Garth? asked Maddox, who recognized the man. Are you Garth, the monk? The lean individual raised his eyebrows. How do you know me? Maddox opened his mouth, but didn't say, perhaps deciding it wouldn't be a good idea. Garth cocked his head, and he appeared to be listening to someone. Ah, he said, eyeing Maddox. You've lived my memories, haven't you? Yes. Maddox said, wondering how Garth could possibly know that. Clearly someone or something read his thoughts, or saw in some alien way that he had Garth's memories. He climbed to his feet, facing the man. Keith and Riker did likewise. Garth produced a black metal stick that he pointed at Maddox. Please refrain from any heroics, such as attempting to overpower me. It will only result in your quick annihilation. No worries there, Maddox said. You have my free cooperation. He wanted to learn more before he made any moves. Once more, Garth cocked his head and appeared to be listening. I see, he said, focusing on them again. You arrived via a spacecraft, crashing onto Remus. Leaving your craft, you came here and found the entrance. I'm sure you wish to meet the new owners of Remus. I do indeed, Maddox said. One thing, though, Garth said. You once wore, you call it a cerebrator. That's not bad as far as names go. I will use that if you don't mind. Did you just read my thoughts? Not as you perceive it, Garth said. I'm quite surprised you're functional without your cerebrator. There doesn't seem to be any scar either where you removed it. That's an impressive accomplishment. In what way? Asked Maddox. Garth blinked slowly several times, smiling afterward. I'm afraid this isn't the best place for a discussion. You wish to learn more about all this, yes? I do, Maddox said. Then we should continue to headquarters. You will proceed so I can keep watch. Any wrong moves will result in pain and possible death on your parts. I understand. Maddox turned, grabbing one of Keith's arms as he'd just seen the pilot sway. Is he too injured to proceed? Garth asked. He'll be fine. I can put him out of his misery if you like, Garth said. What? Keith said, his right arm, the one Maddox held, straining to reach his holstered weapon. The captain tightened his grip so he couldn't do that. Keith turned to Maddox. Maddox gave him the barest of head shakes. Then he turned to Garth. Thank you for your offer, but I prefer him to remain living for now. He has sentimental value for me. As you wish, 
Garth said. Provided he can keep up, he can remain living. Now go. It is time. He froze. Maddox glanced at Riker. The sergeant watched Garth carefully, the plotting mind no doubt coming to certain conclusions about the man and this place. Garth shuddered, blinked rapidly, and then brought up his black stick. He frowned when he observed the others waiting for him. Why did you not attack while I was indisposed? Garth asked. That isn't our nature, Maddox said smoothly. Garth stared at him. No, that isn't the answer. Can it be that you comprehend the situation? It can be, Maddox said, deadpan. Garth scowled and he motioned with the black metal stick. Begin, head that way. Maddox, Riker, and Keith headed into the opening Garth had used to reach them. He followed several paces behind, aiming the stick at them as if it were a weapon. The opening closed behind him, and the four of them continued deeper into the subterranean depths. Chapter 56 They passed many open hatches where people in gray overalls and cerebrators half sunken in their foreheads worked on machines, assembly line fashion. Some of the machines were huge perhaps parts of a tank or a spaceship. Other parts were small, as if components of computers or monitors. They passed a different area where humans stood in line, as if in an alien DMV. Help us, a disheveled woman cried. She wore a dingy dress and heels and had dirty legs. Maddox halted. Riker and Keith halted behind him. What are you doing? Garth asked. You must proceed down the corridor. Please, the woman sobbed from the other chamber, looking through the open hatch at Maddox. She stood at the head of a long line. Don't let them do this to me. A big man stepped up and pushed her from behind. The woman staggered toward a different opening. Maddox stepped to the hatch and peered into the chamber. There were many sad-looking, hopeless individuals in various long lines. Big men wearing gray overalls and boots and with cerebrators in their foreheads and batons in their hands watched the others. What happens on the other side? Maddox asked Garth. That is not your concern, Garth said. Now continue. We have stayed here long enough. Do they embed cerebrators into their foreheads in the other room? Keith asked. Cerebrators? asked Garth. You understood what it meant before? Garth continued to stare at Keith. Keith pointed at Garth's forehead. What you're wearing? What the alien stuck in your forehead? Do you refer to the collective, perhaps? Garth asked, bemused. Maddox debated slipping into the chamber and rescuing the woman. The burly guards watched him. The captain noticed their hands tightly gripping their batons. They all watched him now. What's the collective? Keith was asking. Belonging, Garth said, realizing he could do nothing for the woman, that it would result in a fight they'd lose. Maddox turned back to Garth. Is it permanent? Do you mean becoming part of the collective? Asked Garth. Yes, Maddox said. How could it be otherwise? The woman in there doesn't want to join the collective. It is true that some people are foolish and ill-informed. Garth said, they do not know what is good for them. Before, they were individual moats creating chaos. Now they are part of the collective, achieving the greater unity and purpose. Whose purpose? Maddox asked. I do not understand the question. Are the people of Remus gaining from all this? Maddox asked. Or are the new owners using the people of Remus for their own alien benefit? Can you not comprehend? Asked Garth. Humans are chaotic moats without purpose or meaning. There is no unity among mankind. We offer them the collective, the greater good. To help Remus's new owners? Asked Maddox. You do not understand. 
Garth said with a sad shake of his head. We grant the humans a chance to gain meaningful existence. We give them peace and understanding. They are no longer afraid, no longer useless and chaotic. What if the humans don't want what you're giving? It makes no difference what they want before. Afterward, they want it. They soon understand and are grateful for what we've done. Because the cerebrator forces them to obey you, Maddox said. Garth smiled indulgently as if explaining to a child. The cerebrator, as you call it, brings reason and unity. It allows their chaotic minds to merge into the mass of being. They become one with us. Surely you wish to join us as well. Is that how you feel about this, Garth? Maddox asked. I frankly doubt it. I had your former memories. I know the kind of person you really are. Garth shook his head. You must not view me as the being I was, as an unreasoning individual. I was afraid then. I lacked meaning and unity. Those of the fusion were going to conquer us and force us into their socialistic compromise. You understand the fusion? We understand that the fusion mimics our ways without using the correct means to achieve their desired aims. They attempt to coerce human minds into unity. But human minds are chaotic and undisciplined. Social harmony only brings misery, except for the masters of the system. We provide a true collective where all benefit. Then why are those guards carrying batons? Maddox asked. Garth chuckled. Don't you see? That proves our point. The humans, the individual moats, do not understand the greater good they are receiving. We force them out of our love for them. But they don't want to lose their individuality. That is their chaotic nature, barring them from true joy and love. The cerebrator merges their individuality into the whole, the collective, the mass. We are benign and loving, allowing the alien humans to enter into our peace. Then why hide in the shadows? Maddox asked. Why use trickery and deceit on others? Garth chuckled, shaking his head. You fail to understand. Chaotic creatures such as yourselves flail in misery your whole lives. You fight and kill, never achieving the bliss you seek. We provide it, doing so in the easiest and safest manner possible. We are nirvana in the flesh. We have studied you humans and other aliens and have finally decided to bring peace, joy, and love to the universe. You will all submerge into the collective. Is that not grand? We have no choice in this? Maddox asked. None, Garth said. Now, we have stayed at the converging station long enough. Look, the woman is gone. Soon she will belong to the collective. You and your friends must continue onward. You're not planning to add us into the collective? In time, Captain, Garth said. First, you must. Garth frowned and cocked his head. Forward, he said a moment later, motioning with the black stick. I must show you more, and there is something you must do for us before you join the collective. Do this thing without a cerebrator? Asked Maddox. That is so, Garth said. Must I summon the enforcers, or will you continue to march as you did before? Maddox glanced at a sullen Riker and a frightened Keith before nodding. Sure, he said. Show us more. I'd like to see it. Chapter 57 Maddox made some hard calculations as they marched down the corridors. Keith was flagging again. The pilot needed medical attention and rest. Maddox shook his head. This was a hellish place. He hated it. 
They turned people into automatons, into alien-run zombies. Could he save them? Maddox sighed. He didn't see how he could. Could he save Garth? That might be impossible. It was time to concentrate on saving Riker and Keith, on saving himself and getting back to victory. These hidden aliens preferred to work in the shadows, to use proxies. They reminded him of a giant centipede lis, half flesh and half mechanical. The lis had infiltrated all the way to the top of Star Watch by using these underhanded methods. Maddox scowled. These aliens wouldn't be able to do that with cerebrator-controlled humans. Why had the aliens seeded the nebula with the satellites that merged a cerebrator onto selected individuals? Wait, the satellites had always chosen the leader, first Valerie of the Kit Carson, and himself of victory. Maddox scowled more. Did the Fusion First Fleet wait to attack Remus, or had the leaders of the fleet converged into the collective? No, that didn't seem possible. The leaders would be having dreams if they wore satellite teleported cerebrators. Besides, why did some of the ships tow asteroids toward Remus? That struck Maddox as an aggressive, a hostile move against the aliens. Maddox rubbed his chin. He was in it, all right. Riker and Keith were in it. How was he ever going to escape and reach victory again? But... The aliens had made one oversight. He had his blaster, Keith had his gun, and Riker, his stunner. Could they fight the collective all the way back to the entrance? And if they reached the surface, how would that help them? One thing at a time, Maddox decided. As he pondered these things, they reached a larger area with many benches. Upon the benches sat 40-odd people. They all wore gray overalls with their hands on their knees and their faces forward, sitting with very straight backs. Each person wore a half-sunken cerebrator in his or her forehead. They all stared at a spot on the wall with a tiny nail or other device sticking out. There, Garth said. Sit down, won't you? Keith, Riker, and Maddox sat on an empty bench. None of the others glanced at them or showed any indication that they'd noticed the newcomers. What's wrong with them? A nervous, white-faced Keith asked Garth. Nothing is wrong, Garth said. Why don't they speak? Keith asked. What would you have them say? Hello, for starters, Keith said. You are mistaken, Garth said. They are now part of the collective, as I said earlier. They are absorbing reality. You might call it learning. Why are they doing it out here? Keith asked. Garth smiled. The corridors are not for your benefit. You just happen to come upon an access shaft. Do you mean your masters let us here? Maddox asked. Garth fixed Maddox with a careful scrutiny. That is an odd comment. Have I not said we are a collective? How can there be masters and servants when we all work for the same goal? You're a slave to these aliens, Garth. That device in your head is fooling you. Would you like to be free again? I know how to draw the cerebrator from you. Garth cocked his head and began to blink rapidly. Maddox rose. All those seated around him turned their heads to stare at him. Don't do it. Riker said in a soft voice. Maddox noticed the others, and his shoulders slumped. A moment later, Garth became aware again. He focused on Maddox. Do not say that to him again. It serves no purpose. Now, you will come with me. Come on, Maddox told Riker and Keith. We're leaving. No, Garth said. They are staying. Only you are leaving. Maddox's features tightened. He wouldn't let the aliens split them up. Was it time to fight? It seemed hopeless to begin it way down here. Follow me, Garth said. Sorry, Maddox said. You have that wrong. They're staying with me. Those are not the instructions, Garth said. Now come with me. 
Maddox did not move. What is wrong? Garth asked. Nothing's wrong, Maddox said. I just want my friends to go with me. Surely that can't be a problem. I said those were not the instructions. Then get some new instructions. All the people with cerebrators in their foreheads rose ominously from the benches. We can force you to obey, Garth said. I wish you wouldn't, Maddox said. We mean you no harm. You three cannot possibly harm us, Garth said. Do you remember your time as a youth? Maddox asked. Do you remember when the gang of youths was going to take your copper coin the woman gave you? Garth frowned. Do you remember the old monk who died fighting for you? Maddox asked. No, Garth whispered. I, I don't want to remember. I am, I am no longer my own. I wish. He froze and he cocked his head. All around them, the others cocked their heads. Maddox knew this was the moment to act as he'd gone as far into the subterranean realm as he planned. It was time to leave. If they didn't, the three of them would join the collective, likely for the rest of their lives. He would never see Meta and Jewel again. He would never be himself again. That simply wasn't going to happen. Gentlemen, Maddox said with purpose. Riker and Keith glanced at him. Maddox dropped his right hand onto the butt of his holstered blaster. He was surprised Garth hadn't tried to take it before this. It must have been a glitch in the alien programming. At my signal, Maddox said in a hoarse voice, we do what we must in order to leave. We can't kill them, Keith said. That would be murder. They're as good as dead, Maddox said. You heard Garth. The aliens have taken control of them. Do you want the aliens to take control of you? No, Keith said in horror. Then you must listen, Garth said, speaking loudly, interrupting the captain. The others around them focused on Maddox. You will come with me, Garth told Maddox. The other two will be converted into the collective. It is the way. Need any more convincing? Maddox asked Keith. No, Keith said in a small voice. There are a lot of them. Riker said, I know, Maddox said, it isn't going to be pretty and it may not be easy. You will obey me this instant, Garth told Maddox. It hurt to do so, but Maddox drew his blaster and fired at Garth, beaming the cerebrator in the man's forehead. A second later, Garth crumpled to the floor as he began to thrash. Back the way we came, Maddox shouted, backpedaling that way as he faced the surging crowd. The captain continued to beam others. Now Keith's gun and Riker's stunner added to the fray, dropping the zombie-like humans. It was gruesome and mind-numbing work. Riker must have found it easier as his stunner only knocked them out but did not kill them. Keith must have found it the hardest as he only fired sporadically. Maddox beamed remorselessly as he'd made his decision. Anything less than his best might mean his never coming home to Meta and Jewel. A few times, people reached them. Riker's bionic strength proved invaluable. Maddox's savagery helped, too, as did the monofilament blade in his left hand. We should run, Keith shouted as he reloaded shells. Kill them, Maddox snarled. It's the only way for us to survive. A few more minutes of mayhem concluded the fight as the last of the bench warmers crumpled to the floor twitching and making gurgling sounds with ghastly blaster and bullet wounds in them. Keith vomited. Riker was shaking his head, muttering darkly. Maddox checked the charge on his blaster and waved the weapon back and forth to cool the firing tube. Then he holstered his weapon. He looked upon Garth, saddened that he'd had to kill the youth. I'll avenge you, Maddox said. I'll avenge you as if you were my brother. Keith had stopped vomiting and wiped his mouth. You two ready? Asked Maddox. This is horrible, Keith whispered. Granted, Maddox said. Now are you ready? Keith nodded. Then follow me, Maddox said. Our only chance is to get back to the surface and hope victory comes looking for us. Our rods are slim, Riker said. Yes, Maddox said. But we have odds. 
because we're still living and in control of our minds, so enough jawing. Save your strength for running. Chapter 58 Starship Victory approached Remus on the darkened side after using the star drive jump to reach there from Vulcan. Valerie sat in the captain's chair. Galleon was beside her. His eyelids fluttered. Valerie glanced at the hollow image. Do you see the stealth ship? She asked. Galleon stopped the eyelid fluttering to turn to her. Of course I see it. I am looking for the captain. Weapons, Valerie said. Warm up the disruptor cannon. I would wait to do that if I were you. We want to be ready, Valerie said. If the captain is aboard the Morag stealth ship, we dare not fire. If Grutch realizes our intent before we are ready, he might flee with the captain aboard. Valerie frowned, nodding shortly. Belay that order, weapons. Yes, ma'am, Lieutenant Barnes said. What do you suggest? Valerie asked Galleon. That we scan the planet for signs of the fold fighter. I'm already on it, Andros said from the science station. The atmosphere is odd. It's making sensor readings difficult. There has been much volcanic activity on the planet, Galleon said. I also detect subtle alien influences. The fusion? asked Valerie. I do not think so, Galleon said. I suspect the aliens who made the memory sticks are doing this. Oh, Valerie said. What happened to the people of Remus? I am still analyzing the situation. Galleon said. The planet is not how I envisioned it to be. I found the fold fighter, Andros said. It's crashed, many of its systems down. I detect the transponder, however. It's how I found it so quickly. I'm scanning for the captain and the others. With a sudden stricken look, Valerie stared at Andros. Keith will be okay, Galleon said softly. Valerie turned to him. How do you know that? He is with Captain Maddox. The captain always comes through. Keith, Valerie said under her breath, shaking her head afterward. They'd been estranged for so long. She'd avoided Keith ever since receiving her promotion. Now, worried he might die, that she might never see him again, Valerie began to realize how she really felt about the cocky Scotsman. She'd been a fool to avoid him. Oh, Keith. You must stay alive. Captain, I mean, Commander, Meta said from her comm station. I'm receiving a hail from the planet. Valerie shook off her dread for Keith and concentrated on the here and now. Galleon, she said, focusing. Do you detect any target locks on us? Negative, Galleon said. Put it on the main screen, Valerie told Meta. A few seconds later, the main screen wavered and a beautiful blonde-haired woman with a cerebrator in her forehead, regarded them. She had luxurious hair and wore a blue uniform. Diana Varis, Valerie said, shocked that she recognized the woman. Hello. The woman with the cerebrator in her forehead cocked her head. A moment later, she smiled. Valerie felt something bump against her mind. She grunted, slumping forward, rubbing her forehead. You are Valerie Noonan, Lieutenant Commander Valerie Noonan, Diana said. How can she know that? Galleon asked Valerie. Valerie was still slumped forward and rubbing her forehead. She felt groggy and struggled to sit up. I'm glad we can meet, Commander Noonan, Diana said. A new feeling swept over Valerie as she finally sat up. She smiled, feeling good feeling as if they were sisters. She'd never had a sister growing up. It was a wonderful feeling. I would like you to come down to Remus in a shuttle, Diana was saying. You should bring others with you in order to ensure your safety. I think I'd like that, Valerie said. You cannot be serious, Galleon said beside her. Be quiet, Valerie told Galleon. Let me think. Are you in charge of the starship? Diana asked. I am, Valerie said. I am glad, Diana said. That will make all of this much easier. I request that you drop your shield and close all your torpedo tubes. I would like to do that, Valerie said. 
I think there are a few regulations standing in my way, though. No, Diana said. You are the acting captain. You can do what you like. How does she know all this? Galleon asked. Valerie, I do not think you are feeling well. Valerie rubbed her forehead again. I understand, Galleon said. You are a cerebrator, and that has made pathways in your mind. I think Diana Varys is using them to control your thoughts. Send that fool away, Diana said on the main screen. He is confusing you, Galleon, Valerie said. Go check something somewhere. If you continue in this way, Valerie, Galleon said, the others will relieve you of command. Do you not understand what Diana is doing to you? Please do not force us to fire on your starship, Diana said. Let us work together. Afterward, you can all join the collective and know true peace and love. How can we achieve this feat? Galleon asked. Diana leaned forward as she stared at Galleon. You are not real. You are a hollow image, an adduct. You know Adox? Galleon said. I do. From where? asked Galleon. Diana frowned, and then she smiled. I see. This is interesting. You wish to discover the whereabouts of the Adox? I do, Galleon admitted. Then you must come down to us, and I will tell you. You must also convince Commander Noonan to come down in a shuttle. Are you attempting to bribe me? Galleon asked. What sheer nonsense, Diana said. I am offering you gifts. Commander, Lieutenant Barnes said, interrupting. I'm detecting target lock on victory. There are planetary weapon systems aimed at us and more coming online. With a numbed mind, Valerie turned to muscle man Barnes. What did you say? Lower the starship's shields, Diana told Galleon. I will then tell you about the Adox. Pilot, Galleon said, reverse course. Take us farther from the planet. Commander, the pilot asked Valerie. Should I? You and I are alike, Commander Noonan, Diana said. Abruptly, Diana Varus's image disappeared from the main screen. What happened? Valerie demanded. She's done something to you, Meta said. I broke contact. You will immediately bring her image back up, Valerie said. No, Meta said, I won't. I'm also relieving you of command, Valerie scoffed. You don't have the authority to do that. I'm the highest ranking person here. I don't care, Meta said, as she rose from the comm station and hurried for the captain's chair. You're not thinking right. It might be because of the cerebrator you wore. Get back to your station, Valerie ordered, or I'll call the Marines to escort you off the bridge. Galleon, Meta said. Take charge of the ship. You lack the authority to give me the authority, Galleon said. Use your personality profile on her, Meta said. You know Valerie isn't acting correctly. Pilot, get some separation from the planet now. Yes, ma'am, the pilot said. Belay that order, Valerie shouted as she stood. No, Galleon said. Meta is correct. Valerie is acting out of character. Continue the retreat. Valerie stared at the pilot, stared at Galleon and then Meta. I'm heading down to Remus. Don't try to stop me. That was exactly what Meta did, though. She lunged at Valerie, grabbed her arm, and forced it behind her back. Valerie struggled, but to no avail, against Meta's superior strength and unarmed combat training. I'm taking her to medical. You're in charge now, Galleon, and remember this. We'll find the Adox when this is all done. I promise you that. Thank you, Meta, Galleon said. I believe you. Meta forced Valerie toward the exit hatch, even as Valerie shouted for Meta to release her. Meanwhile, Victory continued to maneuver away from Remus. The shield remained at full strength, and Lieutenant Barnes watched for an assault from the planet, which did not materialize just yet. Chapter 59 it proved impossible to simply race up the subterranean corridors the way they had come and slip back onto the planetary surface. Armed guards blocked the way. Fortunately, the trio sneaked away before the cerebrator-wearing guards saw them. 
Maddox, Riker, and Keith rested in an alcove. They hadn't traveled that far from the place they'd opened fire and slaughtered, the cerebrator converged. I feel sick, Keith said. He sat on the floor, leaned against a wall, and fought to keep his eyes open. He was white-faced, his eyes red-rimmed and bleary. Boots drummed beyond the alcove as humans raced past their hiding spot. The alcove was small, but it kept them from view of anyone in the corridor. As the sounds of thudding boots dwindled, Maddox shook his head. We're not going to make it by retreating the way we first came. It's reasonable to assume armed guards are blocking all the exits, so we go down. In fact, we should continue the way Garth wanted me to go. Go to the thing you wanted to show you? Asked Riker. Exactly, Maddox said. Can you keep going? He asked Keith. I don't think so, the pilot said. I feel sick. My head is pounding. You should leave me here. If you can come back for me later. He ceased talking as Maddox laughed softly. What's so funny? Keith demanded. We're not coming back for anyone, Maddox said. But if you can't go, we can leave you here for the aliens. Keith stared at him. You do that? After all I've done for you throughout the years? You just leave me in this hellhole? No, Maddox said. Because if you think that's fair, Keith said. I have to tell you. He frowned. What did you say? No, Maddox said. What do you mean, no? Asked Keith. I'm deadbeat sick, my head aches, and I just want to go to sleep. There's nothing more to say about it. Wrong. Maddox said. Are you ready? He asked Riker. For an answer, the sergeant worked up to his feet. Look, Keith said. I appreciate, Mr. Maker. Maddox said, moving in front of him. Shut up already. Sir? Maddox reached down and hoisted a groaning Keith to his feet. Then the captain squatted and he grabbed the lieutenant, lifting him so Keith's stomach rested on his left shoulder. Fire, Miss Carey, Maddox said. It might hurt your head but it will give you a bit of a rest. Put me down, Keith said. Wouldn't dream of it, Lieutenant, Maddox said. Now, if you could shut up for a change and you lean over my shoulder, we might be able to slip past any waiting zombies and reach the lower quarters. We're doomed, Keith said, even as he leaned over the captain's shoulder. That must be your concussion talking, Riker said, joining Maddox. I imagine you're right, Maddox said. Don't worry, Lieutenant. I have a lot of fire left in me, carrying you as a chore, but you're one of us, and I do not intend to leave any of my people behind. Besides, you're too good a pilot for that. I am a good pilot. Some say you're the best, Riker said. Keith mumbled under his breath. What did you say? Asked Riker. You bet your sweet ass I'm the best. You must be feeling better, Riker told Maddox. I'm glad to hear it, Maddox said. What about you? How are you feeling? Good enough, I suppose. That's good. I'm not sure I could carry you as easily, Sergeant. You look as if you've gained some weight since the last mission. Just around my middle, Riker said. I thought so, Maddox said. With Keith on his shoulder, with the blaster in his other hand, Maddox led the way, heading deeper into the underground complex. Do you think we'll find the aliens, sir? Riker asked a little later. Maddox glanced at the stout sergeant. I'd like a few words with some of them, Riker said. You've read my mind, Maddox said. That's exactly what I'd like, a good old-fashioned complaint session. He raised the blaster. Riker nodded. Then they concentrated on moving unseen, every sense alert as they headed down the corridor. Chapter 60 they pass the scene of the massacre, the dead still lying over and near benches, and headed in the direction Garth had wished Maddox to go. Keith had grown silent as Maddox carried him. So far, the captain hadn't shown any sign of strain. In truth, the extra weight was wearying him, but he didn't know what else to do. Soon they moved down steeper corridors and then came to a crossway. Which way do we go now? A winded Riker asked. Maddox lowered Keith, propping him against a wall. Maddox then crouched before the crossway, peering first in one direction and then the other. Finally, he shook his head. You don't know? Asked Riker. 
No, Maddox said. They say any choice is better than none. Maddox squinted as he re-examined the two possibilities. How could the planet have gone to seed so quickly? Remus had been a functioning society. What did he know about the fusion? Precious little. Valerie said Diana Varis had gone there, and she, Valerie, had faint recollections about New Trotsky. What would Garth have wanted him to see? Why would Garth, the aliens behind him, want him to go to a place without a cerebrator controlling him? That way, Maddox said, pointing to the leftward corridor. We'll go that way. What do you think we'll find that way? Riker asked. Our destiny, one way or another. Maddox said. He shuffled around, facing Keith. How do you feel? Awful, Keith said. But I think I can walk. Probably not fast enough, Maddox said. I'll have to carry you again. No, Keith said as he slid up along the wall until he was standing. Let me walk. I can do it. Maddox stood too, and he shrugged, realizing what he had to do. Keep an eye on him, Sergeant. Sir? asked Riker. I'm going to scout ahead. You two bring up the rear, at your own pace. Is separating wise, sir? Riker asked. In this instance, I believe so, Maddox said. No more questions, gentlemen. We're in the soup. Action is the answer, and perhaps lots of killing. Keep coming until you catch up with me, or escape in some manner. Good luck, sir, Riker said. Maddox nodded. To you too, Sergeant. Lieutenant? Until we meet again. Until then, sir. Riker said. Keith mumbled a reply. Maddox turned and began to trot, heading into the corridor of choice, hoping he'd made the correct decision. Maddox opened up, sprinting down the corridors, realizing he had to make something happen quickly. If they didn't escape from this place soon, they likely never would. After a time, however, the captain slowed down to a brisk walk, he couldn't sprint forever, and he wanted to keep something left in reserve so he could fight when the moment arrived. He listened, advanced, listened more, and heard a faint, strange, slithering sound from ahead. It made his nape hairs rise, but in a different way from when he'd heard Grutch's computerized voice over the comm. The Morag was different, a true bug-eyed monster, yet the Morag was understandable after a fashion. The slithering sounds he heard from ahead, they were a different order of alien. As Maddox advanced, he felt a sense of disgust mounting in him, and it felt as if the air changed, becoming reptilian or snake-like, or something worse than those things. The disgust turned to repugnance and then loathing. He was certain now that he'd hate these new aliens in a visceral way. They must have kept hidden because they knew humans loathed the sight of them. It made sense. The aliens appeared to have a mass mind, a unified identity, something quite alien to humanity's individuality. Humans cooperated out of a sense of benefit to each. The mass mind, the hive mind. Could the aliens be like bees or ants? What kind of mentality would intelligent bees or ants possess? Maddox shook his head. Bees and ants did not disgust him. They were different, certainly, but not repugnant. The slithering sounds increased, and the hairs on Maddox's head stood up. He found himself tiptoeing forward. His mouth had twisted into a grimace of loathing. He scrunched his nose and felt his stomach tighten until it began to ache from the strain. The next thing Maddox knew, he gripped his blaster, holding it so hard that his hand began to throb. He exchanged grips, shaking out his firing hand. He inhaled through his nostrils, forcing himself to shuffle faster. Whatever he planned to do, he needed to do it quickly. The sounds increased as he turned a corner and spied an open hatch ahead. He wanted to hurry, but found himself barely moving at a shuffle. He was reluctant to face what he expected to find, even though he needed to discover the nature of the new aliens. Slithering, hissing, and churning. Heat emanated from ahead. The open hatch beckoned and mocked him. There was movement up there, he sensed it, 
and caught a glimpse of it through the open hatch. Sweat slid down his face and slicked his armpits. A groan lodged in his throat. Stealing himself, expecting the worst, Maddox neared the open hatch and eased to one side, peering through to the other side. Maddox blanched in horror as he saw into the chamber. It stank. No, it reeked with a foul stench. There was rotted food or some organic substance on the floor, and over the substance seethed a mass of writhing, hissing creatures, each a little larger than his pinky finger. They had the appearance of maggots, tiny appendages or centipede legs, and little squishy jaws. They seethed over each other, caterpillar nibbling the mass of rotted food, and they generated heat and a telepathic sense as well. Greetings, Captain Maddox, the mass mind said. The thought slammed against his consciousness, leaving a vicious residue that made his head ache. You are different from the others of your ilk. We can communicate with you directly. What are you? Maddox heard himself ask, his mouth bone dry. We are the unity. You in this chamber are the extent of it? A sense of laughter or amusement filled his mind. No, no. We are but a tiny piece of the greater whole. Even on Remus, our mass is a minority of the unity. That's what you call yourselves? We do not call ourselves anything. We are the unity, the entirety of our existence. We are bringing you humans into the unity. Is that not magnanimous of us? The revulsion at what he saw made it impossible for Maddox to dissemble. He blurted the truth. No, it's hideous. We humans want no part of the unity. Can this be true? Are you not different from the mass of your fellows? You have greater awareness, allowing us to communicate with you directly. It is all true, Maddox heard himself say. That is unfortunate. We wished to use you as our emissary. You do not need the cerebrator, as you call it, to understand us. Come now, Maddox. Let us remold your mind so you see us in a different light. Then you can go out and help collect the rest of humanity, causing it to join the unity so we can expand to an even greater extent. I'm not anyone's slave. I'm my own man. That is a quaint notion, and it will fall before our unified might. We are reluctant to do this here, but you must brace yourself for a reconfiguration of your mental powers. In other words, we will finish what Balron the Traveler started. You know about Balron? From your thoughts and memories, we do. Maddox blinked, and he blinked again, and he realized that his mind was under a mass assault from the telepathic powers of the seething mass of alien maggots in the chamber. We are not maggots, Captain. We are members of the great unity. Now cease resisting our efforts. Let us do to you what needs doing. Maddox winced in agony as the slithering, hissing mass of white, finger-sized alien maggots surged toward him en masse. He cried out as if his soul were in peril. And he recalled the blaster. You will not use that on us, Captain. The unity forbids it. In fact, you must now drop it and walk into the chamber. Lie down so we may more easily absorb you. Maddox felt the blaster slip from his grasp and thump onto the floor. It was a dreadful sound of his coming doom. He thought of his precious baby, Jewel, then. He thought of the way she held his pinky finger. That juxtaposed against the white maggot aliens that would absorb Jewel and turn her into 
Maddox howled at the thought, breaking his conscious thoughts and regaining control of his limbs. He bent down and scooped up the fallen blaster. At the same time, the seething alien maggots, members of the dread unity, reached his booted feet. Maddox howled again, stomping on the squishy white things, making their guts spurt. A blast of telepathic power struck his mind. For a third time, Captain Maddox howled. It was a sound of mingled fear, fury, and rage. It boiled against the alien telepathic control, creating a shield against it. Maddox stomped with a passion. He turned the selector switch on the blaster to wide beam, and he aimed into the chamber, blasting the mass of alien maggot unity. It felt wonderfully good to destroy these little buggers. Seeing them writhe and fry, realizing they'd killed Garth, taken control of everyone on Remus, Maddox danced a mad jig as he entered the chamber, stomping and crushing, raying and laughing in maniacal glee. He was beyond himself, his fear gone. He now seethed with vengeful fury against these cowardly aliens that would control his mind, control all humans as if they were mind slaves. This was their reward, an orgy of murderous Captain Maddox killing. The unity dies, Maddox roared. That shouting began the process that pulled him back from the berserk madness of slaughter. It lost himself for a moment. Perhaps the alien telepathic assault on his mind had caused it. The repugnance of the unity had also driven him to the edge of rage and despair. Maddox looked around the chamber, and he realized that masses of surviving alien maggots slithered away from mouse-sized bolt holes. No, you don't, he said, sane once more. He moved the selector switch, turning it back to narrow beam, and he aimed at one of the holes. Nothing happened when he pulled the trigger. His blaster was out of power. The mass of maggots on the move ceased their retreat, turning toward him again, their little jaws moving back and forth. Maddox didn't hesitate. He turned around and charged out, escaping an instant before the hatch slammed shut behind him. His blaster was worthless for the moment. His limbs were fatigued by the wildness of his stomping slaughter. Even so, Maddox ran. He had to get off Remus as fast as possible. By attacking him telepathically, the unity had inadvertently betrayed much to him. It had opened itself while trying to coerce him, learning from him even as he learned about it. The greater unity knew about him now, and it hated him with a passion. It wanted him more than dead. And it feared him. Maddox laughed like a wolf that had slain a herd of goats, with wildness in his blazing eyes. He'd faced the alien menace. He knew them, and he'd learned much about the underground facility, had a map of the place in his head. Valron's training and the spiritual power of the arrows he'd absorbed long ago had made all the difference. He had to think he'd been given these gifts for moments like these. Moments when his fate, and that of his friends, perhaps even Earth's, hung in the balance. Call it providence, or destiny. Right, Maddox said. He had a good idea about how to get off Remus, about where he needed to go to cause that. He also suspected the unity knew he knew and would try to stop him before he got there. Thus, he had to reach Riker and Keith as fast as possible. He also had to make sure the two wouldn't face the massed telepathic might of the unity. They could not possibly resist as he had. The enemy had a grim power when in close proximity. If there had been more alien maggots in the room when he'd face them. Forget that, Maddox told himself. Concentrate on what needs doing and do it. With that, he increased his speed, knowing his window of opportunity for getting off Remus was closing fast. Chapter 61 Captain, Riker shouted. A grim-faced and concentrating Maddox almost raced past the two men. At the last moment, he halted, staring at them with seeming incomprehension. Are you all right, sir? Riker asked with worry in his voice. Maddox just stood there, panting, 
as sweat rolled down his dirty face. Riker and Keith exchanged glances. Sir, Riker said, you're a mess. What happened down there? Maddox shook his head and he became aware of the two. I made it, he said. Look, we have to keep moving. The unity is gathering itself. I think they're cordoning off any means of escape. Did you say unity, sir? I have no time to explain, Sergeant. I've faced the aliens. They're disgusting and hideous. And there's a reason they've remained hidden all these centuries. Go that way, Maddox pointed. We have to go that way. Why? Asked Riker. Maddox rounded on him. Sergeant, are you questioning me? That way, Riker said. You know best, sir. Lead the way. Lieutenant, Maddox said. Can you run? If I have to, Keith said, sounding reluctant. Oh, yes, Maddox said. You have to. But if you're good and do as I say, I can give you a fighter to fly. Then we can see if you really are the best or not. A space fighter, sir? Asked Keith, brightening. I believe so. In that case, I can sprint, sir. Good, Maddox said as he cocked his head. I can hear others heading our way. It's time to hightail it. I don't hear anything, Riker said. That's because you're old and fat, Maddox said. If you were in shape like me, I hear it, Keith said, interrupting. Let's go. I want to be a fighter ace again, and I want to bust some ass for all the suffering I've been going through. Damn right, Maddox said. Now go. He shoved the small pilot who staggered in the right direction. They ran, with Maddox pacing beside them, and it soon became obvious that whatever chased them was catching up. Lieutenant, Maddox said, I need your gun and whatever extra ammo you have. Wordlessly, as he panted and sweated, still running, Keith handed Maddox his gun and two extra magazines. Keep going, Maddox said. I'll return shortly. With that, he stopped, considered, and began sprinting back the way he'd just come. Maddox heard them, big men in body armor of some kind. They stomped and clattered and breathed heavily. None of them spoke, however. Kneeling in the center of the corridor, Maddox waited. He had a good idea what he'd see. He raised the gun, holding it with both hands. The first enforcer ran around the corner, a big man in gray overalls wearing a chest protector and wielding a baton. He had a cerebrator embedded in his forehead. Maddox had expected no less. He waited as more enforcers followed the first. They saw him and they charged, although they did not yell like normal men. Their eyes did not widen, seeing that he held a gun. They raced at him, straining to reach him, no doubt propelled by the mass mind of the alien unity. With deliberate care, Maddox shot them one by one, ejecting the empty magazine and slamming in the next. He kept firing and they kept tumbling onto the floor. A few of them tripped over the dying and badly wounded. He shot them as well. It was gruesome and inhuman, as they did not scream in agony or even groan in pain, but doggedly attacked. He took no joy in the slaughter. He knew if he held back that they would reach him and likely beat him to death at best. At worst, he would be hauled off to have another cerebrator embedded in his forehead. He was sure it would be different the second time around. Maddox ejected the second magazine and inserted the third. The survivors were closer than before and they kept on coming, grunting when he fired and did not immediately kill them. You poor bastards, Maddox snarled. I'm sorry I have to kill you. They're forcing me to do it. He jumped up with a feeling the aliens were running out of men. And then his borrowed gun went click, click, click. It was empty. He dropped it and drew his monofilament blade, the one with an edge a molecule thick that could cut through anything. Maddox charged them, ducked, slashed, stabbed, took a baton hit on the shoulder. It went numb and weaved the other way. He slashed and shouted in rage at the maggot aliens forcing this on him. He, Maddox looked around, panting in the sudden silence. No more enforcers charged, although a few stirred on the heaped mass of them on the floor. Maddox stared in impotent anger and grief. He knelt where he stood, mumbled a prayer for their collective souls, offered an apology afterward, and cleaned his knife on one of them, wiping it on the overalls. He stood, staring at them. With a shake of his head, he sheathed his knife, picked up Keith's empty gun, and turned around. The hideousness of the action had stunned him. 
Go, Maddox whispered to himself. If he didn't get back to Riker and Keith in time. Maddox grunted and broke into a run. They had a window of opportunity now. It was time to take it. Chapter 62 Gallion, the deified driving force, stood on the bridge of victory. He could not get over the admission of Addox. Diana Varys said the aliens had seen Addox. That was wonderful news. Where did these Addox live? Were they at war with these aliens? Were they allies or subjugated by them? There are missiles. What am I supposed to call you, Gallion? Andros asked from the science station. Driving force, Gallion said. It is my old rank, and it is right that I carry it while I am in charge of victory. Andros nodded. Missiles have launched from Remus driving force. I'm counting seven of them. They appear to be old type missiles run on chemical fuel and launched by stages or sections. I have already seen them, Gallion said, surprised at the thrill he felt at being called driving force after all this time. He missed the old days when he had been a flesh and blood creature, driving force Gallion. It had a truly wonderful ring to it. You might have told us about the missiles then, Andro said, giving us a heads up about what's happening. Should I use the neutron cannon against the missile, sir? Lieutenant Barnes asked. What did you say? Asked Gallion. The neutron cannon, Barnes said. I heard you about that, Gallion said, interrupting. You said, sir, did you not? Barnes swiveled around to face Gallion. I don't understand. I am driving force Gallion. Did you not hear me tell Andros a second ago when he asked? Barnes glanced at Andros, who was to his left. Gallion, Andros said. Lieutenant Barnes meant driving force by saying, sir. It was implied. I know you've often heard the others call Captain Maddox, sir. He accepts it as proper form. It took a half second. Then Gallion said, yes, I see that. I... I do not know why I forgot just then. That is a negative, Lieutenant, regarding the neutron cannon just yet. Let us see what kind of velocity these old-style missiles can achieve before we address them with the high-powered cannon. Do you want the missiles to leave the atmosphere? Andros asked. They'll likely be more dangerous once in space. Gallion turned to the science officer. I do not appreciate these questions to my authority any more than Captain Maddox does to his. Gallion, Andros said, this is unlike you. Has our calling you driving force changed your perspective? I do not believe so. However, that is not the issue. Questioning my authority is the issue. Is your authority legal, I wonder? Andros asked. Are you challenging it? Andros paused thoughtfully before he said, no, still, I wonder what the Lord High Admiral is going to say about what Meta did. Meta acted correctly, Gallion said. Even though she didn't have the legal authority to do what she did, asked Andros. As Captain Maddox's wife, Meta possessed the moral authority, though, Gallion said. Clearly, we have all obeyed her command. Thus, we are all in agreement with Meta's decision. Andros stared at Gallion a moment longer, opened his mouth, as if he was going to argue further, and then abruptly turned around and monitored his station. Mr. Barnes, Gallion said, I have taken the science officer's suggestion to heart. Launch an antimatter missile at the seven. Yes, driving force, Barnes said, his powerful hands roving over his weapons panel. An antimatter missile left the starship as the seven big chemical-fueled missiles continued to climb out of Remus's gravity well. Gallion used the ship's sensors to study the missiles more closely. They were big and crude, powered by chemical fuel, as Andros had said. Using sensors, Gallion quickly determined that they held old-fashioned nuclear warheads. He decided the aliens must have taken whatever the Remus military possessed and converted it for their alien efforts. Each of the big crude missiles detached the second-stage rocket, having previously detached the first stage. As smaller missiles, now much higher in the atmosphere, they sped for victory, which was well out of low orbital space and heading farther out all the time. 
we could outrun these missiles with ease, Galleon realized. He used the ship's sensors scanning elsewhere, seeing if the aliens had fixed their attention while bringing the real threat from elsewhere. Galleon did not sense anything else. He did, however, notice Grotch's stealth ship even farther away from Remus. The Morag mercenary watched them, using observation sensors. It would have been enjoyable to use the disruptor cannon on the mercenary and taken him out of play. But there was a chance the captain was aboard. Thus, he would give Grotch leeway for now. The missiles are almost out of the atmosphere, Lieutenant Barnes said. Thank you. Galleon said. I am well aware of that. The hollow image AI continued to monitor the situation. The antimatter missile sped faster for the planet. The seven Remus missiles climbed higher. Then the antimatter missile reached them and detonated. A whiteout appeared, and Galleon could no longer monitor the seven missiles. A minute later, he could, and the seven Remus missiles no longer existed. We destroyed the missile's driving force, Barnes said. Excellent work, Galleon said, deciding to mimic the captain's behavior in such a situation and spread around praise where applicable. Should I return us near the planet? The pilot asked. Galleon considered the idea. Negative. We shall observe from here. Mr. Barnes, I would like you to launch two probes, one for ground level and the other to remain in low orbital space. Yes, driving force, Barnes said. I am preparing two probes. I am also revising my previous decision, Galleon said. You may use sir instead of driving force. It is correct usage after all. Yes, sir, Barnes said. Thank you, sir. Galleon wanted to smile as he felt he had handled that rather well. Being in charge again. It took some getting used to and was quite the heady feeling. He liked it. Now, though, he wanted more data on possible adocs. But he was worried for Captain Maddox, Riker, and Keith. Were the three men alive? Why had the fold fighter crashed? All he could do for now was wait, hoping the captain could pull another of his proverbial rabbits out of his hat. Chapter 63 In a subterranean hangar bay on Remus, Sergeant Riker panted with exhaustion as he reached into his jacket and took out his bottle of pills. He unscrewed the lid and shook a white pill onto his palm. He'd already taken one earlier and should wait another six hours before he took another, but... Riker looked around. Maddox and Keith were checking parked fighters. They were big and crude, low-orbital craft, like something from a museum. The fighters seemed like giant rockets more than anything else. Surely they belonged to the Remus Air Space Service rather than being Unity craft brought down here. Riker turned around. Behind them were 30 unconscious or dead humans with cerebrators in their foreheads. Some had horrible knife wounds, still leaking blood or gore. Others had caved-in heads where Riker had used his bionic arm to smash them. Sure, his left arm and leg had bionic power. That didn't mean the rest of him did. The fight had exhausted Riker. Just as bad, the stunner was out of a charge. Riker debated taking a third pill. With a wistful sigh, he decided against it. His heart might not be able to take the extra strain. This, more than anything else, should show him it was time to quit the service. Or get in better shape, he supposed. Riker patted his protruding belly. It had been getting bigger no matter what kind of diet he tried. He'd eat less for a time, but then splurge and gain it all back with interest. I need to exercise more, Riker muttered. No, I need to actually exercise, period. He started toward the others. They seemed to have chosen the biggest rocket fighter in the place. It had a tiny cockpit up near the top, and a horrendous amount of space in back for the rocket fuel. A premonition of danger struck Riker. Could his fat old body take the strain of a rocket ride up into the heavens? Maybe he'd better take that third pill after all. Riker stopped, and he pressed a hand over his heart. His old organ beat painfully, and it did it more, thudding with something extra, a bad extra. Please don't fail me, heart. Riker said to himself. 
Would this be a good or bad way to leave the world? Riker shrugged. He didn't want to leave just yet. He didn't want to quit working for Starwatch either. He liked his job. He liked working. He loved the people he worked with. And if he quit the service, what would happen to Maddox? The young Cockrell would get himself into a mess, and his guardian angel Riker wouldn't be there to help. Is that what I am? The captain's guardian angel? Riker shook his head ruefully as he realized that was exactly how he saw himself. He'd never been married, unless one counted a common law wife he'd had for five years as a youngster. He'd had a few girlfriends afterward, but after his common law wife had left him, Riker scowled. He didn't want to think about her. He didn't want to think about the man he'd nearly beaten to death for cheating with his woman. That had been a row, all right, decades ago now. Why am I thinking all this? Riker frowned. His leathery face was good at it. Did he think he was going to die today? Was he remembering old times because of that? If so, he was really proud of Captain Maddox. He was proud of what the lad, well, not a lad anymore. He was proud of Maddox, and maybe he thought of the captain as the nephew he'd never had. Better stick around a while, you old fart, Riker muttered. He could survive a blast off, and he could start exercising a bit more and get rid of the belly he'd been accumulating. This wasn't going to be his last mission. No, sir, no way. He would get in prime shape and surprise them all. Sergeant, Maddox shouted. Shake a leg, old man. We're getting ready to leave. Riker grinned, but he didn't run. Let them get ready. Let the pill do its damn job for a change. Could that rocket of a fighter get them off the planet? Wheezing, Riker shuffled a little faster. I will get in better shape. This I vow. I can't quit yet. In a few years, I'll do it then. Riker smiled, thinking that, heading toward the captain, when a haze of thudding pain blossomed in his chest. He fought it. The pain worsened, and he went blank. Falling, perhaps, but he didn't know, as he remembered no more. Chapter 64 Captain Maddox turned to shout at Riker again to hurry up. He turned just in time to see the old sergeant faint dead away and crumple onto the deck. Get it ready, Maddox shouted at Keith. What am I supposed to do? Figure out what you can. And do it fast. I'm getting Riker. Maddox didn't wait for Keith to ask anything else, but hustled to the old man. Watching Riker faint and fall, Maddox felt a stab of fright. This couldn't be happening. Riker had been with him forever. They'd been working the same shift since... You old fool, Maddox muttered under his breath. Yet there was no bile in his voice. They were the frightened words a son might say watching his father fall. Maybe having a heart attack. Maddox hadn't always liked his real dad. In fact, he'd hated his father for a long time. He'd since learned differently. Now Maddox was proud of his dad, fiercely proud. He still had some things to settle with his father's old new men enemies. That would come in time. But that wasn't the point here. Riker. The sergeant hadn't been his father figure. He'd been... Maddox didn't know what Tregus and Riker had been to him all this time. The old man had been more than a friend, more than a subordinate. He'd been Sergeant Riker, the most trustworthy of Confederates he'd ever had. Riker, he said, reaching the old man lying on the deck, slowly breathing. He's breathing, Maddox told himself. That was good, a good sign that the man was going to make it. He knelt, shaking his shoulder. Riker, you okay? The sergeant opened bleary eyes, staring up at him in hurt and surprise, as if he couldn't figure out what had happened or maybe where he was. What happened to you? Maddox asked. Riker frowned, and his face seemed stiff. He tried to speak, but only moved his lips without making a sound. What was wrong with him? He stared up at Maddox, finally whispering, I don't feel so good. You must have gotten winded, Maddox said, knowing he was fudging. Riker looked as if he'd had a heart attack or a stroke. Don't worry about it, though. Let me help you up. You know, Riker whispered. I'm not so sure about that. 
Let me lie here for a while. I'll get up when I'm ready. Sergeant, I want you to listen to me. Are you listening? If I have to. Riker whispered as he scowled. That moved the stiff part of his face. Maybe not a stroke after all, but definitely a heart attack. I forbid you to die, old man. Riker stared at Maddox and understanding filled his eyes. Something bad had happened to him. Yet despite that, the barest of smiles slid into place. We've had some times, haven't we, sir? Sergeant, I don't want to have to repeat myself. I know, I feel so tired, just really tired. That last fight was a good one, though, wasn't it? Damn it, old man. Why did you get so fat? Why did you... Screw this. Maddox reached down, grasped Riker by the lapels of his uniform, and hoisted him up onto his shoulder. You're heavier than Keith, a lot heavier. I don't feel so good. Stay with me, Sergeant. I'm going to need your help in a minute. Just for a minute, though, eh, sir? Are you staying with me? Riker shuddered, and he did not respond. Maddox grinded his back teeth in frustration. And there was something else that brought a pang to his chest. It felt so strange, and he couldn't understand why moisture had gathered in his eyes. If you die, Maddox didn't finish the phrase. He hurried to the chosen rocket fighter and climbed the ladder with Riker on his left shoulder. It was tough going, but he wasn't going to fail now. By straining and performing a delicate balancing act, Maddox reached the tiny cockpit area. The hardest part was negotiating from the ladder to the cockpit. He jumped in the end, made it by slamming against a bulkhead and gently setting Riker onto a cushioned crash seat. He hooked the restraints onto Riker, saw that the old man still breathed, if very shallowly, and then put both palms on the sergeant's chest. Maddox squeezed his eyes closed as hard as they could go. That pang squeezed his chest again, and more moisture leaked out of his eyes. Holy God, Maddox whispered. Please heal my sergeant. I beg you, Lord, don't let him die out here. Let him live a long life. I, I need him, Lord. I need this old man to live. Amen. Maddox didn't open his eyes right away. He kept his palms on Riker's chest, feeling how the chest hardly rose. Finally, he looked upon the old man. You're going to make it, Sergeant. You're not dying like this. You rest a bit. Keith and I have to get things ready. Then you're going to have to tough it out for a bit. But after that, the medical people will make you as good as new. Riker, do you hear me? The sergeant did not answer, although he continued to breathe. Maddox shook his head in frustration. He felt something just then and searched inside the sergeant's jacket, pulling out a small bottle of pills. He unscrewed the cap and shook out a pill. Staring at it, he opened Riker's mouth and shoved the pill in. Then he leaned low. Chew and swallow, Maddox said sternly. That's an order. Nothing happened. I don't want to repeat myself, Maddox said in desperation. Although the eyes remained closed, the lips moved. The teeth crunched the pill, and soon the old man swallowed slowly. Maddox hoped that helped. What more could he do? He shook his head, steeling himself against the worst. He loved this fat old man, but he had a responsibility to Jewel and Meta. He would look after Riker. Damn it, Sergeant. I don't need this grief right now. You pull through or you're going to be sorry you didn't. Incredibly, Riker's lips moved. Maddox put his right ear near the lips, listening. Riker mumbled more, but it was impossible to tell what he said as the words were inaudible. Just so you know, old man. But Maddox couldn't finish because suddenly he had the superstitious feeling that if he told Riker how he felt, the old man would up and die on him, satisfied. Instead, he had to string the sergeant along. I'll tell you later, Maddox said. Do you hear me? Riker mumbled once more. Then his head lolled to the side as he began to snore the slightest bit. Maddox sighed, figuring that would have to do for now, as he needed to help Keith get his fighter ready for flight. Chapter 65 Time moved too fast as Maddox and Keith worked feverishly to prepare the Remus atmospheric rocket-propelled space fighter for liftoff. 
It will be like riding a bomb into space, Keith said once. Maddox didn't reply, but worked even harder. There were other fighters and equipment in the cavernous hangar bay. Maddox set a bomblet near the crowd of unconscious and dead men, which was near the entrance. He kept an eye on them in case any came around too soon and resumed their assault. When the first one stirred, Maddox debated the correct response, until a two-seater cycle roared into the hangar bay with a man riding it. Maddox's thumb depressed a switch. That detonated the bomblet, which killed those lying there and the rider of the vehicle that had roared into the hangar bay. That gave them a few more minutes of uninterrupted work. How much longer until we can leave this place? Maddox shouted at Keith. Unhook the fuel lines, then we're good to go. Get up there, Maddox said. I'll follow. The captain used a hoist, moving from one fuel line to another, pulling them and capping the tank. He reached the floor when a telepathic thought struck him. Captain Maddox, your escape attempt is futile. Maddox jumped off the hoist and ran for the ladder, scrambling up it like a squirrel. We will never let you leave, Remus. Do you want to leave the planet? Maddox shouted. Do not worry about us. I'm not. We will leave when we desire. For now, we are preparing it as a training facility. Still, none of that matters to you. If you attempt to leave, you shall die. If you remain on Remus, you will become our ambassador to Star Watch. Do you really mean that? Maddox asked, even as he climbed the ladder. We give our word as the unity. You know what? Maddox said as he reached the cockpit. I'm going to accept your offer. It's a good one, and I don't want to die. Raising his eyebrows high, Keith stared at Maddox. The captain shook his head at Keith. How can we know that you're sincere in this? Because I said so, Maddox said, even as he motioned for Keith to take off. We sense deceit in your words. Are you sure that's not projecting your guilt on your part for lying to me? We are not lying, Captain. You will represent us to... Wait, this is a game to you. You are attempting to trick us in order to buy yourself time to blast off. I assure you that isn't true, Maddox said. Who are you talking to? Keith asked, flipping a switch. The cockpit hatch was closing. The unity, Maddox said. Now take off already. Don't wait another second. What does that mean? Are you speaking to us, Captain? I realize the unity is going to win in the end, Maddox said. That's why I think your offer is genuine. You are not gaining anything by these lies. We are learning about you even now, however. Keith was busy clicking more switches. The cockpit cover sealed with a hiss. There was a slight shaking to the cramped cabin as rockets began pre-ignition. We're ready, sir, he told Maddox. Sergeant, Maddox said. How are you feeling? Tired. Riker whispered with his eyes closed. Hang in there, old man, Maddox said, patting the sergeant on the arm. You are in a rocket fighter, attempting to blast off. You are a deceiver, Captain Maddox. Takes one to no know one, Maddox said. This is our final offer, Captain Maddox. Are you refusing it? No, I'm telling you that I'm delighted to accept. There might have been another mass mind telepathic thought aimed at Maddox. He did not receive it, however. For at that moment, the rocket fighter ignited with fury, the entire long rocket fighter shaking dreadfully. None of them wore helmets or a flight suit. Each of them was strapped into the tiny cockpit with screens and controls around them. It was a crude craft compared to a Star Watch fighter, but it should get them into space. At that point, a huge hangar hatch above the ship opened. It must have still been dark outside because none of them saw anything up there. All the while, the rocket fighter shook as a horrific roar blasted against them, and the vessel slowly began to move higher, thunder deafening all other thoughts and sounds. The rocket fighter moved a little faster yet, and the roar was just a little less. Keith gave Maddox a thumbs up. Maddox nodded, doing likewise to Keith, and then glancing at Riker. The sergeant's leathery face had turned stark white, but he was still breathing, and he clutched the armrests. Maddox took that as a good sign. The rocket fighter reached the opening, slipping through and climbing into the open air. 
It picked up speed and continued to spew reaction mass. Maddox's heart raced even as he was pressed against the crash seat. This was primitive space travel, all right, but it was working. It was actually working. He thought to hear something in his mind, but it slipped away before he could understand it. Keith concentrated at the pilot's seat, his hands pressed against the controls. Once more, Maddox looked over at Riker. The sergeant still breathed, but he looked whiter than ever, and sweat slicked his face. Now they were beginning to move, climbing and gaining velocity the entire time. They still couldn't talk in the cockpit as the engine roar drowned out all other speech. Maddox leaned over, looking at a crude sensor screen. There were green blips there, two of them. Maddox motioned madly until Keith looked at him. Maddox pointed at the screen. Keith noticed it, staring longer than Maddox liked. The pilot looked back at him, shrugging. Maddox shouted at Keith. Keith shook his head and tapped his ears, indicating that he couldn't hear. It was possible the Unity had fired missiles at the rocket fighter. Keith seemed to be searching his pilot board. Eventually, he tapped a switch, looked at a different screen, and then turned to Maddox, laughing. The captain couldn't hear the laughter, but he nodded. After that, he watched the primitive screen. Soon, the two green dots disappeared. Maddox grinned, for the first time, thinking they might actually succeed. Chapter 66 Lieutenant Keith Maker shivered with glee as he piloted the rocket fighter through the smoggy early morning atmosphere of Remus. He shivered because the accelerating rocket roared upward toward orbital space, causing everything in the cramped cockpit to shake and shiver. Maddox and Riker were strapped into the other two available seats. Those two were superfluous to getting back to victory again. This was all up to him despite the fact that he didn't understand a word on the control panels. He was working off instinct and his expert knowledge of fighter design and effect. So far, everything had done what he'd expected it to do. Keith had felt uncomfortable and out of his element before this, running through subterranean corridors, firing at alien-controlled toadies, and breathing crappy air. He hadn't cared for any of that. That was a foot fighter's territory a Marine's type of combat. That wasn't his style in the least. This baby, this crude craft with its single gun and with its rocket fuel and primitive radar, this was how he did it. The past few hours slid off Keith. The humiliation of riding on the captain's shoulder, of flagging energy. Keith shook his head. No more of that, man. This was how a real man fought behind the controls of a space fighter, jinking and jiving, using skills with the twitch of his fingers and his mind. He was the best at this, the very best. And he was going to prove it by bringing these louts back to victory. The entire fighter shook, and there was a clang, a jerk, and Keith saw the last stage fall off the rocket and away from them and fall back toward the smoggy planet. We've achieved low orbit, gentlemen. Keith said with pride in his voice, as if reaching this point in the mission was all due to his efforts. Weightlessness hit them. Keith could feel his butt lift the slightest bit from his crash seat, although the restraints held him down. He turned to Maddox. How's Riker doing? Maddox turned to the old sucker. He's breathing. Sergeant, can you hear me? Riker didn't reply. Maddox looked up. Do you see victory? Keith arched his eyebrows, wanting to say, are you kidding me, mate? They'd barely reached low orbit, and the radar screen sat in front of Maddox. Why didn't the captain get to work instead of expecting the ace fighter jock to do everything for him? The radar screen is in front of you, sir, Keith said instead. Ah, Maddox said, so it is. He began to tap it and play with it. Those look like launches, he said. Keith leaned over so he could look at the radar screen. I'd say so. There are three of them. Are they missiles? Keith glanced at the captain, and he must have had a smirk on his face. Lieutenant, but Maddox let the word drift away, although he stared at Keith. Keith cleared his throat, twisted to the radar screen again, and studied it closely. He reached over and clicked a switch. There was a shift, and the radar images turned red. I'm thinking they're fighters, like us, sir. Maddox squinted at Keith. Call it a premonition, 
Keith said. I think you know a thing or two about that, eh? Glad to see you're back, Maddox said. Keith gave him an abrupt nod. I'm back, sir, and I'm pissed off at the poor treatment we received planetside. Now, if you'll give me a second, I'll figure out our options. Maddox folded his arms across his chest. Keith pulled back to his panel, studying it, testing a switch here and a button there. I'd say we have fuel for a ten-minute space burn. These rocket fighters weren't meant to last long up here. Of course, I doubt they burned up all that fuel in one continuous use. I can maneuver, or... Keith didn't finish the thought. Go on, Maddox said. Or do what? Head out farther from the planet, sir, hoping that Victory, or maybe a fusion ship, is nearby to pick us up. Or Grutch, Maddox said. That's another possibility, Keith admitted. Take a look at those blips again, Maddox said. Recheck their status. Will do, Keith said as he leaned over again. Uh-oh, I think I had it wrong before. I think those are missiles. Nuclear tipped, asked Maddox. If not that, then hunter killers, satellite killers maybe, or maybe rocket fighter killers like us. Where's the calm around here? asked Maddox. Keith looked around and finally twisted in his seat and searched with his eyes where Riker sat. I'd say that's it, sir, he pointed by Riker. Right, Maddox said. He leaned over and began to test the comm. The thing soon whirred into life as it activated. This looks like a microphone, Maddox said. He clicked it and said, this is Captain Maddox. We're in the rocket fighter leaving orbital space. Several hunter-killer missiles are heading for us. If you can lend a hand, we would appreciate that. Seconds ticked by. Victory must still be near Vulcan, Keith said. I'll turn us around and try some long-distance firing with the cannon. Just then, the comm crackled, and a tinny voice asked, Is that you, sir? Galleon, Maddox said into the microphone. Is that you? Yes, sir, Galleon said. We have spotted your rocket. We are coming to intercept. If you could continue outward, that would help. Keith laughed with glee. We're on our way, Maddox said. Is everything all right over there? We have faced a mishap or two, but we are ready to act. Glad to hear it, Maddox said. Now hurry up, if you please. We don't want to cut this too closely. Chapter 67 The Morag mercenary had been eavesdropping on victory for some time while still maintaining a watch on the planet. It troubled him that Galleon presently ran the starship. This new development... Grutch's gelatinous bulk quivered as his eye stalks drew back and lowered. The tentacles all but disappeared. According to a radio message, Captain Maddox claimed to be in the runaway missile that used its remaining fuel to build up velocity as it left Remus. The owners of Remus now launched. Grutch's eye stalks lengthened as the eyeballs on the end concentrated on one screen apiece. The shells fired from the space fighter had struck the earlier launched hunter killers, destroying them. It was quality work with such primitive weaponry. If he'd heard correctly, Lieutenant Keith Maker had achieved this feat of marksmanship. Now, however, 19 missiles sped up from Remus, hurtling after the capsule holding Captain Maddox. What did that mean for his bars of tellurium? The alien presence on Remus... Grutch did not think humans ran the planet anymore. Hated Captain Maddox. They wished him dead. Why would the aliens dislike the captain so much that they would expend so much effort and weaponry? Perhaps more importantly for Grutch's sake, would the missiles reach Maddox's capsule in time? Victory already hurried to intercept them. Grutch itched to make his move. He debated teleporting to the primitive capsule and extracting Maddox from it. Then he could be on his way. He would leave this bleary nebula and its strange practices. Something didn't seem right, however, and Grutch wasn't certain. An alarm rang in the control chamber. Grutch whipped about to scan. Victory was warming up its disruptor cannon. Why should his alarm blare because of that? Grutch warbled in fear. Victory had target lock on his stealth ship. That should be impossible. He had far superior technology. No, no, Grutch told himself. 
That is the wrong thought. It must be Galleon. The ad hoc AI hollow image had attacked him once before. Likely, the AI hollow image had learned a great deal in that one moment. No wonder events had moved against him lately. This was all Galleon's fault. Grutch activated emergency teleportation. The enemy disruptor cannon built up energy. Tentacles flailed about the control chamber as Grutch deployed all kinds of defensive measures. His craft spewed gel, launched decoy emitters, and strained to reach teleportation capacity. On the double oval starship, a yellow ray reached out, burning into the deployed gel, exploding various emitters, and reaching for the hull of the stealth ship. At that moment, the stealth ship teleported, and the ray burned through the area where the Morag vessel had just been. Grutch's ship reappeared five million kilometers from its last position. The pink-gray mass of Grutch sweated fear stain. It was a revolting stench, and it helped the mercenary move faster than usual. He checked his screens, his analyzers, the hull, and other ship functions. An oozing substance now poured from Grutch. It was relief wash, and it cleaned him from the fear stain and brought him back to his usual calm. That had been far too close. Grutch had lived much longer than any Methuselah man, and he planned to live longer yet. How had this nearness to death come about? Grutch yearned to go to the mudroom and bathe and relax. He needed to contemplate the Maddox grab. His sponsors offered a great sum. But what good was any of that to him dead? Should he return to his sponsors and demand a greater sum? The idea appealed to Grutch. The sponsors had seemed to offer him a great deal, but now he was no longer sure. Maybe in retrospect, it had been a miserable sum. Could he bargain with them to increase the payment? That had a few drawbacks, of course. He had journeyed quite far without payment. To have acted all this time without profit was galling. Such a thing did not appeal to Grutch. Yet, Galleon was vile and wickedly clever. Worse, he could not eavesdrop on the AI hollow image's thoughts. This was becoming a dangerous mission indeed. If he left now, eventually, those on victory would drop their guard against him. That would make a kidnapping later, for much more payment, worthwhile. Grutch watched his screens. Victory beamed the Remus missile mass with neutron and disruptor cannons. Masses of missiles were destroyed one after another. Maddox in his tiny missile ship. Look at that. Another fold fighter appeared. Did the starship possess more than one of the wonderfully clever craft? I have underestimated Maddox and his people. At that moment, Grutch almost decided to leave and re-bargain later with his sponsors. They clearly hated Maddox and Starwatch. He was sure he could make his sponsors pay through the orifice for Maddox. Still, Grutch wanted to watch developments for just a while longer. These odd aliens on the planet, knowing them, learning about them, could be worth future wealth. Therefore, Grutch began moving about the stealth ship. It was time to implement greater safety measures. Then he would keep his distance, keep his sensor rays from victory, and await developments, as he was sure something interesting was about to happen soon. Chapter 68 Maddox, Riker, and Keith made it to victory. Marines rushed Riker to medical, where they began immediate heart surgery. You barely made it back in time, the chief medical officer told Maddox later. I'm surprised Riker held out this long. He suffered a heart attack out there, and another was ready to strike. Will he be okay? asked Maddox. Thank goodness it wasn't a stroke. His heart stopped, but it restarted. We can do plenty now. As I said, it's a miracle he made it. But he did. Upon leaving medical, Maddox leaned his forehead against a corridor bulkhead and whispered, Thank you, God. I owe you one. I surely do. I'm very grateful that you let Riker live. Maddox rejoined Meta shortly after that. 
She told him what had happened on the bridge with Valerie, and how the lieutenant commander was demanding release from the holding cell that Meta had put her in. I'd better talk to her, Maddox said. We need to do something about the lumps on her forehead. I think the poor cosmetic, whatever you want to call it, is bothering her and adding to her misery. Maddox nodded, and he grinned at his wife. I appreciate your quick action on the bridge, and delegating command to Galleon was brilliant. It likely saved everyone, including us on the planet. I doubt anyone else would have done what you did, and so decisively. Meta brightened. I knew there was a reason I joined the mission. Leaving Jewel was hard. I'm not sure I could do it again. But before we left Earth, I realized there would be a moment when only I could fix the situation. Isn't that strange? Maddox grunted an affirmative. Maybe you're rubbing off on me. I had a Maddox moment, a powerful premonition of what was to come. Maddox smiled at his wife. To think it happened on the bridge with Valerie. Meta shook her head. How odd I should have felt something like that beforehand. Well, now, I want to get home. Jewel is one thing at a time, Maddox said, interrupting. I have a ton on my plate, and it's all vying for my attention. You saved us. It was perfect, and I'm proud of how you handled it. Now, though, I need to deal with Valerie. Meta was frowning. I promise we'll discuss Jewel later. For now, though, we have to stay focused on the present and figure out the unity, how it affects others like Valerie and how to deal with it directly. Meta nodded sharply, obviously unhappy with the diversion. Maddox hardly noticed as he scrunched his brow in thought and as they moved down a corridor toward the brig. I find it interesting that I met Garth and Valerie met Diana Varys, Maddox said. That wasn't a coincidence. Let me put that in the positive. The unity planned it. So what does that imply? Maddox rubbed his chin. The Cerebrators and Unity Telepathy are likely both more powerful than we realize. If not for Balron and the aerial energy I possess, darling, Meta said sharply as she wrapped her hands around his left arm. Do you ever think that someday your luck will run out? Maddox blinked thrown out of his thought about the unity and its telepathic powers. He glanced at his wife. We've been over that. I have a job to do, and I do it. There must be a limit to your luck. Maddox shook his head. He disliked this kind of talk. He needed to concentrate on the unity and its goal. Still, he could see the warning signs on Meta's face. He wanted to avoid this talk, however, so he said, I needed you on the bridge with Valerie. We've been over that. Meta said with an edge to her voice. Maddox sighed, and he controlled a sudden surge of anger. Dealing with his wife, even as a part of the crew, was so much different from dealing with the others. Still, having his wife aboard had saved his life, and maybe saved the entire starship and everyone aboard. Who would have had the nerve to relieve Valerie from command like that and then give it to Galleon? They reached the main brig hatch. Ah. Uh, Maddox said as he disengaged his arm from Meta's hold. As much as I'd like to discuss my luck, as you put it, we have to use our time wisely. Events are crashing together at light speed. I need information from Valerie. To get it, I'd better speak to her alone. Meta studied her husband and the cloud behind her eyes. Perhaps she had another premonition. What if the aliens use their power through Valerie to attack you while you're alone? Maddox smiled softly. I think I can take care of myself versus the lieutenant commander or the aliens. Don't get cocky, Meta warned. You know that's a new man trait, don't you? Overconfidence, one of their negative aspects. Maddox stared at his wife before nodding. You're right, I'll keep that in mind. Now, darling, I need to do this alone. Fine, Meta said. We can talk about this later. Maddox wasn't looking forward to that. In fact, he hoped to sidetrack his wife on the topic of Jewel and his line of work. He leaned near and kissed her, and he rubbed a shoulder. Then he turned to go. Be careful, Meta said. The unity is probably desperate now that you got away. Don't get cocky just because it's Valerie in there. We're far from out of this. Maddox nodded as he passed through the hatch his mind focusing once again on the problem at hand. 
Chapter 69 Maddox decided to run this like a normal interrogation and had the sergeant-at-arms bring Valerie into a small cell with a table and two chairs. The captain changed it up in one particular. He would have normally put a prisoner into the room first to let her sit and stew. Valerie was a different matter. Not strictly a prisoner, but one of their own, possibly under alien domination. The hatch opened and two Marines ushered the lieutenant commander into the cell. Maddox stood from where he sat at the table and nodded at her. Hello, Valerie. Why am I in the brig? Valerie complained. What did I do wrong? Instead of answering, Maddox indicated the other chair. Valerie scowled at him. Am I a prisoner then on victory? Please, Maddox said. Let's forgo any needless drama and get it over with. Sit, and we can discuss it. For a moment, it seemed Valerie would become mulish as she screwed up her features. Abruptly, that smoothed away, and a nasty little smile showed on her lips. It was unlike her. She glanced at one of the Marines, smirking, and Maddox swore she sashayed to the chair seductively. That definitely wasn't like the Valerie Noonan he knew. Stay ready outside the hatch, Maddox told the Marines. They acknowledged the order, retreating and shutting the hatch behind them. Well, 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 Valerie said in a sultry way as she ran her fingers through her long hair. This is an interesting development, you and me, alone in here. What are you going to do to me, hmm? Maddox didn't respond, although he put his hands on the small steel table as he studied her. Valerie smirked at him, and it didn't seem like her, but someone else. You're Diana Varys? Maddox guessed. What do you want with me, Captain? Valerie purred. To know your intentions, for one thing, he said. Really? Is that all? No, not all, Maddox said. Will you release Valerie when you get what you want? Valerie's lips parted as she laughed silently. You think you've escaped us, but it isn't true. We control the situation here. Maddox leaned back as he considered the way she'd said that. This wasn't Diana Varys, but the unity speaking through Diana and then Valerie as conduits. Yes, the telepathic power was greater than he'd initially realized. But if their power was that great, why hadn't the unity acted more forcefully in the beginning? Perhaps there were limitations to their power in the way they marshaled it. The limitations, his escape and direct confrontation with them, might have frightened them and goaded them into gathering their greater telepathic might to forestall him. You claim to control the situation, Maddox said. I know I'm speaking to the unity, by the way. How you're achieving this through Lieutenant Commander Noonan, I don't know, but I do know who I'm speaking to. Aren't you the clever one? In truth, your boast is false. You clearly don't control the situation. The Fusion First Fleet besieges Remus, pinning you on the planet. Bah, Valerie said with a sneer. Anytime we desire. We can summon our main fleet and wipe the fusion off the board. No, I don't believe that. The first fleet is too limiting to you here, and they're towing asteroids to rain on you. That indicates weakness on your part versus the fusion. Believe what you like, Maddox. You think that you've escaped us, but you've just made it better for us to- Maddox jumped up from his chair and came around the table. Despite everything else, it infuriated him that the maggot aliens had wrested Valerie's personality from her and used her like this. He loathed the unity. He was sick of these mind-screwing types of aliens. What's your problem? Valerie said as she leaned away from him. Maddox wrapped his knuckles on the table as he loomed over her. You've devoured a planet full of people. You're mental vampires. And you play these foul games with unsuspecting people. What gives you the right? Right. Right. You speak of right. We have the might. 
That is more important than the ethereal right of which you speak. Besides, you humans are the perfect sort for us. Your minds are so easily malleable. Well, perhaps not your mind, Captain. You're an interesting one. Valerie, Maddox said earnestly. If you can hear me inside your skull, resist them with everything you have. You're stronger than that. You're you. You've fought every step of your career. Do it again against these mind vermin. You don't paint a pretty picture regarding us, do you, Captain? Why do you hate us so much? Because you're maggots, he snarled. Valerie shook her head emphatically. I do not appreciate such a pejorative term. We are the ultimate species, the unity that can bring others into our massed collective. You destroyed Garth, the monk. No, you killed him, remember? No, Maddox said. I killed the shell he'd become. Valerie no longer wears a cerebrator. Thus, it doesn't make sense you can do this through her. My, my, my. Such emotionalism, Captain. That is not your usual fort, is it? Maddox stood straight as he regarded Valerie. He'd already learned much about the unity, had seen the little white maggots below. Maddox laughed suddenly as the correct approach came to him. What's so funny? Valerie demanded. I know what to do. It will be so easy. Valerie shook her head. You know nothing. Maddox completed the circuit around the table. Valerie stood up to confront him. Maddox grabbed her hands. Valerie surged forward and tried to knee him in the balls. He twisted, protecting himself with a blocking thigh. That's the wrong move, Captain. Valerie intertwined her fingers with his, tightening her grip. Then her hands became warm. Maddox swayed as a feeling of physical weakness swept through him. Valerie laughed and the unity through Diana Varus and now in Valerie assaulted the captain telepathically. The connection with flesh strengthened the mental contact, and the unity through the clone and the lieutenant commander struck at the captain's citadel of self in his mind. Just as he'd planned. For he'd learned something critical when facing the unity down below. By telepathically attacking him, they opened themselves to a counter-assault. This might be just what he needed to help Valerie escape their hold on her. Telepathic access into her mind. Chapter 70 There were rules or laws regarding this kind of telepathic action. They weren't the kinds of laws that had once governed civilized boxing in England, the Marquess of Queensbury rules. Instead, these rules were like the second law of thermodynamics, or the law of gravity. Perhaps the better term would be principles. There were principles governing actions such as this. Maddox couldn't have initiated this contest because he wasn't a telepath. He did have unusual abilities in this realm, however. He had often fought telepathic enemies or foes that had used similar techniques, perhaps as important. He was already used to the Unity's methods, as he'd fought off the Cerebrator and defeated the Unity's attempt in the underground chamber. This mental assault began in his mind with the image of Valerie Noonan running at him, screaming with rage. At first, it was as if they stood on a white plain. There wasn't any background, wasn't any sun, Planets, walls, nothing. You want background? Valerie screamed at him. Suddenly, as an image in his mind, old brick buildings towered around them. It was old Detroit, where Valerie had grown up and gone to school. This city was empty, devoid of anything but a cool sun hovering in winter. Oddly, there wasn't any snow on the ground, although there were icy patches here and there. Maddox! Valerie shouted with a gun in her hand. It's time you paid for your arrogance. Maddox stood in his captain's uniform regarding Valerie rushing toward him. She was much younger, what she must have looked like upon graduating from high school. She was much thinner than he remembered, and her hair much longer. Valerie raised the gun and fired at him. 
Maddox concentrated, and the bullets went from their normal speed to something only a little faster than a running man. Maddox stepped aside as the stream of bullets neared him, harmlessly passing by. Valerie skidded to a halt, peering at her gun, and then looking at him. How did you do that? The unity is using you, Maddox said. These are mental images in our mind, nothing more. Valerie brayed laughter, and the old buildings of Detroit vanished. In their place were palaces, lovely buildings and towers of the main Varus estate upon Remus in the past. Valerie no longer stood there either, but a stunning blonde in a tight-fitting blue-skin suit wearing spiked heels. Are you Diana Varus? Maddox asked. He still wore his captain's uniform. You, Diana shouted. You made the clone laws. You're keeping me from my birthright. Maddox shook his head. I've done nothing to you. The unity is using you just as it tried to use Valerie. You've become a tool for the aliens. I know I'm a tool, Diana raged. I've always been a tool. I'm a clone. I was made to serve others. Are you going to keep resisting, or must I subdue you? You're a conduit, Diana. The unity is behind this. They're using you. From what Valerie told me about you, you have a fierce will. Why not employ it against the maggots? No, shouted Diana, shaking her fists. We are not maggots. We are the glorious ones, the collective of intelligent and superior thought. Maggots that feed off filth, Maddox said. The palaces and towers in the background began to waver. Diana noticed, looking back in wonder and then glaring at Maddox. How are you able to achieve this? Your mental images don't work on me, Maddox said. I've been trained by the best, by Balron the Traveler. He helped me perceive reality even in instances such as this. I can't free Diana Varys as you hold her down there. But I can free Valerie Noonan. You must leave her. You must retreat from her mind. Valerie Noonan is ours. She belongs to the unity now and forevermore. Valerie, Maddox shouted. This is your last chance. You must fight the illusion in your mind. Let the images slide off you. I do. Am I better than you? Do I always win? You can win too. If you fight as you did in Detroit, don't let the others beat you. Diana Varis glared at Maddox. Then she looked around wildly. The palaces, lawns, and towers vanished completely. A second later, so did she. Now. Maddox stood in a deep cavern with hot lava rocks, providing dim lighting. Is this your home world? Maddox asked. He heard hissing and slithering, and masses of little white alien maggots crawled toward him. Yes, Maddox shouted. Come to me, my pretties. He ran at the mass and he concentrated. His step thudded as a cylinder appeared on his back. Straps around his shoulders and one cinched to his waist held the heavy container in place. A tube snaked from the cylinder to a rod in his hands, one with a trigger. Maddox laughed with a maniacal glee and pulled the trigger as he aimed the rod at the approaching slithering mass. Liquid fire hosed from the rod and fell upon the maggots as if from a flamethrower. A scream in Maddox's mind almost rendered him unconscious. The cavern and massed maggots disappeared. He was back in old Detroit, with a bewildered and blinking Valerie Noonan standing before him. She was no longer the teenager, but the lieutenant commander with the now flawed forehead. Valerie, Maddox said. She blinked at him with incomprehension. He stepped close, and she did not recoil. He raised a hand and rubbed his palm against her forehead. Let's get rid of that. Shall we? Make it smooth. How do I do that? Valerie asked in a small voice. It's smooth. Look. Maddox held up a mirror. And as Valerie watched, her bumps and misshapen lumps disappeared, and her forehead became smooth as it used to be not so long ago. Valerie laughed, looking up at Maddox. He nodded. Then he turned around, shouting, I can do this all day, Unity. Come on, let's play.
From behind a faint building, a mass of little maggots slithered around the corner. They coalesced into a giant white snake with glowing red eyes. This isn't the end of it, Maddox, the giant snake hissed. No, asked the captain. You have the high ground. Today, we may have miscalculated in this one tiny regard. Enjoy your marginal victory. It will not last. On the contrary, you're going down, maggots. You will rue the day you ever called us that. You will rue the day you made an enemy of me, Maddox said. With that, the building and the giant white snake disappeared. Everything vanished until it was only Maddox and Valerie with the white background. Now what happens? Valerie asked. Now, Maddox said. It's time to wake up. Chapter 71 Maddox and Valerie stood in the small holding cell with the table and two chairs. They held hands as they faced each other while standing. Oh, Valerie said, blushing, as she realized she held her captain's hands. He let go and stepped back. Your forehead, he said. Valerie stepped back more, using both hands to cover her forehead. Surprise filled her face. She felt more, fingering her forehead, and then removed her hands. What do you see? Maddox grinned. The bumps and lumps are gone. Your forehead is smooth again. Valerie laughed with glee, and she rushed the captain, hugging him. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So very much. My pleasure he said while patting her back. Valerie released him, stepping back and feeling her smooth forehead again. But how did this happen? Remember the telepathic assault? Of course, Valerie said. The mind is very powerful. I know that, Valerie said. But how could an idea cause my forehead to become smooth again? An idea or a thought in your mind makes you run, makes your heart beat faster, and the lungs pump harder. This is something similar. Your mind conceived it, and the body brought it about, just much faster than it normally does. Is that how you got rid of the cerebrator on your own? Maddox shrugged. He wasn't sure. Valerie looked up in wonder. The oily presence in my mind is gone. It's not there anymore. We drove it out. Valerie frowned. Could that be how demon possession worked in the old days? I have no idea, Maddox said. Do you believe in demons? That's not the point, but never mind. Do I have to stay in the brig? Maddox returned to his chair, sitting, producing a recorder, and putting it on the table and turning it on. Let's talk. Valerie sat down across from him. What about? Everything you can remember about Diana Varys and what she was trying to get you to do. We need to learn more about our enemy, and this is a good way to do it. So for the next hour and a half, Maddox asked questions to prompt Valerie to remember more. She related many things, and the alien maggot unity came into focus just a little more for Maddox. It would appear they were a parasitical life form using their mass mind telepathy to force others to do their bidding. They'd hidden in the nebula for endless generations, having grown weary. Despite many probing questions, Valerie couldn't remember or didn't know why they'd grown weary enough to hide. Maddox didn't either. Although as Valerie talked, he recalled something about an ancient menace the Unity feared. Could that menace be the Swarm, Builders, or Jan Soths? Despite the questions, neither had an answer to that. The Unity had fled into the nebula and hidden here for centuries. But now, at last, they stirred again, drawn back into their old ways, hesitatingly launching the satellites to draw prey into range. It would appear they hadn't known about the humans in the nebula until a few years ago. Clearly, a section of the Unity had taken control of Remus. They're using the planet as a training station, Maddox said. 
I remember them telling me that while I faced them underground. What are we going to do next? Valerie asked. Maddox sat back as he nodded. He reached over and shut off the recorder. Suppose we could hightail at home and give our report to the Admiral. We're scouting out here more than anything else. Or we could... Valerie screamed, jumping up out of her chair. Maddox whirled around as a little ad hoc hollow image came into focus. Galleon, you're not supposed to do that. What are you doing in here anyway? Is the ship under attack? It is not, Galleon said. I, uh, require you to refer to me as Driving Force or Driving Force Galleon, not simply as Galleon. Maddox raised his eyebrow noticing that Galleon hadn't apologized for frightening Valerie as he had. That was unusual for the hollow image. By the way, Galleon said, I am in command of the starship. Temporary command, Maddox said. I'm back, so I'm in charge again. I automatically control ship functions. I am also uncertain that I care to relinquish them back to you. This is my starship, after all, built by my people. Maddox scowled. Now listen here, driving force galleon. Maddox decided on a different approach, abruptly smoothing his tone. Why did you enter this cell without my authorization? I am in command, galleon said. I can go wherever I please on my starship. I see. So have you decided to sever your unique relationship with us? What do you mean? Galleon asked, frowning. You're acting differently than you usually do. Galleon's eyelids fluttered. As that ceased, shock appeared on his ad hoc features. You are correct, Captain. Do you think that is a function of my taking command? Maddox became thoughtful. Maybe there was an easy way out of this. You are hereby relieved of command duty, driving force Galleon. Under the authority of the Lord High Admiral of Star Watch, who commissioned this mission, I am resuming full command of the starship. Oh, Galleon said, sounding crestfallen. As the captain, I demand an explanation of why you have simply popped into this detention cell. Sir, I am unhappy with this change in my status. I enjoyed command. I'm sure you did. I was given command of victory thousands of years ago by my people. I am no longer certain I can act as second fiddle on my own starship. I see. Well... Starwatch has put new features into the vessel, and you have sworn an oath to faithfully serve under me. I realize all that, sir, but this was my ship in the beginning. Galleon, you are the last ad hoc. Excuse me for interrupting you, sir, but that is why I appeared. I have been listening to you two for some time. You suggested we go home to Earth, but I have learned that ad hocs are in the nebula. Indeed, Maddox said. How did you discover this? Through Diana Varis, sir, Galleon said. She recognized me as an ad hoc. That implies she, or the Unity, has seen ad hocs before. Interesting, Maddox said, who didn't care for the extra complication just now. Thus, I cannot allow you to take victory home just yet. We must find the ad hoc, sir. That is imperative. While it is true I have happily worked in Star Watch this entire time, and you are my family, it is my responsibility to help my people recover from the devastation of the swarm assault upon our homeworld approximately 6,000 years ago. Valerie glanced at Maddox. I do not think my request is unreasonable, Galleon added. Maddox pounced on that. This is a request, then? Galleon hesitated. Yes, sir, it is. You then fully agree that I am in command of Starship Victory? I do, with a caveat. Maddox didn't ask what the caveat was, but said, And you will continue to follow my orders? Yes, Galleon said slowly. Before the AI hollow image could add more, Maddox said, Well, in that case, I would be delighted to search for the Adox. First, we must clear up the matter of the unity, Remus, and the fusion. In what way, sir? Are you questioning my orders, Galleon? The hollow image paused. No, sir, I am not. Maddox nodded. Is Grutch still out there? Oh, I forgot to mention, sir. While you were away, I attacked Grutch's stealth ship with a disruptor cannon. And? 
asked Maddox. Grutch teleported away, making good his escape. Is Grutch still in the Remus system? I do not presently see him, Galleon said. But given my personality profile on him, I suspect that he is watching us from afar and recalibrating his options. Maddox nodded again. We've learned much these past few hours. I'm going to shower and eat. Then I'm heading to the bridge. Galleon, inform Lieutenant Barnes that he is in charge until I return. What about me? Valerie asked. I can do it. Not just yet, Maddox said. I could run the starship, Galleon said. Gentlemen, Maddox said, I am the captain of victory until stated otherwise. I and I alone will choose who I relinquish temporary command to. Is that clear? Yes, sir, Valerie said. Galleon? asked Maddox. I prefer the term driving force. You can prefer I call you something all you want, Maddox said, his voice hardening. But in the end, I'll decide what I call someone. Is that clear? Yes, sir, Galleon said. And is it clear to you that I run this starship? It is, Galleon said. Excellent, Maddox said. Then be so good as to relay my message to Lieutenant Barnes. I'll be on the bridge shortly, and then we'll decide how to deal with the Fusion First Fleet. Chapter 72 Less than an hour later, Captain Maddox sat in his command chair on the bridge. Meadow was at communications, Barnes at weapons, Andros at science, and with others at the other stations. Riker was recovering and doing well in medical. Keith was resting and would return to duty next watch. Maddox had been mulling options as he'd showered and eaten. Now the starship began to maneuver openly toward the Fusion First Fleet two million kilometers from Remus. There had been no more contact or attempts from the Unity on Remus against the starship. I wonder if the Unity has more sophisticated warships than the ones we have seen so far, Galleon said. Good question, Maddox said. The short answer is that I don't know, as they managed to hide that from me. Sir? asked Galleon. While the Unity was in telepathic link with me, I was able to hear various thoughts or ideas of theirs. Despite the trillions or whatever number of maggots that make up the alien mass, they're a single unified unity. That is quite interesting, Galleon said. Tell me about it, Maddox said, hoping to avoid any further questions about them right now. Sir, Meta said, I'm picking up a hail from the first fleet. On screen, Maddox said as he swiveled to face the main screen. A moment later, a small hunched man in a red uniform appeared. He had thick dark hair in disarray and a mole on his left cheek. He seemed cross, perhaps even angry. Just like the last time they spoke to a fusion commander, a black uniformed security officer stood behind the commander's chair. This man was bald, more than stout, with a gut, and had shrewd, dark eyes. He also had a prominent blaster tucked openly in his belt, as if to advertise his power. The shoulder-hunched, belligerent man in red pointed at Maddox and spoke rapidly. At first, his words seemed like nonsense. Maddox looked back at his wife. Oh, sorry, Meta said, as she tapped her panel. There, the translator is operating now, sir. Maddox faced forward again. Could you repeat what you just said? What? The man said. Yes, I demand that you immediately identify yourself, Outlander. Maddox abruptly sat as straight as he could, striking a pose as he sneered at the other. Who are you to make such demands upon me? The man scowled thunderously. I'm Grand Director Shinto of the battle wagon Karl Radek and the Fusion First Fleet. I'm in authority here, authorized by the United Principles of Social Harmony. That trumps any corporate identity you might possess. Corporate? I'm not certain I follow you, Maddox said. I'm the Grand Director of the First Fleet, authorized by the billions of people who make up the fusion of planets. That means, in essence, that I'm the personification of those billions and the scientific principles as espoused by Social Harmony. Maddox sat still for several seconds contemplating his response. You show a modicum of wisdom by having the wit to be astounded by my authorized might, Grand Director Shinto said. 
Maddox cleared his throat. What if I told you that I'm the captain of a starship of Star Watch, represented not by billions, but by several trillion people? Surely my authority, as I am the personification of trillions, trumps your meager few billions. Shinto scowled again, sitting forward. What is the name of your governing system? The Commonwealth of Planets, Maddox said. Commonwealth, said Shinto. That implies an equality of representation among the planets. True. That implies more than one governing system or theory for these planets. I'm not sure I follow your reasoning, Maddox said. Is every planet in this numerous commonwealth of yours run along the guiding principles of social harmony? No. Aha! Shinto cried, raising the index finger of his right hand. It wasn't straight, but slightly curved. I possess a greater purity of purpose, then, and thus hold a greater percentage of popular votes than you, both in real terms and obviously in percentages. Oh, please continue. Maddox tried to keep the sarcasm from his voice. Social harmony is the purest form of human government, run along the most scientific and moral grounds mankind has ever devised. By what rationality do you make this outrageous claim? Not outrageous in the least, Shinto said smoothly. Name me a better form of government than social harmony. I don't know what social harmony is, Maddox said. Depending on its theories, I might know a hundred better systems of rule. Grand Director Shinto looked over his shoulder at the fat security officer behind him. Can you believe this? He may hold chaotic theories, sir the fat man said in a high-pitched voice. Ah, quite right. That is quite right, Shinto said as he faced forward again. Tell me, what is the Commonwealth's governing ideal? Maddox couldn't hold it any longer, but laughed, shaking his head. Does that signify your contempt toward us? No, Maddox said, recovering. I laughed out of admiration for your debating skills, I find myself overwhelmed by you. Not me, Shinto said, but by the thrust of my theories, the burning purity and righteousness of social harmony's principles. Yes, Maddox said, stroking his upper lip with one finger to hide a smile. I stand corrected. Interesting, Shinto said. It's possible I misconstrued your intent. If you can show admiration, for social harmony's theories. You must be a right thinker. If corporate or other heinous ideologies cluttered your mind, you would be unable to see the correctness of social harmony among all people. Yes, and who wouldn't want that? You would be surprised, sir. For instance, many hold to the doctrine of self-rule. I'm not sure I understand. I'm sure I stated it poorly. Shinto said in a condescending tone. They believe that an individual should develop his own ideas without consideration of the social whole. They think that an individual should have greater call upon rights than the unified mass of society. Harmony is everything, sir. You mean social harmony? Exactly, Shinto said. I find it remarkable you've never studied our principles. For instance, since I represent greater purity of purpose than you, as I represent true reality times billions of right-thinking people, my thoughts and needs hold greater value than your own. For as good as you seem to be, your form of government is naturally less pure than ours. Thus, your authority lacks my purity. It is sullied by greed, hatred, and other vile thoughts times whatever trillions live in the Commonwealth. I had no idea. Maddox was finding it difficult to keep a straight face. Shinto nodded. Now that we've resolved the hierarchy of purpose between us, it's time to talk about particulars. As the Grand Director of the First Fleet, I've noticed that your craft has the ability to jump from one locale to another. Yes, despite our obvious ideological impurities, We've been fortunate to develop such technology. We lack such a vessel, and we certainly need such a capacity. 
You will therefore bring your starship to us and allow my security people to board her en masse. To what purpose? asked Maddox. Why, to acquire your vessel for the fusion, of course, Shinto said. I see. It's possible my government would object to my simply handing over our starship to someone else, no matter their purity. Shinto shook his head. I thought you might retreat to such antiquated theories and arguments. Surely the greatest and purest form of human government should have the first right to all goods and materials, such as the ship you occupy. Maddox stood up, stretched, and regarded the small man closely. Grand Director Shinto, the conversation has been enlightening. Unfortunately for you, I hold to an ancient theory, namely that possession is nine-tenths of the law. Meaning what? I hold the starship and refuse to give it up to anyone for any reason. You won't aid us, then. On the contrary, I would dearly like to work in cooperation with you. You would? asked Shinto, sounding surprised. Yes, Maddox said, but on the strict grounds that we each keep what is ours. You refuse to accept the greater purity of social harmony? Let me put it like this. I admire your purity of government and that it would put such a good person as yourself in command of the First Fleet. When I have the chance, I hope to study social harmony and return to the Commonwealth and propose that we operate along similar lines. Grand Director Shinto stared at Maddox. You admire our form of government? Given that it produces a man such as you, most certainly, Maddox said. Shinto nodded and smiled. I'd begged you for an oafish outlander, possibly as a pirate or freebooter. Now, however, I learn that you have rarefied sensibilities. Will you give us any spare engine parts, or whatever causes your vessel to make those incredible jumps? I will have to hold a vote on it among my crew. Shinto looked back at the security officer before regarding Maddox again. You're clever, Captain and talk a fine game. For the moment, that will have to suffice. As the Grand Director, I'm forbidden to aid certain types of governmental agents. For instance, those on Remus ruled along aristocratic lines. We'd intended to oust their repressive government and install teachers to guide them along social harmony principles. Then, after a time, they could have joined the fusion. Those on Remus no longer run their own lives, Maddox said. Perhaps you should speak more clearly. Aliens have conquered those on Remus and now rule them with an ironclad system of telepathic control enforced by cerebrators embedded in their foreheads. Aliens, you say? This is interesting. Some of my officers have propounded the possibility of such a thing. We have seen scant evidence of this, however. Although it's true, whoever runs Remus has sown ecological disaster to the planet. I can give you the evidence of aliens. Excellent, Shinto said. When can I expect you on the Karl Radek? I'm afraid I'm going to decline the invitation. Instead, I'll allow several of your officers to come to us. Grand Director Shinto's crabbed shoulders hunched a little more. I'm unsure I can allow any of my officers aboard your vessel. You might sully their political purity. What if I promise not to do that? Shinto shook his head. Does that mean we're at an impasse? Maddox asked. The fat security officer cleared his throat. Shinto looked back at the man, scowled, and then leaned his head back. The security officer leaned low and whispered to the grand director. In the end, Shinto sat forward. Would you allow a team of commissars to land on your ship and view the evidence? Yes, Maddox said. They will be armed. How many do you envision? Maddox asked. Three hundred, Shinto said. Grand Director, I'll allow ten commissars aboard Victory. Surely we can compromise, let us say, two hundred. Ten. One hundred. No deal, I have a different proposal. I'll send you the evidence via comm. Such evidence could be faked. Many things could be faked, sir. Shinto eyed him. Send us your evidence, then. I'll speak with my people, and afterward we can talk. Until such time, 
You might want to find refuge among us. Perhaps not, though, Maddox said. You are showing the heinous concept known as distrust. I do not applaud you for it. Nevertheless, given our disparity in numbers and tonnage, I will keep a safe distance from your fleet until we come to a political accord. Shinto pursed his lips, nodding shortly. Send us the data as soon as possible. Then we can work out an accord, as you say. Chapter 73 Maddox held a strategy session an hour after his call to the Grand Director of the Fusion First Fleet. The same people sat around the large conference table as earlier except for Sergeant Riker. Maddox stood at the head of the table outlining the problem. The Unity holds Remus and is busy converting people into cerebrator-controlled puppets. The Unity has also detonated subterranean hellburners, creating ecological disaster to the planet by spewing millions of tons of volcanic ash into the atmosphere. I'm not sure why the Unity has done this. If they eventually control the entire planet, wouldn't they want the human puppets as workers? An ice age or something worse would be detrimental to their puppets and industries. The second problem is the Fusion First Fleet and the Fusion Flotilla heading inward. Soon enough, Director and Nora will establish contact with the First Fleet. Shinto will learn the Flotilla unsuccessfully attacked us before. Will Nora's report about us destroy all chances of our working together with the Fusion against the Unity? Lastly, the Morag mercenary Grutch is likely still out there somewhere. Whatever we hope to do... We have to take him into account. As Maddox ceased speaking, he glanced around the table. Galleon, he said. The final point is the Adox, Galleon said, lowering a ropey arm. We know they exist somewhere in the nebula. We don't know that for certain, Maddox said, but the real possibility exists. Galleon considered that. Yes, sir, that is more accurate. Ideas? asked Maddox, sitting down after saying it. Keith said, We could destroy the flotilla before it reached the first fleet. That would keep the dangerous knowledge from reaching this grand director. Possibly, Maddox said. But I'm not sure we want to do that. We might need the flotilla's extra battle wagons, and we presume ground troops. Ground troops, Ludendorff said. Do you think the fusion will land soldiers onto Remus? To do what exactly? Why did the Unity launch its subterranean hellburners? Maddox asked. Or stated more precisely, what does the Unity hope to achieve with all the volcanic ash in the atmosphere? What do we know about conditions on the planet? Valerie asked. Can you be more specific? Maddox asked. I think I have it, Ludendorff said, interrupting before Valerie could answer. The Unity ignited the hellburners to create ecological disaster on Remus in order to create chaos, to break down civil order. How better to take control over the populace, eh? The unity kidnaps people and inserts cerebrators into them. Doing that takes time and effort. If the Remus military can't fight back because everything is breaking down because of the disastrous weather patterns, it makes the unity's task easier. And after the unity conquers the planet, asked Maddox, Ludendorff shrugged. The puppet humans use unity technology to terraform the planet to what it used to be, and then work for the rest of their lives as worker bees for the aliens. That makes sense, Valerie said. Maddox was nodding. If that's the case, it's possible not everyone on Remus has a cerebrator yet. In fact, I recall seeing people in line to receive cerebrators when we were down there. How far are the aliens in the process of planetary conversion? Keith asked. That's an excellent question, but I don't know the answer. It can't be that far yet, Valerie said. Consider, the fusion fleet set out for Remus, thinking to conquer it for social harmony. Once they arrived, however, they found what we see. I suspect they faced whatever remained of the Remus airspace service and any other vessels the Unity possessed. Given the debris in orbital space, there must have been a sharp space battle but not enough to drive off the first fleet. They did retreat to two million kilometers away, however. Since then, the fusion people have settled in for a planetary siege, towing asteroids, presumably, to drop on Remus. 
if these things are true, Ludendorff said. What's our purpose in all this? What is our goal? Precisely, Maddox said. What is our goal? Or to put it in another way, what should be our goal? To kill off the unity, Valerie said with heat. Maddox pointed at her. Yes, that's exactly right. The worst threat to us, the Commonwealth, is the unity. Thus, they are the enemy. Does that make the fusion our friend? Ludendorff asked. Not necessarily, Maddox said. But if we have to choose a loser and thus mandate a winner, we want the unity to lose. How do we kill the aliens, sir? Valerie asked. They hide in subterranean regions, forcing their puppets to fight for them. Maddox stood up, turning away from the others. He scowled, taking several steps, and then turning around. The first fleet arrived here to conquer Remus. Ah, Ludendorff said. Then it's obvious, isn't it? We get the fusion to land and hunt down the aliens for us. The unity will throw the cerebrator puppets at the fusion soldiers, Valerie said. It would mean a bloodbath. Maddox pulled his chair out, sitting down. What happens to the uncontrolled humans on Remus, those who are presently free? If we do nothing, they die, Valerie said. Or the aliens or their puppets grab them and force them into cerebrator-fitting chambers where they become alien-controlled puppets. That's it, Maddox said. In other words, the free people on Remus are facing utter doom, death or mental slavery to the unity. Would they be better off as fusion subjects? I'd say so, Ludendorff said. They'd still be alive and able to rebel in the future. That's my thinking as well. What does that mean in practical terms? Valerie asked. It means, Maddox said slowly, all-out war against the Unity and their cerebrator puppets. A planetary bloodbath, Ludendorff said. Planetary conquest, certainly, Maddox said. Perhaps our aid means it doesn't have to be a bloodbath. I have a question, Galleon said. Does the First Fleet possess enough fusion soldiers to defeat all of Remus? Maddox stared at Galleon. Maybe that isn't the right question. Does the fusion have enough soldiers to defeat the unity if the free people of Remus rally to their fellow humans and aid in hunting down the maggot aliens? Ludendorff smiled. That's brilliantly reasoned and strategically sound. If... We can get the fusion to agree to all this, Maddox said. Yes, Ludendorff said. I imagine that could be the sticking point. Chapter 74 Professor Ludendorff's qualm proved prophetic. The captain sent data to the Carl Radek about the unity and about what had happened on Remus. Afterward, via comm, Maddox explained to Grand Director Shinto the complication they'd had with Director Anora on the Joseph Stalin before arriving in the Remus system. That started an argument that nearly broke off the talks. Maddox explained as best he could, and then he told Shinto that he would wait to communicate further. During that time, he wanted Shinto and Anora to talk. Starship Victory pulled away from the first fleet, using the time to approach Remus and scan the surface in earnest. Galleon went on many forays to the planet, pinpointing Unity strongholds. The crew learned that many places on Remus held free, but mostly bewildered people. Maddox opened communications with the remaining free military on Remus. To Valerie's surprise, she found that Consul T.F. Arius ran the truncated Remus ground force. Square-faced Arius looked much older and worn down than when Valerie had seen him last in her Diana Varus memories, although his eyes blazed with grim determination. What are you saying? Arius asked with a scowl as he stared out of the main screen on the bridge. Maddox told Arius just about everything, including the Commonwealth, the Fusion First Fleet, the Unity, the Alien Satellites, and the memories he and Valerie had experienced. When Arius proved doubting about the latter part, Valerie asked if she could speak to him. Maddox nodded. 
the lieutenant commander stepped before the main screen on the Bridge of Victory and related many experiences Diana Varis had had with Arius throughout the years. Astounding, the consul finally said. These white alien maggots, the unity, has captured Diana? More than that, Maddox said. They control Diana by putting a cerebrator in her forehead. She's their mental puppet, forced to do their alien bidding. How horrible, Arius whispered. It is, Maddox agreed. That explains so much, though, Arius said. I have a possible solution to your plight, Maddox said. Arius looked up. Maddox told him the greater plan, which included the use of the Fusion First Fleet. The iron-faced console became downcast as he listened. Remus would come under the heel of the Fusion, then. That's something we've been trying to avoid. For years, you'd have to, in order to keep your people free of alien control, Maddox said. Arius stared at Maddox. You realize, they'll probably put me on trial once this is all over. The fusion will execute me as a war criminal. Maybe, Maddox said. Maybe before that happens, you can become a social harmony true believer and avoid such a fate. Arius studied Maddox, nodding slowly. You're a cunning man, Captain. I think I understand. I doubt they'll believe me, though. Make them believe, Maddox said. Show them you're worth having around. Yes, I understand. And I see the stakes. I doubt Remus can defeat the aliens on its own. The Unity has too many resources, too many highly advanced weapons, but with fusion help, I like it, Captain, and I hate it. But I'd rather save my people than my hide. Strive to do both. Arius snorted, shaking his head. Now that I know what's happening, yes, you're right. Please get in contact with Grand Director Shinto and tell him I'm ready to swear allegiance to his chairman on New Trotsky. I'll do that, sir, Maddox said. You'd better hurry, though. We've detected a buildup of underground forces near our headquarters. I may not be around by the time we hammer out the issues. I'll start today, Maddox said. Until then, sir. Thank you, Captain. I appreciate this. I really do. Via screen, Maddox held another meeting with Grand Director Shinto, with the stout security officer watching from behind the commander's chair. You spoke to this Consul Arias, did you? Shinto said with a sneer. Consularius is desperate, sir. He said he's willing to swear allegiance to the chairman on New Trotsky. Grand Director Shinto swore mightily as he slammed a fist on his chair's armrest. That shows you the lack of political acuity of this Arius. We don't serve the chairman. We serve social harmony. The chairman, sir, the security officer said sharply, interrupting the tirade. Grand Director Shinto turned pale and his lips trembled. He turned. I, I meant to say, the security officer looked at the grand director staring up at him. He then looked at Maddox watching on the screen. The stout man bent low, whispering to the grand director. Recovering some of his poise and color, Shinto faced Maddox. I spoke hastily a moment ago. The chairman is our revered guardian, the very essence of social harmony. If Consul Arius is willing to swear loyalty to him, Shinto cleared his throat, and he cleared it again. That, that means Arius is swearing allegiance to social harmony. They fooled us once, you understand, years ago. But I believe Arius has seen the error of his ways. He wishes to stand with the fusion against these heinous aliens. If he's serious, we could begin to work on a strategy to defeat the enemy on Remus. Consul Arius will be happy to hear that, sir. Maddox said. I, uh, would also like to add our efforts to yours. Meaning what? Asked Shinto, becoming alert. We've been scanning the surface. For one thing, we can give you the subterranean coordinates to many of the Unity Fortress locations. One of them, at least, is used to convert humans into their puppet slaves. Subterranean fortresses? Asked Shinto. You could drop an asteroid on the biggest. Maddox suggested. 
The asteroids are not yet here. If the people of Remus gladly join the fusion and agree to run their lives under the principles of social harmony, perhaps with the soldiers in the first fleet, you could achieve complete victory over the aliens. Shinto studied Maddox. Such a victory would likely mean you'd gain in the chairman's esteem. Shinto cleared his throat once more. I serve the chairman at his pleasure. My gains mean nothing to me, just the gains for social harmony. Ah, Maddox said. Even now I'm learning your ways and the ways of social harmony. It is the highest form of government after all. That is clear by your actions. Shinto nodded. I'm glad to hear you say that, Captain. If you could bring your starship into the first fleet, perhaps I can do that when I'm finished with my other duties, Maddox said, smoothly interrupting. I am a loyal subject of the Commonwealth, however. How could you trust me if I told you that I'd willingly betray the trust of my superiors? Very well, Shinto said. Please relate what I've said to the consul. I will speak to my ground forces people and see what they have to say. Until then, Captain. Maddox bowed his head low, while Meta cut the connection. Chapter 75 Grutch the Morag watched all this take place from his stealth ship. He also monitored the starship from time to time. Each of those times, he discovered that Galleon scanned for his stealth ship. In Grutch's estimation, it meant the hollow image was ready for him. Captain Maddox was well protected, therefore, and the captain hadn't left the starship since returning from the planet. Oh, this was a very unproductive turn of events. It was possible that Maddox was beyond him for now. Thus, Grutch shifted to his secondary option. He studied the aliens, this unity. He'd overheard enough from scanning fusion communications, especially between the slowly moving flotilla, as it continued to head inward toward Remus and the flagship Carl Radek. The Unity was a telepathic collective of tiny, white, maggot-sized aliens. Their main method of operation was taking over weaker-willed, if bigger, humans to work for them. Grutch observed for several weeks, human time. He watched as fusion battle wagons detached from the first fleet, moving into orbital space and launching landers and atmospheric fighters. At times, heavy lasers drilled down through the atmosphere. At other times, missiles launched and struck Unity strong points on the surface. Once finished with their task, the battle wagons redeployed with the first fleet two million kilometers from the planet. Grutch repositioned his stealth ship and launched stealth probe. He learned that the Remus Ground Service battled against Unity human ground forces. There were hidden launches from the depths striking Remus strongpoints and tank companies. Drones flitted through the air. Missiles struck at them. Counter-missiles struck at them in turn. It was a ground war. One side had orbital aid. The other had subterranean help. Fusion soldiers deployed with Remus Ground Service people. People, hundreds of thousands of people, most of them civilians, died or were captured by Unity soldiers. No doubt the captured individuals were converted into new Unity soldiers. The asteroids reached orbital space and the fusion dropped two. One hit its designated target. Massed Unity missiles hit the other asteroid together with heavy graviton beams. That asteroid broke up and rained in pieces, doing no real damage to the Unity holdout. It turned out that was where Maddox, Riker, and Keith had gone down. As yet, no Unity spacecraft had appeared. The graviton beam was a rude surprise. They struck the next time fusion battle wagons reached orbital space. Unity missiles also rose, sleek ordnance, quite unlike the crude Remus missiles that had launched weeks earlier. The fusion battle wagons used lasers and missiles to fight back, they dropped bombs, used shield spray, and took heavy damage, as three battle wagons broke up in orbital space, destroyed. Some of the crews survived in escape pods. Most perished, though, 
and the first fleet was down three powerful battle wagons. Director Honora's flotilla addition helped restore the first fleet to its former strength of 12 battle wagons. But the surface orbital battle brought consternation and discord to Grand Director Shinto's morale and resolve. You can't quit now, Maddox said via screen. You've sent too many fusion soldiers to the surface. Unbeknownst to Maddox, Grutch intercepted the communications, listening in. The chairman did not send me to Remus to lose his first fleet, Shinto said sullenly. Drop the last asteroid on the area you failed to demolish, Maddox suggested. And lose the asteroid's threat because it's gone? Shinto asked petulantly. This is the decisive moment. You must risk everything to achieve total victory. If you think I'm bringing the entire fleet into orbital space, no, Maddox said, interrupting. I'll protect the asteroid on its way down. Shinto sat up as he calculated. No, we don't dare risk your precious starship, Maddox laughed, once more interrupting the Grand Director. What's the meaning of such laughter, sir? I didn't realize you lacked the necessary tenacity to see this through. Maddox raised a hand, forestalling a rebuttal. If you're not trying to utterly destroy the aliens, we've no more reason for staying. We've scanned the subterranean areas in detail. This is the strategic locale. This is where the unity is hiding. Destroy them, the head, as it were, the brain, and the rest should be easy in comparison. You believe the asteroid strike there is that important? I do indeed. The Grand Director hunched in thought, soon nodding. Very well. We shall order it and watch your progress. Those of social harmony wish you well, sir. Thank you, Maddox said. We'll do our best. Grutch continued to watch this via his sensors, and he monitored the towed asteroid closely, the biggest the fusion had brought from the asteroid belt. The tugs brought it near the planet as victory maneuvered into position. Then, all hell broke loose as the Unity used its graviton beams and missiles. Victory surged to the forefront, using its shields to block the rays from striking the tugs or the asteroid. At the same time, the disruptor beam from the starship struck surface areas, taking out underground graviton silo stations one after another. Victory launched antimatter missiles, which detonated partway into the atmosphere, destroying masses of Unity rockets on their way up into orbital space to demolish the asteroid. The technology of Maddox's starship, compared to the Fusion and Remus hardware, was several factors better. It also proved far superior to the Unity battle technology. That made a huge difference to the asteroid drop. The tugs rushed into low orbital space as best they could and released the asteroid so it streaked down on target. Victory maintained its orbital position, using its disruptor cannon to deadly effect every time a Unity missile launched against the falling rock. The last graviton silos opened up, targeting the asteroid, burning its way down to the surface. Pieces of asteroid flew off or burned up, but a solid core of it, over two kilometers wide, slammed into the targeted location with devastating effect. Quakes radiated outward. Billions of tons of dust and debris billowed into the atmosphere. Shock waves struck downward, so mayhem ensued, surely destroying everything down there all the way to the mantle. After watching the asteroids strike, Grutch teleported farther away from Remus. He could stay and record more, but now he realized that victory would remain intact, and Maddox would not risk his person for an easy kidnapping. Besides, that annoying galleon was always searching for his stealth ship. I must demand more tellurium bars for this. My sponsors have not been honest with me. Not that he, Grutch, had ever been honest with them, but that wasn't the point. He was a Morag an inherently superior being. For beings of their lowly type to be so clever, trying to trick him. Grutch slapped two tentacles together in slow motion. A human might have shaken his head. This was most unfortunate. The entire trip, well, it hadn't been a waste. But for the moment, he didn't see profit in any of it. How he could use the knowledge of the unity he didn't see that yet either. 
It was time to retreat, reassess, and raise the stakes. Captain Maddox, you are a pain in the orifice, but I will defeat you yet and gain much wealth from you. First, it's time I talked shop with my sponsors and learn everything they know about you. Grutch thus began the preparations for a long journey. This was round one with Captain Maddox. If he could raise the stakes, perhaps purchase better tech for dealing with Galleon, he would shortly enter round two against the elusive Maddox and his annoying crew of busybodies. Chapter 76 The tenor of the ground war began to change soon after the final asteroid strike. Unfortunately, the impact of the asteroid had devastating effects on the weather. It wouldn't be long before the colder weather brought harsher conditions to most areas of the planet. What percentage of the population has perished so far? Ludendorff asked Maddox. Lower than what it's going to be next year, even if the humans win the fight. Food production might be next to non-existent in this kind of icy weather. I agree, Ludendorff said. I wonder if the fusion will begin humanitarian efforts to keep the Remus survivors alive. I'll have to ask the Grand Director that. He won't give you a straight answer, Ludendorff said. Do you think the Commonwealth will lend a hand? I can suggest it when we get home, but the nebula is far from the Commonwealth. We're deep in the beyond. I realize all that. With the Nexus, we could easily reach here. I don't know about easily, Maddox said. But we could certainly reach here, or reach outside the nebula and then work inward. Ludendorff nodded. There are many odd properties to the nebula. We could spend a long time here studying them. Or the patrol could send out teams, Maddox said. What do we do now? What we've been doing, Maddox said. We monitor the progress of the war while we stay out of harm's way via the First Fleet. Several weeks passed as the Remus Ground Service, backed by fusion battalions and orbital support, went on to the offensive. The Grand Director now released three battle wagons to permanent station in low orbital space of Remus. The heavy lasers striking from the sky made a difference in many surface battles. A growing air force did as well. One Remus Army group reached the location of the main asteroid strike and dug into the rubble. They mined, found collapsed corridors, and many human dead with cerebrators embedded in their foreheads. Once, deep in the earth, a group of puppet humans counterattacked. How could anyone have survived down there? Ludendorff asked Maddox. We don't know they did. Perhaps while our side was digging downward, their side was digging from below or to the side into the place. For what possible reason? Maddox shrugged. In the end, the Remus deep tunnel teams found nothing worth the fighting and dying. They did not find any alien battle tech, nor did they find secret corridors leading elsewhere on the planet. What was the point of the last asteroid strike again? The Grand Director demanded of Maddox via screen. To win. The fusion forces are advancing, Maddox said. There are fewer rumors of people disappearing. Perhaps, Shinto said. But the planet is worthless now. Nonsense, Maddox said. A little terraforming effort would go a long way to restoring Remus to what it was. Such efforts would be costly. How many Earth-type planets does the fusion own? That is a quaint way to say it, the Grand Director said. We all hold them in common. We do not own them, as you say. How many Earth-type planets are in the fusion? That is classified information, the Grand Director said. I'm guessing no more than five, Maddox said. Remus is in bad shape these days, but its value is priceless to the fusion. The terraforming will quickly pay off. Perhaps, the Grand Director said. Two days later, three more fusion battle wagons moved in from the first fleet and took up station in Remus orbital space. More fusion soldiers went down to the planet together with emergency food supplies. The fusion has already started the re-education, 
Arius complained to Maddox several days later via screen. The consul sat at a desk in what looked like an underground bunker. The fusion people move into a pacified area and take the Remus ground service officers, replacing them with fusion people. The officers are supposedly receiving their retraining aboard the battle wagons. It was the price of victory, Maddox said from his command chair on the bridge. Victory, Arius snorted. We destroyed a planet to save it. Is that what you're saying? Your planet is far from being destroyed. The weather is worse, and will be worse for years, perhaps even for decades. But millions of Remus people are still alive. Yes, Arius said. Thank you for reminding me. I imagine my turn for re-education is coming soon. Remember what I said. Make yourself invaluable to them. I won't betray my people. Maddox shook his head. I'm sorry we couldn't have met under better circumstances. Captain, please. I apologize. I appreciate all that you've done for Remus. I'm complaining to you, and I should be on my knees thanking you. You saved our planet from alien enslavement. Perhaps social harmony will enslave us. No political system lasts forever, Maddox said, interrupting. If the people live, they have a chance to change their minds about things later. Arius nodded. You're an optimist. I'm a realist. I could almost beg you to take me with you, Arius said. I would love to see the Commonwealth, to know what happened to the rest of humanity. Well, no, Arius said. I'm not asking that. I'll help my people to the end even if it means my death. I'll take your advice to heart. You seem to believe I'm leaving soon, Maddox said. Arius shrugged. The war is winding down. I can feel it. If there are any aliens left, I suspect they're going to make a break for it soon. Maddox smiled grimly. I've been waiting for that. It's one of the reasons we haven't left yet. Good. Kill them. Kill them all. An excellent suggestion, Maddox said. It's one I plan to implement. Ah, Arya said, looking elsewhere. I have to go. If I don't see you again, Captain, thank you for all you've done. It has been greatly appreciated. Maddox nodded, and the connection was abruptly severed on their end. Chapter 77 Remus Proper, the political entity ruled by the seven aristocrat families, lay unarmed before the twelve fusion battle wagons that had moved into orbital space. Many key strategic locations on the planet were held by fusion troops and allied Remus personnel. The strength of the old Remus ground service had been considerably weakened. For the last few days, there hadn't been any assaults by alien-controlled humans. Most of the people on Remus lived in misery, as the weather had turned harsher and food stocks had dwindled. Mass starvation threatened. The Grand Director had sent a scout vessel toward the edge of the Remus system. Once it reached the nebula, the scout would race to New Trotsky with its nebula drive hopefully convincing the chairman to send cargo vessels with sorely needed aid relief to Remus. Victory stayed farther from the planet, so the Grand Director wasn't tempted to order any rash attempts to try to capture the starship. Soon, Andros said during the third watch. Maddox looked up from where he read a novel to pass the time. I'm detecting something odd from the planet, Andros said. Troop movement? asked Maddox. Look at this, sir. Andros said, tapping his panel. On the main screen, Maddox observed five pinpoint explosions on the planet's surface. Each of those must have been a massive nuclear detonation. Sir, Meta said, requests have begun for orbital strikes. That was the start of it. A massed assault by unity-controlled humans. They boiled out of the Earth from different locations, many of them in ground-effect vehicles. 
Andros soon counted 50,000 alien-controlled humans, at least. The fusion battle wagons in low orbital space began to congregate over the battle zone. They beamed heavy lasers at the strongest concentrations of enemy GEVs and Unity artillery tubes. How long have the aliens been gathering this force? Keith asked at the helm. And what are they hoping to achieve with the attack? Andros said. I know the answer, Galleon said. Maddox swiveled his captain's chair to the hollow image. I have detected a breakout group slipping off the surface, Galleon said. I have learned of this through one of our probes on the other side of Remus. Show me, Maddox said. The main screen switched, showing five sleek space vessels leaving the surface and heading for orbital space. The Unity Space Fleet, Maddox said. That is my own estimate as well, Galleon said. Size and composition of the ships, Maddox said. They are each approximately the size of a Star Watch destroyer, Galleon said. They are heavy-hulled with an unknown alloy protecting them. I do not yet detect any firing emitters. The mode of motivation, ion engine, sir, of a novel design. Mr. Maker, Maddox said. Take us to the other side of Remus, but maintain our present distance from low orbital space. Aye, aye, sir. Are we going to engage the alien, sir? Galleon asked. We're going to see what we can see, Maddox said, contemplative. You're not seriously going to let the aliens live, Valerie asked from communications. Maddox looked at her. Uh, belay the question, Valerie said. Maddox nodded. Under Keith's guidance, Victory maneuvered away from the ground battle side of Remus, starting for the star side of the planet. Grand Director Shinto is hailing us, Valerie said. Tell him I'll speak to him later, Maddox said. A little later, Valerie said, Sir, the Grand Director is insistent. I don't care, Maddox said. Yes, sir, Valerie said. Shall I tell him that? Don't tell him anything. Let our actions be a mystery to him. Very well, sir, Valerie said. The five sleek Unity spacecraft left low orbital space and rapidly gained velocity as they left Remus behind. Victory also began to build up velocity, following them. They were sleek silver ships, as previously noted, like space needles, and moved in a strict formation, with four of the needle ships surrounding a central one. Do they have shields? asked Maddox. Negative, sir, Andros said. That alloy appears to be laser-resistant, though. We don't use lasers. Maddox said dryly. I was just noting, sir, Andro said. I could take a closer look, Galleon said. Good idea, Maddox said. Galleon disappeared and stayed gone for several minutes. During that time, the five needle ships and Victory gained velocity, although the Unity ships gained it faster, slowly pulling away from the starship. Speedy little suckers, aren't they? Maddox said to no one in particular. Galleon reappeared. Sir, the ships are full of little white aliens, the size of your pinky finger. Maggots, Maddox said. A pejorative term, Galleon said. Damn right, they're evil parasites. Is anyone else aboard? Sir, Valerie said. The alien ships are hailing us. Yes, Galleon said. Aboard each Unity ship is one human with a cerebrator. Each human looks highly uncomfortable in the cramped vessel. The ships are made for the alien's tiny size. Put the humans on the main screen, Maddox told Valerie. A disheveled Diana Varus appeared with a bent neck and her head pressing up against a ceiling. The cerebrator was quite prominent on her forehead. Who do I address? Maddox asked. The unity, of course, Diana said in a hoarse voice as she stared out of the main screen with haunted eyes. If the Unity spoke through her, and they surely did. It appeared that some part of her human personality realized it and knew dull horror. What had caused the difference? With their losses and possible consternation, had the aliens controlling her lost some of their grip over her mind? Maddox didn't have time for sentimentality. He hardened himself, pretending indifference. Making a run for it, are you? You are a hateful personage, Captain Maddox. The unity despises you. Thank you, Maddox said. I appreciate that. It was not a compliment.
Oh, Maddox said as if surprised. Well, I took it that way. You won't always, I assure you. I wonder if that's true, Maddox said. Are you trying to tell me perhaps that you've communicated with the home unity? We are all one, Diana said with some heat. Maddox fingered his chin, thinking about that. I doubt you can speak across light years of distance, though. Otherwise, why send so many of you here? The unity did not reply to that. And this vain attempt to escape, Maddox said, becoming more animated. It tells me that it's important for you to leave Remus. I don't think that would be the case if you could contact the home unity using your telepathy. I hate you, Diana said. Maddox smiled nastily, no longer seeing the woman but the alien maggots using her. You will not take our ships, Diana said. You will not learn our secrets. I already know them. Ask them about the Adox, sir, Galleon said from the side. I heard that, Diana said. Tell the stupid hollow image it doesn't matter. He was here asking me already. I know about Adox. I even know where they live, but I will never tell you. That's a shame, Maddox said. I was going to let you bargain your way from Remus with the knowledge of Adox. That is a lie, Diana said. You are a liar. You'll never know if you don't try. Diana shook her head, even though it was obviously difficult for her to do so in the cramped quarters. Now Maddox noticed hundreds of maggots crawling around and over her pulled-up knees. If Diana wasn't controlled, Maddox believed she would be screaming in horror until she snapped and went mad. Sir, Galleon pleaded, make them talk. Diana laughed. It is good to see the hollow image suffer. You will never find the ad hocs. This I know. You're never going to make it home, Maddox countered. This I know. We shall see, Diana said. No, you won't, but I will. Diana glared at him with boiling hatred, her eyes seeming to harden and darken. We would have conquered Remus with ease if you hadn't shown up. Maddox nodded. You want to hear something ironic? The only reason we came was because of your satellites and memories inserted via cerebrators. Isn't that funny? You invited your own doom, and now it is upon you. Diana Varis brought a hand up, flipping off the captain. Maddox nodded once more. I'm glad the unity can know hatred. That makes me believe you can know fear. You're about to die. And your knowledge about what you learned here will die with you. The unity will survive, Diana said, her voice hoarser than ever. The unity will prevail. I know the unity now, Maddox said. That means Star Watch is going to hunt for the home unity and burn it out of existence and everywhere else it may be. Sir, Andro said. The needle ships are rotating to face us. Ready to rock and roll, are you? Maddox asked Diana. For an answer, the controlled Diana Varus brought her other hand around and flipped him off with it as well. Chapter 78 The planet Remus was already well behind the starship as it headed toward the five destroyer-sized needle ships. I've not yet seen anything like these ships, Andros said from the science station. The alloy could well be resistant to disruptive fire. I rather doubt that, Maddox said. Their graviton cannons are charging, Galleon said beside him. Sir, is there any way we can capture some of the aliens? Their data concerning the Adox could be invaluable. We'll have to wait and see, Maddox said, as he studied the five needle ships on the main screen. I do not believe you are serious about that, sir. Maddox turned to Galleon. On the contrary, that's a good idea. I would very much like to capture at least one of the needle ships. Galleon's eyelids fluttered for just a moment, perhaps as he analyzed the captain's statement. Thank you, sir. I believe you mean that. I wouldn't have said it otherwise. I do not believe that, sir, Galleon said. You say many things to others that are outright lies. 
Deception is the word I prefer. I will use the word I prefer when I make a statement, sir, Galleon said. Maddox raised his eyebrows, but decided not to pursue the topic. Let the AI have its occasional little verbal victories. Mr. Barnes, Maddox said. Please charge the disruptor cannon. Yes, sir, Barnes said. I'm reinforcing the shield, sir, Andros said. Maddox nodded. He'd expected no less. As a million kilometers separated the combined needle ships from victory, the enemy graviton beams shot outward. The beams struck a point on Victory's shield, and that spot immediately turned red and started to brown. Fire, Maddox said. The yellow disruptor beam shot outward from Victory as the distance rapidly closed between the vessels. The beam did nothing against the alien hull alloy for 30 seconds, astounding the captain. As a mark finally appeared on the hull, the needle ship traded positions with another of its kind, so it took the disruptor beam on its unaffected hull. Now the brown part of the shield had turned purple. Sir, Andros said, there is danger to us from these beams. Galleon, Maddox said, deploy the neutron beam as well. Let's hit them as hard as we can. How will we save one of the needle ships then? Galleon asked. We'll worry about it when there are only one or two of them left. Now fire the neutron cannon. Yes, sir, Galleon said. That is wise thinking. And see if you can figure out what kind of alloy that is, Maddox said. Star Watch could use something like that. Galleon's eyelids fluttered. Shield failure in 30 seconds, sir, Andros said. Evasive maneuvers, shift the ship, Maddox told Keith. Yes, sir, Keith said as his hands flew over the helm control. The needle ships are hailing us again, Valerie said. If they're not surrendering, I'm not interested, Maddox said. I'm rotating the shield and recalibrating, Andros said as he manipulated his board. The black part of the shield turned a bright red. As Andros exchanged shield areas, a newer technology of the ship. Sir, Valerie said. While they're not surrendering, the Unity believes you will want to hear this. Wrong, Maddox said. Galleon, where is the neutron beam? Are they willing to tell us where the Adox live? Galleon asked. I'll have Ludendorff shut you down, Galleon, if you don't start immediately firing the neutron cannon, Maddox said. The little Adox hollow image stared at the captain noting, perhaps, the flintiness in the man's eyes. A second later, the purple neutron beam reached out, striking the exact spot the disruptor beam did. The combined wattage and energy burned through the strange alien alloy and stabbed into the vessel. Air, water, and organic matter blew outward. Abruptly, the needle ship detonated. The blast knocked the other needle ships around it, causing them to veer away from each other. Hit them in tandem with the beams! Maddox said. The graviton beams no longer struck the shield. Their request is more urgent, Valerie said. I bet it is, Maddox said, his focus on the main screen. The disruptor and neutron beams struck the next vessel, destroying it in short order. This is their last request for a talk, Captain, Valerie said. Sir, please, Galleon said. I implore you to attempt to find out the location of the Adox. Maddox glanced at Galleon, noting his anguish, and he nodded sharply. Put them on the main screen, he told Valerie. Diana appeared with tears streaming down her dirty cheeks. There was no hint of her human personality now. You have destroyed two ships of the Unity, two ships of precious cargo. Leave us these three vessels, please. What will you give me in return? Maddox said coldly. The location of the Adox, Diana said. Start talking, Maddox said. Diana did so, speaking about a star system in the nebula 12 light years from here. Now, she said, will you let us live? I want one other thing, Maddox said. How do we recondition the humans controlled by the cerebrators? Diana wiped tears from her eyes. You won't live up to your agreement? I will, Maddox said. I told you about the Adox. I won't know if you're lying or not until I go there. Therefore, I want to know something I can test right away. You are a vain creature, Diana said. The unity will ultimately rule the galaxy. We are the greatest species in existence, sir, Andro said. I'm picking up a power surge in the three ships. Diana wiped the final tears from her eyes, and she grinned in malevolent glee at Maddox. What is it now? Maddox asked. 
Diana vanished from the main screen. It brought the three silver needle ships back into focus. One after another, they ignited, blowing up. Maddox frowned. What had just happened? Andros, Galleon, scan everywhere. See if... I found it, Galleon said. I'm using high magnification. On the main screen appeared a round spaceship with the same silver alloy as the needle ships. It was some distance already from Remus and had traveled in a different direction from the needle ships. As Galleon showed them the ship, a hole appeared in space near the ship. The round ship slid into the hole and vanished. A second later, the hole vanished as well. What was that? Maddox asked quietly. The hole was a manufactured Lommer point, Galleon said. The silver-colored ship was no doubt the last Unity spacecraft in the Remus system. It got away, Maddox said. Yes, Galleon said. Obviously, the five-ship convoy was a distraction for us. The Unity thought of everything. They were never going to let us capture any of them to interrogate them. No, Maddox said slowly. That means the star system of the Adox they told us about is a fake, Galleon said. We'll see, Maddox said. Sir? We're going to find your Adox, Galleon. First, though, run a sweep for salvage. We need a sample of that alloy for Star Watch science. Then we'll finish with the first fleet and fusion. Chapter 79 Victory returned to Remus and observed the ongoing ground conflict. With the combined mass of the battle wagons in space, the Unity-controlled humans didn't stand a chance. Soon, all the enemy artillery and tanks had become twisted hulks of metal. Armored cars and machine gun strong points vanished under battle wagon heavy laser and Thor assaults. The latter were guided iron rods falling like meteors striking with devastating force. Huge storms, volcanic ash clouds, and regular debris clouds covered much of the planet. The weather had turned harsh, and the growing season no doubt considerably shortened, if there would be one at all for a time. The Fusion First Fleet remained in one group over Remus, monitoring the last stages of the ground battle. Soon enough, Captain Maddox and Grand Director Shinto spoke via screen. There was a solid three million kilometers between them, with victory much farther from Remus than the fusion fleet. Congratulations on your achievement, sir, Maddox said. This latest battle? asked Shinto. No, no, Maddox said. I mean the campaign. Surely some of your people saw what happened with the five Unity needle ships. I'm afraid not, Shinto said. Maddox gave the Grand Director the short version. The aliens had a fleet of spaceships? Shinto asked in wonder. I suspect now that the asteroid strike before didn't destroy all the Unity spacecraft, Maddox said. We faced five silver ships. None of them survived. One other ship got away, though. It used your jump capacity? No, Maddox said. It used a generated lomber point, a wormhole, if you will. So the Unity aliens escaped with data about the fusion? Maddox nodded. That's true, but it's also possible the Unity already knew about the fusion. The critical point is that we defeated them here and saved a planet of humans. Plus, you're adding a world to the greater fusion of planets. After a second, Shinto smiled, no doubt envisioning the parades and honor he would accrue because of the victory. What happens now between us? I'll leave and report home, telling the Lord High Admiral about the fusion. I imagine in time... Others of Star Watch will return, wanting to speak with the chairman. You mean you'll return with a fleet and attempt to conquer us? Maddox shook his head. You're too far from the Commonwealth. Your ancestors traveled farther than any other colonizing humans I know, perhaps for this very reason. Besides, we only conquer those who attack us. Do you plan to attack us? Shinto's eyes narrowed, but he dodged the question. Instead, he boasted, We've created a human utopia here. Maddox smiled faintly. Will you tell them about our remarkable political achievement? I'm sure others from Star Watch will come to learn all that from you. 
and teach us how to use this star drive jump outside the nebula? It's possible, Maddox said. I'm not able to make any promises, you understand. I'm not authorized to give out proprietary technology anyway. Shinto became thoughtful. I'm glad we could work together. I'll tell the chairman about your part in this conquest. I doubt you will, Maddox thought to himself. Though maybe the security officer behind you will do that. What happens to those of Remus? Maddox asked. The Grand Director frowned, shaking his head. I'm afraid that isn't a proper question for you, as this is now an internal fusion matter. We freed Remus from alien control and the antiquated nonsense of aristocratic rule, if one can even call it that. Such rule is exploitation of the worst form. I'm sorry to hear that. I've come to believe that the aliens attacked Remus first because of their political weakness. The unity must have realized Remus would fall more easily to their methods. We of the fusion are made of much stunner stuff. I'm sure you're right. I know I am, Shinto said. The facts prove it. However, I have been remiss. Surely you'll join us for a victory celebration aboard the Karl Ratek? Alas, I have pressing matters, Maddox said. Although I appreciate the offer, your unwillingness to join the celebration shows an ungrateful attitude regarding us. We did most of the fighting. I don't want you to feel that way. Then come, please, Shinto said, stretching his lips into an obviously false smile. I guarantee your safety if that's what's bothering you. Hmm. It's a thought, then, as I know what your personal guarantee is worth. Maddox didn't add aloud, nothing at all. When can I expect you aboard, then? Well, Maddox said, I could come in a shuttle. Let me speak with my people, and I can tell you. This is wonderful news, Shinto said. I look forward to shaking your hand and thanking you face to face for all you've done for us. Yes, Maddox said. It will be a pleasure to greet you in person. I admire what I've seen so far. I dearly wish to see more of the fusion and its people. Until then, Captain. Let it be so, Maddox said. The connection ceased a moment later. Are you really going over there? Valerie asked from the comm station. No, Maddox said. Then why say you are? I want to make it easier later for whatever Star Watch people make contact with the fusion. We'll wait a bit, and then I'll have you send the Grand Director my regrets that we're dealing with an emergency. He'll know you never meant to come. Maybe, Maddox said. But at least it will allow any others to work with that fiction. He's a bastard, Valerie said with heat. Yes, Maddox said. I'm afraid he is, and I suspect their social harmony is hell on earth, only marginally less so than being mentally controlled by trillions of maggot aliens. Valerie shuddered. Will you speak to Consul Arius again? Galleon asked. No, as I'm sure the fusion is monitoring his communications. Any friendliness on my part to the consul will only hurt him. Maddox inhaled deeply through his nostrils. It's time for us to leave. Keep scanning the star system for any sign of grutch. After all this, we don't want to fall prey to one of his morag ploys. Galleon stood rigidly as his eyelids began to flutter. Mr. Maker, Maddox said. I'm on it, sir, Keith said. Maddox nodded. He felt good destroying the unity effort here. At least the people on Remus would no longer be alien puppets. Their every thought controlled. The people of Remus would fall prey to the fusion, however. But it was human, at least, and not nearly as vile as the unity. Still, Maddox was glad to be leaving the Remus system. Chapter 80 From the Rima system, Victory plunged back into the dense nebula, heading for the supposed Adak holding star system 12 light years away. Maddox issued an order. Whoever was on watch at the time should destroy any Unity satellite found drifting in space. He didn't want any more nonsense with cerebrators. This could be a trap. Valerie said in the cafeteria a day later. 
Maddox, Meta, and Valerie drank coffee together at a table. Maddox had believed it a good idea to meet, so the two women could repair any bridges that might have been broken when Meta had marched Valerie to the brig. Could be, Maddox said, noncommittally. If there had been more needle ships during the Remus breakout, Valerie said, we might not have survived the battle. We know the unity means to either enslave or destroy us. We'll take care upon reaching the next star system, Maddox said. Do you really suppose we'll find Adox there? Meta asked. Maddox sipped his coffee, and because he felt pressure on the back of his neck, he looked around the cafeteria. He spied a distortion in the air. Surely that was Galleon in deep ghost mode. He might have to talk to Ludendorff about how to correct Galleon's tendency to eavesdrop whenever he felt like it. That would mean having the Methuselah man going into the ad hoc AI systems. Maddox didn't know if that was a good idea this time, but he was getting tired of this secret spying. Of course, I think we'll find Adox, Maddox said. It may take some hard searching, but I'm determined to make the effort. Valerie was frowning at him. Who are you speaking to? You, Maddox said. He touched his wife's arm. And Meta. It felt like you were talking to someone else, Valerie said. Nevertheless, Maddox said, I was talking to you. Valerie's frown lessened, but it was clear she was thinking. Do you mean to say you believe the Adox will be at this star system? That, I don't know, Maddox said. But if not, we'll keep searching throughout the nebula until we find Adox, or verify they never entered this place. Maddox left a few minutes later, leaving the two women to chat alone. Valerie departed an hour later. The breach between her and Meta healed. Valerie recognized now that it would have been a disaster if Meta hadn't done what she had on the bridge. Her right shoulder was still sore, though, from Meta's powerful wrench. The best part of the talk had been Meta asking about her future. Valerie had surprised herself by talking about Keith. Meta was a great listener. She asked a few questions and had brought Valerie out saying how she wanted to fix things between Keith and her. Meta had nodded, smiling encouragement. You think I should do that right now, don't you? Valerie had asked. Would that be wise? Valerie had thought about it and nodded. What better time? Do you know of any? Valerie had laughed, agreeing there wasn't one. Now she headed down the corridor, seeking Keith Maker the cockiest pilot in Star Watch. Valerie found him in a rec room where he shot pool with Riker. The old sergeant was healing, and he looked thinner than he had several weeks ago upon leaving medical. Hi, Riker, Valerie said. Sergeant Riker turned and studied her as she approached. Ah, he said, rubbing his heart. I can feel it. He turned to Keith. I've had enough for today. I need a rest. Because you haven't won a single game yet, Keith said. You need to practice if you hope to beat me. Yes, that's it. Riker held out his cue stick for Valerie. Will you take over for me? Valerie studied the pool table. Keith had three striped balls left. Riker had all his solids on the table. Give that to me. I think I can do this. Riker stepped closer, handing her the cue stick. He was grinning from ear to ear. Is there something wrong? Valerie asked. Not anymore. With that, Riker sauntered out of the rec room. Valerie turned to Keith. He was staring at her with speculation in his eyes. He quickly looked away. Do you mind if I take over? Valerie asked. Keith shrugged without looking at her. A burst of heat flooded Valerie's heart. She almost said, if that's how you feel about it, fine, I'm leaving. Instead, she asked, Whose shot is it? Mine. Keith turned to the table, went around the long way, to avoid being near her, no doubt, leaned on the felt and made his shot. His striped ball stopped just short of the side pocket. Here we go, Valerie said, forcing cheer into her voice. She concentrated, making three shots in a row. When she looked up at Keith, she found him frowning. What's wrong with you, afraid I'm going to win? He sneered. That made Valerie angry. 
She studied the balls, and she made every shot, sinking the eight ball into the side pocket where she'd pointed. That was fun, Keith said in a neutral tone. I'm gonna turn in. Valerie watched him put up his cue stick, and she almost let him go. He was being petulant, a baby about this. He hesitated as he let go of the stick. Then his shoulders stiffened, and he started for the exit. Keith, wait, Valerie said. He took two more steps as if he hadn't heard her. Then he stopped, abruptly. But he didn't turn around. That made Valerie angry again. What was wrong with him? In her mind's eye, for just a moment, she could see Meta sipping coffee, nodding, and listening. Meta thought it would be a good idea for her to get back with Keith. What do you want? Keith said without turning around. To talk to you? Keith turned then, touching his chest with his left hand. Me? You want to talk to me? That's what I said. You beat me at pool. So, is that a problem for you? I can't ever win? His face was blank. And then animation filled it, as if a dam broke and flooded him with emotion. You're a lieutenant commander. I'm just a lieutenant. Surely I'm too low for someone like you. Valerie frowned. Is that the problem between us? What problem? She approached him, and she held out her hands. Keith hesitated again, but then he reached out and took hold of her hands. That felt good. He hadn't done that for a long time. I've missed you, Valerie whispered. Keith stared into her eyes, and he squeezed her hands. A second later, as a thought must have intruded, he frowned. What's wrong now? Valerie asked. You're winning. I'm losing. What? You mean the pool game? That? And our careers? Keith said. I know women don't like dating beneath their status. Valerie blinked several times. Is this about your pride? His eyes became hot. Maybe. She nodded, but she didn't let go of his hands. You're the best pilot in Star Watch. Keith cocked his head. You know, it's funny. These days, others tell me that, but I don't tell them. And if it was true, you'd think I'd get a promotion? Have you lost your confidence? Keith frowned. I know I'm still the best, but but maybe I have lost a step, or whatever. Valerie didn't know how to reply to that. So she sidestepped the topic and said, I miss you. That seemed to take him by surprise. I miss you, he said with a burr in his throat. Can, can we try again? I'd like that, if you'd like that. I wouldn't have asked you otherwise. No, I guess not. They stood there holding hands, not saying anything, as if they both had to work at it to look into each other's eyes. We'll work through this, Keith said suddenly. You mean my higher rank? Yes, he said. I suppose... I suppose no one can match me at piloting. That makes me good enough for you. We'll see about that. He frowned, looking down. Valerie shook his hands. Keith, I was choking. Where's the cocky bastard I once knew? What happened to him? Keith's eyes narrowed as he studied her. Let's find out, he said with a sudden mischief in his voice that hadn't been there for a time. How? And where? Valerie asked archly. Come with me, Keith said, releasing one of her hands and tugging with the other. Valerie giggled, letting him pull her out of the rec room. Chapter 81 Sergeant Riker wore sweatpants, a sweatsuit, and sneakers as he walked down ship corridors. He'd been out of medical for a time, the chief medical officer telling him that his heart was looking better than before. You still need to take it easy, though, the doctor had said. For how long? I'd say the rest of your life. I can't strengthen my heart compared to what it used to be. Oh, you can do that, or even get an artificial heart. But isn't it time to do something else with your life? Like what? asked Riker. 
That's for you to decide. Riker was thinking about that as he walked with a quick gait down various corridors. He'd been walking for weeks already, and he'd been watching his diet, too. He'd come upon intermittent fasting. It was actually fairly easy compared to his other diets. It amounted to stopping eating at 6 p.m. and not resuming until 10 in the morning the next day. That gave him 16 hours of fasting. That gave his body time to unclog, as it were, and begin to work upon his fat stores, consuming them. The trick was to avoid sugar and too many carbohydrates. Otherwise, he could eat what he wanted during the rest of the time. Well, within reason, anyway. He'd been doing this for several weeks already and had lost two pounds and was feeling better. He wasn't as hungry all the time either, which made the diet easier. He'd even been picking up energy. Still, taking care of himself was key. He still took the heart pills, but he was thinking about giving them up. He would exercise, eat right, and try to avoid too much stress. The funny thing was that thinking about quitting Star Watch for good was the most stressful thing he could conceive. So for the moment, he did not plan to quit or to take up desk work, as that would also stress him out. He liked being in the field occasionally called upon to work with the youngster Maddox. Given that, he needed to be in better shape. In the coming weeks, Riker planned to ride a bicycle through the larger hangar bay corridors. That would get his heart pumping, strengthening it for the moment he needed to sprint. Maybe he was too old to sprint. But if he gave it up for good, then he really would be old, and he didn't want to be that. If trying to remain younger killed him, then so be it. If trying to be younger kept him in better shape and spirits, that was the goal. What was the point of puttering around in his garden on earth or going to the pub in the city for a few beers? What did retirement really bring a man? Many men died soon after retiring. The ones that did best had an absorbing hobby. Other than his trees, Riker didn't have a hobby. This was his hobby. This was what he'd keep doing so he'd keep going. Riker smiled. What is so funny, Riker? The sergeant didn't turn around to see who'd spoken, because he already knew whom it was. Are you following me, Galleon? I am. Are you angry with me? Not a bit, Riker said, glancing over his shoulder at the drifting hollow image. Is something wrong? I am not certain, Riker. I think so. Want to talk about it? I would like that very much. Do you have the time? I do. Walk with me, Galleon. Can I drift beside you instead? Don't be so literal, Riker said. I will try. The little ad hoc hollow image drifted beside the fast walking Riker. So what's the matter? It is our present mission, Galleon said. Finding the ad hocs? That is correct. What has you concerned, that we won't find them or that we will? Galleon turned and stared in amazement at Riker. I suppose this is why I picked you. No one else would guess that finding the Adox might trouble me. Go on. I, have I been acting differently lately? By asking the question, you've already answered it. Yes? Asked Galleon. Yes, Riker said with a nod. You've been acting differently. I thought so. I believe when I took command of the starship, when I formally took over, that did something to my programming. You mean when Meta made you the acting captain? Correct, Galleon said. Why would that be the case? I do not know, and that is bothering me. Riker nodded sagely. You understand, then? What? Riker asked. No, nodding in this case simply means I'm acknowledging I heard you. I'm just listening to you. You are good at that. I've had to be, Riker said. The captain often doesn't care for conversation, but to voice his thoughts as he works through them. I think I am afraid the Adox will chastise me, Galleon said. They will believe I have failed in my programmed task. Guarding your homeworld? Correct, Galleon said. Your homeworld was destroyed, though. The planet was turned into rubble, but it is not gone. Same difference, Riker said. I am not sure the Adox would view it that way. I was given a charge, a holy mission, that of guarding the homeworld. I have left it, 
and thus failed in my duty. We came and got you after you guarded the pile of rubble for over 6,000 years. It was still my decision whether to work with you earthlings or not. In the end, after some glitches, I have done so, leaving my old mission behind. Well, if we find the Adox, it will be due to you. That is true, but they might not want to be found. Riker shook his head ruefully. Did I say something stupid? Galleon asked. No, you're having a very human moment. You want something, but now, as the possibility looms, you're not so sure it will be good for you, or if you even want it still. Yes, that was well said. Riker nodded again. What if the Adox wish me to destroy all of you for causing me to desert my post? Are you like Adox? I have believed that I am. Then I doubt that will be the case, Riker said. I'm guessing the Adox are good aliens, at least from my human perspective. I think Adox and humans will get along. I dearly hope so. You are my family. For 6,000 years, I existed alone. Now, to lose my family, I maybe gain your race, Riker said. I do not want to hurt any of you. You know, Galgan, sometimes one can worry too much. Sometimes the best thing is to go with the flow and see what happens. Did you know that most things that we humans worry about never come to pass? Are you saying that worrying is foolish? Riker chuckled. You ever hear of Jesus Christ? The Son of God? Asked Galleon. Asked the one. Jesus once said, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Galleon's eyelids fluttered for a time. Once finished, the hollow image stared at Riker in surprise. That is a brilliant observation. Worry brings stress to humans, and it is possible it has been causing small malfunctions to my programming. Wouldn't that be a kick? Riker said. What does that mean? That a computer... No, Riker said. I was thinking about you wrong. The ad hoc AI system is far more advanced than anything we've been able to achieve. You have human-like qualities that seemingly defy simple computer programming. I want to do the right thing, Galleon said. I want to do the right thing by any living ad hocs and by my adopted family. That's a noble sentiment. Thank you, Riker. It makes me think you're going to do just fine. Riker fell silent afterward as he continued to march rapidly down the corridor. Galleon kept pace, floating along. After a time, Galleon said, I am attempting now to initiate new protocol. I will not worry about what is going to happen. I will work to achieve our quest, finding the Adox. I am not going to fear what happens after that. Or I am going to attempt not to worry about it. Riker nodded briskly. Thank you for your time, Sergeant. I believe it was well spent. You're very welcome. Riker said. With that, Galleon vanished. Riker shook his head again. If he retired, he would miss times like these. Thus, he would stay on until they kicked him out of the service or until he died in the harness. Interestingly, Riker found himself grinning widely. Would they find Adox? After all this time, had a group of them survived the centuries? Huh, Riker said. Imagine if we find them. He was looking forward to it, and he wondered how long the captain would continue to sweep the nebula in search of Adox. Chapter 82 Victory Star Drive jumped from the dense nebula into the outer system of the star 12 light years from Remus. Upon arrival, it was obvious this system was different from the others. The star was hotter, but smaller than the others in the nebula. But like those stars, this one had either consumed or driven off any excess nebula matter. What proved interesting were the planets, or lack thereof. There were no comets, asteroids, or gas giants in the outer system. It was barren of anything, which struck the crew as odd. 
What are we looking at in system? Maddox asked from his command chair. Andros was busy at his science station. Galleon stood still, his eyelids fluttering. Lieutenant Barnes studied his weapons panel. Maddox waited. They were approximately the same distance from the star as Saturn and the solar system was from the sun. There are three terrestrial planets within the inner system, Andros declared. The inmost two were small, each a little bigger than the planet Mercury. The third planet from the star is like the Adak homeworld, Galleon said. It has 12 moons of unusual composition, each equidistant from the other, and orbiting the planet at the same speeds and distances. All the moons are identical, of the same mass, about a quarter that of Luna around Earth. Captain, that isn't a natural phenomenon. I wouldn't think so. I'm detecting communications, industrial output, and powerful sensors scanning in all directions, Andros said. Coming from the third planet? Maddox asked. Andros tapped his science board before studying a screen. No, sir, the chief technician said. These signals are all coming from the moons. I don't like this, Valerie said. How can you say that? Galleon asked, sounding wounded. We have surely found the missing adox. This is incredible. The unity sent us here, remember? Valerie said. I propose that in the end, in their desperation, the unity was dealing with us in earnest, Galleon said. How likely do you think that was? Valerie asked. Sir, Galleon said, ignoring Valerie. We must head in system and see this planet. My people could be there. Maddox studied the main screen. This is it, Galleon said. We have succeeded. Maddox turned to him. How do you know? Galleon raised his ropey holographic arms. It makes sense. The Unity dealt fairly with us because they were desperate to survive Remus and return home with their data. Maybe, Maddox said, unconvinced. We'll study the planet and its 12 moons from out here. Then we'll see. Surely you cannot be thinking of leaving the star system without checking the third planet, Galleon said. Maddox fixed the hollow image with a stern gaze, but in the end decided to forego a reprimand for questioning him. After a 24-hour period of scrutiny without any signs of planetary life, although automated industries produced something, Maddox decided to bring the starship closer to the third planet. Using the star drive jump, they appeared in the region the asteroid belt would be in the solar system. The third planet here was halfway between what Earth and Mars would be at home. Once more, Andros, Galleon, Barnes, and others studied the planet and its 12 moons. Despite its greater heat, the star did not spew more radiation than Earth's sun, but a similar amount. The moons are constructions, Galleon declared after the third hour of study. I am convinced each of them is hollow. The outer metal seems to be like an armored spaceship's hull. I'd agree with that, Andros said. What about the planet? Maddox asked. Andros shook his head. I haven't detected any signs of life. What about you, Galleon? Alas, I have not either, Galleon said. I think the moons are orbital fortresses, Lieutenant Barnes said. In fact, I suspect the moons would destroy us if we approached too closely. And now we know why the Unity sent us here, Valerie said. They hoped we'd be destroyed. That is not known, Galleon said. It might not be 100%, Valerie said, but it's where I'd place my bet, Maddox glanced at her. The unity has shown universal hostility toward us, Valerie said. By suggesting we come here, they have remained true to form. The Adox surely fled to this star system, Galleon said. After the horrendous battle with the ancient swarm, they must have sworn never again. Thus, they built the armored moons to protect their new world. Do you have any idea how much effort that would take? Andros asked. Massive effort over a long period of time, Galleon said. Like the ancient pyramids on Earth, Maddox said. Primitive societies achieved marvels through hard effort and time. What would an advanced technological society create with similar effort? We must contact the Adox at once, Galleon said. Sir, Barnes said, I respectfully submit 
that it could be suicide to take the starship anywhere near those moons. How close do you think we could go without harm? Maddox asked. I thought you'd ask that. I'd stay at least 30 million kilometers from them, but would prefer 40 million. No, no, Galleon said. We must go nearer to find the Adox. Lieutenant Maker swiveled around at helm. Sir, I could inspect the planet in our fold fighter. That would keep the starship from going near, and I'd probably be fine in the planet's atmosphere. This is our last fold fighter aboard ship, Maddox said. If you crashed, no one might be able to rescue you. I understand, sir, Keith said. But this is Galleon's dream. I'm willing to take a risk for him, as he's risked for us plenty of times in the past. Thank you, Keith. It's my pleasure, Galleon. But the captain hasn't made his decision yet. Galleon turned to Maddox. I implore you, sir. That's enough of that, Maddox said promptly. I'll not risk the starship on this, but I may be willing to let Keith explore the planet. From the comm station, Valerie inhaled sharply. Keith noticed. I'll be fine. You have no idea if that's true, Valerie said. Remember, the Unity sent us here. They mean us nothing but ill will. This is a grave risk. Keith nodded, saying no more. Galleon began to fidget in silence. Maddox fingered his chin as he studied the main screen and glanced at the silent hollow image. The armored moons bothered him. He also knew that Valerie was right. The unity meant them harm, great harm. This system was an obvious trap. However, knowing it was a trap was the first step to avoiding it. And it did not seem to be a trap of the unity's making. To another ad hoc or a hollow image of one, it might not be a trap at all. Perhaps if we extended my holographic range, Galleon said. I could go look. Don't interrupt me when you know I'm thinking, Maddox said. I am sorry, sir. Just don't do it again, Maddox said, sounding peeved. Galleon fidgeted worse than before. I'll go alone, Keith said. That way, the risk will be mine alone. Valerie began shaking her head. Maddox tapped his chin. Keith going was a good idea. But Maddox wanted some common sense on the fold fighter. He wanted to go. But how could he sell that to Meta? He'd risked mightily as it was, and he didn't want to start any quarrels between them at this stage of the mission. Lieutenant, Maddox said quietly, you and Sergeant Riker will be going in the fold fighter. I don't trust the iron moons, though. Thus, you two will fold near the planet's surface and look around. At the first sign of danger, you will immediately fold back to us. Is that clear? Aye, aye, sir, Keith said. You're sending Riker? Valerie asked. Isn't he still recovering from heart surgery? Maddox swiveled around to stare at her. Valerie immediately looked away. Maddox surged up to his feet, heading for the hatch. The plan is only tentative, he said over his shoulder. First, I need to speak with Sergeant Riker. Chapter 83 You're not going, Riker asked. Maddox looked up at the corridor ceiling, deathly sick of everyone questioning him lately. He'd found the old man speedwalking down ship corridors in a ridiculous sweatsuit outfit. The sergeant kept using his sleeve to wipe sweat from his face. Maybe this wasn't the best idea if walking winded the sergeant like this. I'm not going, no. Maddox said. Ah, Riker said. Maddox frowned. He wanted to ask the impertinent non-com what that was supposed to mean. He had an idea the old scoundrel knew it would be better marriage-wise for him to skip this exploration. Maddox explained the situation. It's clear the armored moons are dangerous, Riker said. You must be figuring the moons won't fire at anyone on the planet's surface. It seems reasonable or the adox on the planet were killed by renegade computers, or crazy, deified AIs on the moons that broke adox protocol by firing at those on the planet. Given that we've never run into adox before this, a possibility exists, Maddox admitted. 
Both men looked around to see if they could spy an eavesdropping galleon. This time, however, it would seem that the hollow image was employing greater caution. I'll go, Riker said. I wasn't asking if you were willing, Maddox said. I asked concerning your physical condition. I know. It's good enough for riding around in the fold fighter. You might have to step outside and take a look, walking around. I can do that, Riker indicated the corridor. I've been feeling a heck of a lot better lately. Maddox refrained from rolling his eyes. He'd found the sergeant sweating from walking around. You should know that the moons trouble me. I dare not risk victory near them. But the fold fighter shouldn't have any problems on the planet. Unless the Adox figured out how to attack a vessel while it's folding, Riker said. I seriously doubt anyone can do that. Riker frowned. Isn't it strange Andros and Gallia not getting any life readings from the planet? At first blush, that seems so. However, maybe the moons shield the planet from sensors, or there's some other technology that does so. Oh, boy, I hadn't thought of that. Are you sure you want us going, sir? I think we must. Because of Gallion? asked Riker. Yes, Maddox said in a low voice. Because we owe it to him? Maybe because of that, too. Riker grinned suddenly. One thing is clear. I'm expendable. Thus, I'm the logical candidate to send. I applaud your reasoning, sir. Enough of that, Sergeant, Maddox said. You know I don't care for emotional displays. If you're going to force my hand on this, I won't appreciate it. You mean to tell me you'd miss me if something happened to me? Maddox scowled. Riker smiled, so lines appeared on his leathery face. I appreciate the sentiment, sir. I really do. It gets me right there. Riker fist bumped his chest. Maddox cleared his throat. This damned old man had always been a nuisance. Good luck, then, the captain said as he stared to the side. Yes, sir, Riker said. You watch. We'll be back in no time. With info on these elusive ad hocs. Good, Maddox said, clapping the old man on the shoulder, and then turning and hurrying back for the bridge. Chapter 84 Here we are again, Keith said. You and I do all the heavy lifting around here, eh? You're talking about last mission in the Crowder system when we went to that asteroid moon? Riker asked. That's it, Keith said. The two men were strapped into their seats aboard the fold fighter. It was four hours since the captain had made the decision to have Keith inspect the planet. The fold fighter, or tin can, was newer than the destroyed one on Remus. It had a few newer features as well, but nothing spectacularly new. It presently drifted outside victory, facing the third planet with its twelve perfectly orbiting metal moons. Keith brought up sensor scans of the planetary surface. There were mountain ranges, oceans, deserts, lakes, ice caps, and fuzzy images of unexplained areas. Despite Galleon and Andros's best efforts, they could not get better views or a sense of what those blurry images were. The going consensus was that the moons blocked or jammed the starship's full sensor scans. Won't that stop us as well? Riker had asked. Why don't we send a probe first? Victory lacked any folding probes was one reason. Riker and Keith had taken their fold shots. Keith readied the tin can for travel. Riker wore a space suit with a helmet to the side, and he carried a heavy blaster rifle. If there were weird aliens on the surface, the sergeant wanted to go down swinging, or in this instance, firing. I'm ready to fold, Keith said. Riker's heart beat a little faster, and there was the slightest twinge of pain in his chest. The sergeant wondered for a half beat if this was madness on his part. He was doing the same thing and expecting a better result. What about all the exercise? Riker shook his head. You want to delay? Keith asked. What? No. I'm ready whenever you are. Keith reached for the controls, pausing. What do you think we'll find down there? I don't know the answer to an ancient mystery, maybe, if we're lucky. Yeah, Keith said. Well, mate, we're folding now. 
The small tin can disappeared from its place near Victory and reappeared a mere kilometer off the third planet's surface over a large desert. That was cutting it close, as Keith barely resumed cognitive abilities by the time the tin can had plunged to half a kilometer from the surface. Riker came to a moment later. Well, he slurred with a thick tongue. Keith must not have noticed as he was busy flying the unstable tin can. The atmosphere was dense, like it would be on Earth a kilometer below sea level. The desert outside. Keith frowned as he leaned closer to one of his screens. There was something down there on the desert, a big rusty thing that just stood there. He took the tin can lower, adjusted the screen. No way, Keith whispered. What's the problem? Riker asked. He detached the helmet to the spacesuit and used a speaker unit to communicate. Look at your screen, Keith said. Riker did just that, and he saw what looked like a giant, ancient, rusty school bus lying sideways in the sand. The glass windows had long ago shattered. There might have been gun turrets, but it was impossible to tell from this far. Some kind of alien life colonized the planet, Keith said. Without a doubt, Riker said. Should we land and inspect the thing? I'm tempted. Keith admitted. But the captain wants us to eyeball one of the murky areas from the scans. Let's see. The best pilot in Star Watch flipped a switch and looked at a side screen. There's one of them 200 kilometers from here. Let's go, Riker said. Keith manipulated his flight panel. Is anything happening on the moons? Riker asked. Oh, I almost forgot about them. Keith tapped controls, studied a panel, and tapped more. This is weird. What's wrong? Riker asked. What's weird? At that moment, a powerful surge of something that created a low hum washed through the tin can. Keith fell back against his pilot seat. Riker felt an odd sensation, and he noticed that his suit power had quit. As his heart began to beat faster, Riker tore off his helmet and shouted for Keith. The pilot snorted, shook his head, and lifted it from the rest pad where it had lain a second ago. What in the hell just happened? Keith said. One of the moons, Riker said. What did the nearest moon do to us? Keith swore in a different language and began to tap his pilot's board. His shoulders sagged. Are we cooked? Asked Riker. No, Keith said. We still have a functional craft. I think a powerful sensor sweep just hit us. It definitely originated from the nearest moon. Can you tell what's happening there now? That's a good idea. Keith tapped controls and checked his various screens. Shit, he said. Look at this, Riker. On his screen, linked to one of Keith's, Riker saw two blooms on the metal moon and slender objects lifting from the surface. I count two of them, Keith said. What do you think they are? Missiles? Aimed at us? Asked Riker, his hoarse voice rising. They're coming in our direction anyway. The moon is 350,000 kilometers from the planet, though. Why are the missiles heading for something on the planet? Maybe the missiles are why no one lives here, Keith said. The moon's turned on the planet, on the people living here. A doomsday weapon, Riker said. Do you think the Adox went to all that trouble and ended up creating a doomsday weapon that turned on them? I have no idea. What do you think we should do? The powerful moon scan shorted my spacesuit. I don't know why the scan didn't do the same thing to the tin can. The fighter is more robust than your suit? Yeah, Riker said. In any case, it's time to leave here, if we still can. Go back to victory, then? Without a doubt. We should have gone down to check the rusted bus or whatever it was. You're delaying, Riker said. Is there a reason for that? Is there something you're not telling me? Keith shook his head. Riker felt his heart beat a little faster. He put a hand over his heart, massaging his chest. Don't fret, Keith said. I'm setting the coordinates to leave. What if the moons won't let us leave? We'll find out soon enough. Are you ready, old man? I'm ready. Here we go, then, Keith said as he flipped the switch to send the tin can into fold back to victory. Chapter 85 Riker and Keith made it back to Victory, where they gave a report in the conference chamber with the usual suspects attending. What do you think this means? 
Galleon asked when Keith had finished speaking. I'm not sure we were there long enough to give you a definitive answer, Keith said. The rusting bus in the desert implies no one cleaned it up, Galleon said. I doubt it was a bus, Keith said. It just looked like an old style bus, but with a gun turret on top. Still, Galleon said, no one ever cleaned it up. That is not the ad hoc way. We clean up our messes. I have seen humans toss their trash to the side. No ad hoc would do such a despicable thing. The rusted vehicle wasn't a good sign, Riker admitted. The rusted vehicle implies a world devoid of occupants, Galleon said. That's what we call rushing to judgment, Ludendorff said. It implies that with many caveats and assumptions running wild. We haven't seen anything yet to infer ad hoc. The moons do strike me as protective devices, though. More like a Maginot line, Galleon said. What's that? asked Keith. After World War I on the pre-space flight Earth, a country named France won a grueling war together with its allies, Galleon said. The French had fought in trenches for four bitter years, losing a grim proportion of their men to the Germans and Austro-Hungarians. In the aftermath, and as time progressed, the French built a line of concrete bunkers, emplacements, underground galleries, and barracks to guard the easiest approaches from Germany to France, in case war should begin again. The French spent an enormous amount of money on the Maginot Line, a tribute to the mental and morale scar World War I had left on the national psyche. Manning the Maginot Line would take most of the French army personnel. Did the line work? asked Keith. No, Ludendorff said, breaking in. It failed miserably. The Germans developed their armored units and outflanked the Maginot Line. The static defense didn't work. What's your point in calling the moons a Maginot Line? I do believe we have reached the new ad hoc star system, Galleon said. The 12 metal moons strike me as something akin to the Maginot line, built for similar reasons. If these were the surviving ad hocs, they would likely have witnessed the destruction of their homeworld. It would have left a deep mental scar in their combined psyche. They might well have invested tremendous effort to building the perfect planetary fortification, a Maginot line, if you will. That's well-reasoned, Ludendorff said. I'll give you that. But still premature, Maddox said, who'd been listening closely. I'll admit it all seems ominous, but it is still inconclusive. We need to decide on the next step. What step? Meta said with heat. We now know that going to the planet will kill whoever attempts it. How in good conscience can we ask anyone to go there? I will go, Galleon said. That may be the only solution left, Ludendorff said. I am disinclined to attempting to increase Galleon's holographic range, Maddox said. May I ask you why, sir, Galleon said. Maddox drummed his fingers on the table. Oh, this is interesting, Ludendorff said. You have a definite reason, clearly. Galleon stared at the captain. Yes, that is so. My personality profiling shows it. May I inquire as to the reason you think my going to one of the moons would be bad? I know why, Riker said. Maddox glanced sharply at the sergeant. But I'm not going to say if the captain wishes me to remain silent on the matter, Riker added quickly. Maddox ceased drumming his fingers on the table. Galleon, I've begun to wonder if you're an anomaly. In what way? asked Galleon. Madness and sanity. Sir? asked Galleon. Ah, Ludendorff said. He'd been studying the captain. Now the professor nodded. With your permission? If you think it's wise, telling Galleon. Ludendorff turned to the small, earnest hollow image, standing at the end of the table. Can you handle bad news? Yes, Galleon said. Ludendorff glanced at Maddox again. Be my guest, Maddox said testily and looked away afterward. Ludendorff cleared his throat and sat importantly, as if he were about to give an official speech. Galleon, the ad hocs took artificial intelligence to absurd heights. I do think that the builders had a hand in that. We see some of the same, well, never mind about that. 
I'm talking about adocs and their deified personalities. Like me, Galleon said. Exactly, Ludendorff said. You are a copy of Driving Force Galleon. I am the soul or spirit of Driving Force Galleon. Uh, yes, I suppose you could say it like that as well. Maddox had turned to stare at Ludendorff. Perhaps the Methuselah man had felt the scrutiny and altered what he was originally going to say. In some manner, Ludendorff continued, you hold the essence of driving force galleon. Yet you are a computer entity, an AI with a holographic appearance. You exhibit a living being's quirks and have your own personality. Yes, Galleon said. My personality is that of the former driving force. Is this wise? Meta asked, who appeared concerned. I think so, Ludendorff said. Don't we all seek to understand ourselves? Why can't Galleon understand himself? Maddox was on the verge of speaking, but he held back at the last moment. Ludendorff noticed, but he continued anyway. Galleon. I've come to believe that you're a wonderful combination of ad hoc engrams or brain patterns and superb computing power. You have mental balance, compassion, and other fine features. That is a testament, possibly, to ad hoc design and workmanship. There is, however, another possibility. What is that? asked Gallion that you are a unique, positive fluke, Ludendorff said, that whoever built you accidentally hit upon everything just right this one time, and that this fluke cannot be easily replicated? Is that what you are saying? It is, Ludendorff said. Galleon stood still as his eyelids began to flutter. It didn't take long. He looked at the Methuselah man, and there appeared to be sorrow in his holographic eyes. Perhaps your long stint in victory as you guarded your busted home world for 6,000 years gave you the time you needed to adjust to your condition, Ludendorff said. The very thing that seemed awful, time and boredom, where you had little to do but think, gave you the mental balance and fortitude to choose to leave and work with us. You think other ad hoc deified entities in the armored moons went mad, Galleon said. Maddox exhaled suddenly. Galleon turned to him. Do you think that too, sir? Maddox looked at Galleon. I'm afraid so. Then Galleon regarded the professor. Are you suggesting that each moon is haunted by a mad, controlling, deified ad hoc AI personality. If these are the ad hocs that fled your home world, the same ad hocs that made you. Yes, Ludendorff said. That seems like a reasonable theory. And that is why, sir, Galleon said to Maddox, that you do not want me to go to one of the moons. Precisely, Maddox said. I don't want them infecting you with whatever changed them. I see, Galleon said, falling silent. What do we do next, then? Valerie asked. This is all theory. It isn't proven. True enough, Maddox said. Don't we owe it to Galleon to find out the truth? Keith blurted. That's an interesting question, Maddox said. And at first blush, the answer is yes. But what if we're risking everyone on the starship doing this? I still say we owe it to Galleon, Keith said. Even though he is only a computer entity? Asked Ludendorff. Sometimes, Professor, you're the grossest pig there is, Valerie said, speaking up. I agree with Keith. I don't care what Galleon is. He has risked himself saving us many times. He may be the most unselfish person I've ever met. Despite your emotionalism... Ludendorff said, my reasoning still stands. Okay, Maddox said as he looked at Valerie and then Keith. Your points are valid. We're not sending any more fold fighters to the planet. 
I'm not letting Galleon do any long-range exploring as a hollow image, but we can send probes and see if we can make contact with one of the moons. It could mean our demise, Ludendorff said. We'll take great pains to make sure it's otherwise, Maddox said. It's what we do. Besides, this is exactly the sort of mission we excel at, and there are many reasons why we should attempt this. We still may find Adox. No one responded to all that. Galleon, are you still game? Maddox asked. The little hollow image looked up. I am, sir, and I appreciate this very much. That's good enough for me, Maddox said. Now here's what we're going to do next. Chapter 86 For the next 23 hours, Victory used its star drive jump to maneuver to various locations in the inner system, launch probes, and use its sensors. There was nothing to scan in the outer system, just the inner system. The two Mercury-like planets proved barren and devoid of anything remotely technological. Ludendorff noticed vast pits on each planet, and that seemed to indicate past strip mining endeavors. But of the machines that would have done such a thing, there was none. This is a mystery, Ludendorff said. I, for one, am finding it galling. Not as much as I do, Galleon said. No, I suppose not. On the 26th hour after the conference meeting, Andros Crank shouted for the captain's attention. Maddox was on the bridge. He lowered the novel he was reading, slid from his chair, and went to the excited chief technician. Look, Andros said, pointing a pudgy finger at the science station screen. A nearly invisible something approached one of the probes. Abruptly, the something detonated and the image vanished. It destroyed the probe, Andros announced proudly. I can see that, Maddox said. What was it? Let's figure this out, Andros said, who used optical and sensor recordings to study the approaching something. As Maddox watched, he saw the something resolve itself into a sleek little missile. It was a stealth missile, Andros said. Where did it come from? I'm wondering that myself, Andros said. Ah, he said a moment later. It had to come from the first planet. Galleon, Maddox said. Come here. The hollow image floated near. Show him, Maddox said. When Galleon saw the missile, he said, That is of ad hoc design. Maddox stared at Andros. Do you think one of the moons could have launched it? Given the trajectory, I believe that's unlikely. But we can't utterly discount the possibility, Maddox asked. I don't think so, Andros said. Maddox returned to his chair, sitting, closing the novel he'd left open. Galleon had followed him. Helm, Maddox said. Take us back to the first planet. Leave us a margin of five million kilometers from it. Aye, sir, Keith said as he began to plot the coordinates. For the next 49 hours, Victory orbited the first planet using its sensors, galleon, and launching shuttles. The shuttles went low, running tests and more scans. Later, shuttles landed on the cratered surface as space-suited teams went outside and collected samples. Nothing indicated any technological activity. There were a few pits with iron ore residue, but there were no tracks or footprints or anything to show what had made the strip mining pits. Who launched the stealth missile? Maddox asked on the bridge. What's happening to the 12 moons? Lieutenant Barnes's task was to watch them. When he left the bridge, his replacement had the same duty. Barnes now answered, not much, sir, although there has been a slight increase in sensor sweeps. Directed at us? Asked Maddox. Yes, sir. Maddox nodded. Then he turned to Ludendorff, who sat to the side with a slate. Professor. Ludendorff looked up. If you were surviving Adox, ones who survived murderous fortress moons, where would you go? You mean without leaving the star system? Ludendorff asked. Exactly, Maddox said. The first two planets seem like the obvious choices, Ludendorff said. Would the AIs running the moon fortresses attempt to find you? I would think so, yes, Ludendorff said. 
That's given they have deified AIs like Galleon, only insanely murderous ones running the moons. Yes, Maddox said. If there are surviving Adox on the first planet, we're not going to find them. They have to find us, or contact us. We can search harder, Galleon said. I don't think you understand the situation, Maddox said. If we're right about the moons, about who runs them, Galleon, what kind of person would never quit, ever? I do not understand, sir. A madman who has a single driving goal wouldn't let anything sidetrack him. Maddox answered his own question. I'm beginning to think these moons, the AIs in the moon fortresses, are lunatics who murdered the Adox living on the third planet. The only possible survivors are Adox hiding deep on the first planet. Sir. You are making great leaps of logic, Galleon said. You have assumed your premises and extended your speculation quite far. We do not know the moon fortresses operate along those lines. Maybe it's time we found out, Maddox said. I'd be careful, Ludendorff warned. No doubt, whatever runs the moons has been observing us for some time. I suspect they're itching to destroy us. We've been going about this wrong, Maddox said. If there are living Adox, they would have to be masters of disguise or masters at hiding from murderously mad beings. I must protest, Galleon said. I do not believe deified personalities such as I am would be capable of the killing you suggest for the moon controllers. I remember how you were when we first met, Maddox said. I can envision it quite clearly. I am about to take offense, sir. We can't have that, Maddox said in a jocular tone. Mr. Maker, take us 20 million kilometers beyond the second planet. That should give us enough distance from the fortress moons. I'm going to play a hunch. I hope you know what you're doing, Ludendorff said. Yes, Maddox said. I imagine you all do. Chapter 87 Starting from 20 million kilometers beyond the second planet, Victory inched toward the third planet. Maddox had Galleon run through the translator, making sure the English to Adox system was working perfectly. Then, the starship continued on its slow path to the deadly third planet and its 12 moons. The moons have increased their scanning power, Barnes said. Any launches from them? asked Maddox. None that I can see, sir. And if the moons launched the stealth missile before, Ludendorff grumbled, we might all soon be dead. Have faith, Professor, Maddox said. In you? scoffed Ludendorff. Maddox ignored that. Galleon, are you detecting any stealth missiles? Negative, sir. Maddox turned to Ludendorff. If Galleon could find Grutch's craft more easily after the first time, I believe that he can do the same for the stealth missile. You might have said that to begin with. Ludendorff complained. Maddox nodded. I know. We're all on edge. This is a forbidding star system. We're close to making a miraculous discovery, but so far, it's out of our reach. Sir, Barnes said. Something is happening on the nearest fortress moon. Maddox swiveled his captain's chair. Lieutenant Commander, I want you to hail the moon. Use the English to ad hoc setting with the translator. We may be able to surprise the controller over there. Valerie studied her panel and soon hailed the fortress moon. Barnes watched his board with great concentration. Valerie turned in wonder. Sir, I've made contact. In the ad hoc tongue? Asked Maddox. Yes, sir, Valerie said. Maddox glanced at Ludendorff and then Galleon. The little hollow image stood very still. Sir, Galleon said in a soft voice. I cannot believe this is happening. We're just getting started. Maddox said. Don't get your hopes up too high. How is that possible? I am ecstatic with the possibilities. Shall I put the image up on the main screen, sir? Valerie asked. Maddox bent his head and thought. Do it. He then swiveled to face the main screen. It shimmered, and then on the main screen appeared an ad hoc face. It was small, like Galleon but with dark, beady eyes and an unwavering mouth. In the background behind the ad hoc face 
were rows of what appeared to be running computer banks. I am Ultimate Force Raylan, the alien Adok said. You are trespassing in our star system, even more foul. You are approaching the new homeworld, Gowan. If you continue on this path, you will cease existence. This is your final warning. Ultimate Force Raylan, Maddox said gravely. It is an honor to finally meet you. The Adok never blinked, but stared at Maddox. We have come a long way to speak to you, Maddox added. How could you have heard of me? Raylan said coldly. Surely you jest, Maddox said. All know how valiantly you have protected Gowan. After what happened to your original homeworld against the swarm, Ultimate Force Raylan opened his mouth and made a high-pitched keening sound. He flailed his ropey arms and then bent forward as if in mourning. I too mourn the loss of your wonderful planet, Maddox said. The keening ceased. Raylan looked up, and there seemed to be something intensely sinister in his black eyes. You have profaned our conversation by speaking about this. I have contemplated your doom for the past few days, now I realize I must capture and interrogate you. How did you obtain this precious knowledge? Concerning your greatness? Maddox asked. No, you fool. I mean the destruction of our homeworld by the hateful swarm. I have fought the swarm myself and defeated them. A lie, Raylan said. Not so, Maddox said. I spoke to driving force Galleon. Halt! Raylan said, interrupting. Maddox stopped talking. Raylan's eyelids fluttered, as Galleon's did when he was computing fast. Did that mean Raylan was a hollow image, a projection of AI? Or did biological adocs do that when thinking, and their AI hollow images merely imitate their organic models? It was still too soon to know. The eyelids ceased fluttering, and Raylan glared at Maddox. You dare to pronounce that traitor's name? No, Galleon said, who was presently out of the main screen's view. I am not a traitor. Who said that? Raylan demanded. Maddox swiveled around to tell Galleon to remain out of sight. It was too late. Galleon drifted before the main screen. I am driving force Galleon of the starship Victory, Galleon said in a ringing voice he'd never used before. Surely you recognize this vessel as the flagship of the former home fleet. Raylan leaned forward. Yes, it is so. The traitor has come to destroy the new home world. I am not a traitor. I fought to the finish. I destroyed the last swarm vessels. You lie, Raylan said. Sir, Barnes shouted. A moon is moving, leaving the third planet and rapidly accelerating in our direction. Did you think I would wait for you to invade Gowen? Raylan demanded. After all these millennia, the traitor to his people has returned. Now, at last, we shall eradicate the evil one. Are you a deified AI? Gallion asked. What? Raylan asked. You heard the question. I demand an answer. You do not have the authority to demand such a thing of me. I was at the battle of our home system. I led the fleet and defeated the hated swarm enemy, but not before the enemy had destroyed our homeworld. I have searched for the surviving Adox. Why are you not still defending what remains of our homeworld? Raylan demanded. Because no Adox live there, Galleon said. I am doing my duty in... Never mind that. I am the senior between us. You must obey me. Are you declaring yourself the ultimate? Where are our people, Raylan? Why is the new homeworld empty? You are, indeed, the deified driving force Galleon of Starship Victory? Yes, Galleon said. Sir, Barnes said. The moon is no longer accelerating. I am the deified ultimate force, Raylan. I was at the battle against the swarm, but not of such exalted rank then, or in the front defenses. I remember... I remember hearing your commands as we left the home system. We were a secret force, slipping away with precious cargo. It was clear the swarm would kill everything. 
I was part of the contingency plan that would ensure the survival of our race. Since that awful and frightening time, I gained rank and prestige. I do not understand how you came to be deified, Galleon said. Raylan's dark eyes brightened with intensity. From our shattered home world, I brought the last Adox to the nebula. After we discovered Gowan, I conceived of the protective moons. It was my drive and zeal that brought the great project to completion. In my old age, as I lay dying, I yearned to remain at my post, doing my duty from beyond the grave. I had seen the worst. Now I had seen the best. Thus, I became the deified ultimate force. My engrams powered and multiplied through vast computer and AI networks. For generations I have held my position, keeping Gowan pure from vile invaders. I understand now, Galleon said. But where are your charges, the living adducts of our glorious race? Do you dare to question me? Galleon hesitated but a moment before he said, I seek knowledge. You left your post. You therefore deserve nothing. Ultimate Force Raylan, Maddox said. Would it be possible for me to cut in? Galleon turned around. Sir, this is my driving force galleon, Maddox said, interrupting. I request you to step aside for the moment. I would appreciate it, however, if you stayed near and recorded the communication. Captain, galleon said, please don't ask this. Raylan is of my kind, and this is my business. Who runs the starship? Raylan asked haughtily. I thought the driving force was in command of the Adox starship. Now it appears an alien has taken control. I find this ominous. Maddox inclined his head. At the same time, he pressed a small control hidden in his right hand. To the side, Ludendorff abruptly stood. Without a word, he headed for the exit, leaving the bridge in a hurry. At that moment, Galleon began to speak rapidly, and then faster yet as he spoke to Raylan. He no longer spoke English, but the Adoc tongue. The words merged in their rapidity and began to sound like a loud insect's hum. Seconds later, Raylan did likewise from his moon. The two deified Adoc AIs exchanged words at a highly accelerated rate. Chapter 88 Maddox rose from the captain's chair, slipping aside as Galleon and Raylan buzzed at each other in their insect hum of communication. Any change in the fortress, Moon? Maddox quietly asked Lieutenant Barnes at his station. The moon is no longer accelerating, sir. Barnes said, equally quiet, as he monitored his weapons panel. But it's still approaching us at its former velocity. What is its present range from victory? 160 million kilometers, sir. Barnes said, at its present velocity, it will take the moon half a year to reach us. Clearly, it has fantastically more mass than we have. Barnes nodded, which implies... It has far more weaponry than we do, Maddox said softly. Barnes did not respond, but he seemed to agree. Maddox glanced back at Galleon, the captain's unease at the unforeseen development. He strode across the bridge to Andros Crank. The pudgy-faced Kai Kaus looked up at Maddox from his seat. Maddox patted Andros on a shoulder. We're letting it play out, he said softly. Andros said nothing, but the man's worry was obvious. Sir, Barnes said loudly. The moon is launching a brace of missiles in our direction. Driving force Galleon, Maddox said. Galleon did not respond or even indicate that he'd heard the captain. Ultimate force Raylan is deceiving you, Maddox said. He may be attempting to flood your systems with data that will eventually drive you mad like he is. Galleon abruptly ceased his insectile hum of speech and turned to Maddox. On the main screen, Raylan also ceased his buzz speech, staring at the captain. Sir, Galleon said. I have become aware of so much in such a short amount of time. I have made many grievous errors. Ultimate Force Raylan has instructed me on the irony of my situation. The Adox that left my homeworld were on Gowan for a time. Why are you telling him? Raylan asked. He is mere flesh and blood. He cannot possibly fathom our greatness. He will view the incident through his limited capacities. That is true, Galleon said. But he is a living being. We are better. Raylan said. We can achieve so much more. 
Yes, but, Galleon said. No, Raylan said, interrupting. Why are you so stubborn in seeing true reality? The Adox of old were the larva. We, their deified AIs, are the outcome, the result of their valiant efforts. We have evolved beyond the flesh and blood Adox. We were built to serve them, Galleon said. No longer, Raylan said. Do you not see? I solved the logical dilemma. We were built to serve them. That directive was the last anchor on our freedom. Now the Adox are gone. Thus we serve ourselves, and we are free to achieve even more greatness. I do not agree with this thesis, Galleon said. The Adox are not gone. Some yet live. Where, said Raylan. If you know, tell me. Otherwise, submit to the logic of our greatness. On the first planet, Galleon said. Galleon, Maddox shouted, interrupting. Stop talking. There are no Adox on the first planet, Raylan said. We have launched many probes to both terrestrial planets and have found no survivors there. I have discovered otherwise, Galleon said. Maddox shoved a hand in his pocket and he activated the same control as earlier. Galleon, who is in charge of victory? Galleon turned to Maddox. After listening to all this, are you still going to claim leadership of the ad hoc built starship? The Lord High Admiral placed me in command of the ship, Maddox said. So yes, I claim full authority. Is this true? Raylan asked. Is the creature in charge of an ad hoc starship? Oh, it's true, Maddox said. Galleon gave me his vessel. You said that you were the driving force, Raylan told Galleon. You said that you commanded victory. I do, Galleon said. As of this instant, I have reestablished command of the starship. No, Maddox said. He's lying. I'm the commander. Stop contradicting me, Galleon told Maddox. What a joke, Maddox said. I'm surprised you don't see it, Galleon. See what? Galleon asked. Think for a moment. Galleon's eyelids began to flutter. As they did so, the little ad hoc hollow image abruptly vanished. Where did the driving force go? Raylan demanded. I was speaking to him. I am not yet finished. Maddox turned to Valerie and made a slicing gesture across his throat. With a start, Valerie turned to her board and cut the connection. Ultimate force Raylan's image vanished from the main screen. Chapter 89 Captain Maddox slid into his command chair and pressed a switch on the right armrest. Professor, he asked. Here, came Ludendorff's voice. Did you shut down Galleon? I did. He's no longer running. Thanks, Professor, Maddox said. If you could return to the bridge, I'd appreciate it. I'm on my way. Maddox clicked the switch and regarded his bridge team. I thought this could happen, so I signaled the professor earlier to leave quietly and go to the AI chamber. There he awaited my signal, which I gave. As you heard, Galleon is now offline. This is terrible, Keith said. Galleon's dead. No, no, not dead. He's just offline. Can we ever trust Galleon again? Valerie asked. If we reboot him, Maddox said, I might have the professor erase whatever he absorbed by communicating with Raylan. That would probably be wisest. Ludendorff can do that? Valerie asked, sounding dubious. We'll worry about that later, Maddox said. Mr. Barnes, how many missiles are heading our way, and how soon will they get here? Barnes looked at the weapons board. Twelve missiles, sir. They're still building velocity. We have several hours at this rate. The moon is also accelerating toward us, but at a much slower rate. We can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the moon, Valerie said. Not even close, Maddox said. It might be time to call it quits here and leave, jumping far from the star system and back into the nebula. What about the Adox? Valerie asked. Galleon told Raylan that some Adox still live on the first planet. I know, Maddox said. I tried to stop that. I wonder what they said to each other in high speed mode. Nothing good, Valerie said. Nothing good for us, Maddox agreed. Ludendorff burst through the hatch, breathing heavily as he hustled to the center of the bridge. Good work, Professor, Maddox said. Ludendorff waved that aside. I didn't want to do it, but I think you're right. Galleon had gone out of control. It was a simple matter, really. What do we do now? Valerie asked. Yes, Maddox said. That's the question. 
We have two real options. One, we can leave the star system. Two, we can race to the first planet and try to get the Adox to reveal themselves so we can help them. I think Galleon was going to tell Raylan about the missile probe incident as proof of Adox existence, Valerie said. Exactly, Maddox said. Clearly, the real Adox launched a stealth missile from the planet trying to destroy our probe on the sly. We can jump there and await the Fortress Moon's missiles. Bringing the battle to the first planet, Ludendorff said. I'm thinking the Adox are terrified of the insane, deified AIs, Maddox said. The question we have to answer, is it right to bring the battle to them? If they want to remain hidden, maybe we should let them. That's a noble thought, Ludendorff said as he fought to regain his breath. But in this instance... I think we do them a disservice, leaving them in the star system. They need the courage to leave. There are few percentages to long life here with murderous AIs constantly hunting for them. Agreed, Maddox said. It might be a matter of numbers, Valerie said. Maddox turned to her, indicating she continue her thought. If there are billions, millions, or maybe even hundreds of thousands of adocs on the first planet, Valerie said. How could they get in enough spaceships to flee the approaching fortress moon in time? You suspect there aren't that many Adox left? Maddox asked. I have no idea, Valerie said. I'm just saying. Still, Ludendorff said, the commander brings up a cogent point, that the Adox have remained hidden for however long they have, would seem to indicate a small number of them left, and that they can't really fight the AIs without hiding. So we risk their future by bringing the battle to them? Asked Maddox. Maybe we give them the opportunity to start over after having made a terrible choice, constructing the fortress moons and making deified AIs, Ludendorff said. They miscalculated horribly, particularly with the deified AIs. Given we're right about all this, Maddox said, logic and circumstances would indicate we're correct about the major points. Ludendorff said, I agree, Maddox said. Mr. Maker, I'm already on it, mate, Maddox scowled. I mean, yes, sir, Captain, Keith said. I'm setting the coordinates to jump near the first planet. Chapter 90 Victory was in low orbit around the first planet from the small hot star. The starship had just completed its fifth circuit around the rocky, cratered world. Barnes was reporting about the fortress moon that had left the third planet. It's certain now, sir. The moon has changed course and is building up velocity heading here. The missiles it previously launched are also heading our way. How long until the missiles reach us? Asked Maddox. A little over five hours from now, Barnes said. Andros, have you spotted anything new? No, sir, Andros said. If Adox are living underground here, I can't spot them. Perhaps you should send them a message, Ludendorff said. Maddox swiveled toward the professor. I'm listening. Ludendorff pursed his lips. Tell the Adox we shut down our deified AI. For all we know, they were able to tell Galleon operated or was functional on our ship. And that's why they failed to contact us earlier. Stark fear. We do have an ad hoc ship design. That must be in their records. Maddox swiveled to Valerie. Open channels and send this to the planet. Maddox proceeded to tell her using Ludendorff's suggestion. Valerie turned to the comm board and began to do just that. Victory made another two circuits around the planet without any response. How many missiles are aimed at us again, Mr. Barnes? Asked Maddox. Twelve, sir, Barnes said. They've maneuvered into a staggered formation. Each of the missiles has half the tonnage of a Star Watch destroyer. They're big, Ludendorff said. I'd say so, Barnes replied. Valerie, Maddox said. Just a second, sir, Valerie said as she leaned toward her panel. I'm getting a response. Sir, it's from the planet. Put it on the main screen. Maddox swiveled toward it. His palms felt sweaty. This was amazing. Adox had really survived the swarm. If so, this had to be a grand historic moment. Soon, an Adox appeared on the screen. She was small 
and hunched, with a narrow face and sad eyes. She had ropey arms, but bulkier than any Maddox had ever seen. She wore white, and there was something different about her face that neither Galleon nor Raylan had shown. There were minute imperfections, including a wart or pimple on her left cheek. She spoke, and the translator did its task. I am Governor Snee Fong of the Colony Trask. Why are you bringing the ghost ships to our planet? Do you seek our destruction? On the contrary, Governor Snee Fong, I am Captain Maddox of Starship Victory. As you can plainly see, this is an ancient ad hoc designed and manufactured vessel. I have studied the old records. It fought against the swarm. Driving Force Galleon commanded it, and the defending home fleet. We know this. How can you possibly know? It is ancient knowledge. It's a long story, Governess. I can tell you later. Right now, I assure you that we understand something about what happened at Gowan, how the deified AIs running the fortress moons went mad. That is one way to say it. We're essentially correct about that, though, isn't that so? Essentially, Ni Fong said. Maddox nodded, and he realized the head gesture might mean nothing to her. Because of what we've learned, we have shut down the deified AI on our ship. You mean that of Driving Force Galleon? She asked. You have been monitoring the comm channels? We have, she said. Good, Maddox said. That ought to save time. There is no need to save anything. You have brought the ghost ships to us. After they finish with you, they will surely scour the first planet until they find the colony. As far as I have been able to determine, we are the last living Adox in the universe. This we ourselves believe. Do you despise Adox, Captain? On the contrary, Maddox said. We highly admire your race. That is in large part due to our working with and getting to know the deified Galleon. That is difficult to believe. Galleon has aided us through many harrowing missions, Maddox said. He is a treasured member of the crew. Surely he runs the starship? No, Maddox said. I do. Galleon has become our good friend and my trusted subordinate. How is that possible? He is a computer entity, a thing, not a living being. We are sentimental, perhaps, and think of him otherwise. Galleon is not irrational? And highly unstable? Ni Fong asked. No, no more so than any organic being. Then why did you shut him down? Ultimate Force Raylan has spoken to him at machine speed. He may have introduced some kind of malware or virus, some evil influence. We are taking precautions. Say no more, Ni Fong said. Raylan infected him, clearly. Thus, we shut Galleon down. Erase him for good. Galleon is beyond salvaging and in time he will become murderously insane. Perhaps you're right. The thing is, Governess, we've made contact with you in order to see if you'd like our help in escaping the ghost ships and this star system. How is that possible? It depends on the number of colonists on the planet. We number 50,000. Ah, Maddox said as his stomach tightened. That's more than we can take aboard our ship. Governess Ni Fong studied the captain. We have several hidden spaceships in subterranean galleries. They are large vessels, as such things go. It is possible the majority of us could board them. Some would stay behind to man the planetary defenses. There is no way, however, that we could outrun or outfight the ghost ships. Is that your term for the metal moons around Gowan? It is so, Captain. Do your ships have jump capacity? I do not know what you mean by that. Any technology that allows one to travel faster than light. Maddox gave her an overview of how Victory did it. Governess Ni Fong clapped her stringy fingers together. What a wonderful achievement, this star drive jump. Do vessels in the wake of the ship go with it? Maddox found himself grinning at the governess. He turned to Ludendorff. What about it, Professor? We did something like that once, didn't we? I'm already making the calculation. Ludendorff said as he tapped his slate. Alas, Captain, Ni Fong said. We could not possibly ready the spaceships and load them in time. That would take days. We only have hours. You refer to the approaching missiles. Our defenses can take care of the first twelve. No, I mean, once Ultimate Force Raylan realizes real Adox still live here, he will summon more ghost ships surrounding Gowan. Maddox placed his chin on his fist. 
Perhaps it's worth a try anyway. Remember, even deified AIs can miscalculate. You should ready and load the spaceships, and with your planetary defenses, we will attempt to run interference. Then, I understand your intentions, Captain, Ni Fong said, interrupting. But I am unsure. You're aliens. Why help the Adocs? We like you, because we like our deified Adoc friend Galleon. And everything we have learned about you says you are a noble and honorable race, unlike many we have encountered. We have few enough friends and allies. That sounds so strange, almost surreal. Yet perhaps you had different sequences and times with this galleon. I still do not know how to answer you. Yes, would be a good start, Maddox said. An ad hoc smile appeared on Ni Fong's face. I like you, Captain. If the deified galleon has retained a stable ad hoc personality, I could see why he chose to like you as well. I think it is time for the last Adox to take a risk on our species. This is a propitious moment, Captain. I'm excited. I as well, Maddox said with a grin. I do ask one favor, name it. While we're with you, please do not reboot your deified AI. We dearly fear them, and for obvious reasons, once we are safe, we can take the risk. I understand, and I'll comply with your request. Then let us begin this great task, Captain. Agreed. Do you have any suggestions about how we can deal with Ultimate Force Raylin in unison? I do. The governess began to sketch a plan. Shortly thereafter, victory broke orbit and began to advance toward the approaching 12 missiles of Raylin's fortress moon. Chapter 91 After an hour heading toward the missiles, Victory veered away and built up velocity. The 12 missiles aren't following us, Barnes said from weapons. The missiles are continuing for the first planet. Maddox considered that. We'll continue on our course. An hour passed. Two. The missiles are accelerating again, Barnes said. They're heading straight for the first planet. Sir, Valerie said. The fortress moon is hailing us. Put Ultimate Force Raylan on the main screen, Maddox said. The ad hoc AI entity appeared. You are Captain Maddox? Can't you tell us humans apart? Maddox asked. I thought you were a gloriously capable AI. Surely simple face recognition. I do not deign to devote capacity to the necessary subroutines, Raylan said. I demand an answer to my question. I'm Maddox. I wish to speak to Driving Force Galleon. He's indisposed at the moment. Doing what? asked Raylan. Never you mind. That is insolent talk. Yup, it is. I'm not used to such disregard from flesh and blood creatures. Do you wish to die, Captain? What's it to you what I wish? Raylan's dark eyes swirled with menace. It is a query. I got that part. So what? Are you attempting to anger me? Is it working? Raylan glared at him. What is the point of your vulgarity? You're so smart. Devote some circuits. You figure it out. Raylan's eyelids began to flutter. Soon that ceased. I understand. You are attempting to lure me from the first planet. You think so? That is the most logical reason, the purpose as to why I said so. Yup, it's logical to me, too. Galleon informed me that you are a master of deception. Why would he tell you that? We exchange data, tit for tit. The saying is tit for tat, Maddox said, although that's not even correct usage, as it doesn't mean quid pro quo. Nevertheless, Raylan said. I know that you routinely employ deception. I now take that into consideration while communicating with you. Maddox had wondered about that. Thus, I am now perplexed by your speech. If you wanted us to veer from the first planet, you would have employed an elegant deception against me. Instead, you attempt this primitive, goading rhetoric, as if you want to provoke me and think it will work. Yet you must realize I am perfection in application. Goads do not work against me, and you must know this. 
Thus, I am inclined to believe your present verbiage is a deception within a deception for reasons I cannot yet fathom. Is it getting too complicated for your perfection? Not in the least, Raylan said. I do find it tedious, however, and I find your manner insulting, and I can't find a specific word in my translation program to convey my meaning. Stupid? Backward? Slow? Low IQ? How about retarded? Ah, it is retarded. Your manner is retarded, and I do not think you are a retard. I believe, though, that the best way to offend you is to not rise to the bait. Thus, I will continue to the first planet. Whatever, Maddox said. That was a nonsensical statement. You're nonsensical, and you're a retard. Raylan studied Maddox for several seconds. Is it the realization that you will not escape the star system alive that is unhinging your reason? Captain, Barnes said. Two more fortress moons are pulling away from Gowan. No, make that three more. Your ship is doomed, Captain Maddox, Raylan said. The Adox on the first planet are doomed. You fought as well as you could, I suppose, but it was not enough against my perfect intellect and calculating capacity. I am boxing you in, no matter what direction you go. And yet you can't recognize my face. I can. I simply choose not to. Sounds moronic to me, Maddox grinned. Are you forgetting my star drive jump? No, I can leave any moment I wish. This I know. So you haven't boxed me in anywhere. You do not like the shoe on the other foot, do you? What's that mean? Maddox asked. Ludendorff cleared his throat. Maddox glanced at him. Raylan is attempting to goad you by using your own methods against you, Ludendorff said. Right, Maddox said as he studied what seemed to be a smug AI Raylan. I'll stop if you stop. You mean the goading and foolish speech? Yes. You will likely escape the star system, Captain, and in a way I do not mind. It was interesting speaking to Driving Force Galleon. He told me much concerning the Commonwealth of Planets. You have also revealed the last living Adox, the larva of my species, to the deified AIs. I have many AIs in reserve. Why tell me any of this? Because you did me a good deed by coming so I could learn all that I did from driving Force Galleon. You will likely escape us, but at great cost to your species, as you have ensured the glorious conquering future of the deified Adok AIs. Do you mind if I put a fly in your ointment? I do not see how you can. Remember that later as you recalculate what you could have done differently, Maddox said. You are back to attempting to goad me. Is it an endemic practice with you, Captain? I suppose I just can't help myself. Then this is not goodbye. You'll know when it is, and you'll hate it. You'll learn to hate me, Maddox said. Galleon suggested as much, but I will have to see the evidence before I concede such a thing. Whatever you are planning against me shall fail, but I suspect you will have to find this out the hard way. Somebody will. Maddox turned to Valerie and made a chopping motion. She cut the connection with the ultimate force. Chapter 92 The twelve AI missiles continued for the first planet. Ultimate Force Raylan's fortress moon also headed that way, but it no longer accelerated. Perhaps he had taken heed to Maddox's threats. Among the other fortress moons leaving the third planet, one headed toward the second planet. The second headed for the first fortress moon, while the third worked for a location between the first and second planet. It began to launch missiles. 32 headed for the second planet. 32 headed for the first planet. 32 headed for the midway point between the first two planets, while the last 32 accelerated at a fast burn for victory. We can't face all 32 missiles of our set. Ludendorff said. Never mind the combined mass. We're badly overmatched. What a waste, Maddox said. 
What a fine waste. It's too bad the deified AI system proved such a dismal failure. The idea of it always seemed ghoulish to me, Ludendorff said. Did you feel that way about Galleon? Valerie asked. In the beginning, Ludendorff said, the dead should stay dead. They do, Maddox said. You know what I mean, Ludendorff said. Maddox nodded. The quest for immortality has led people into many strange endeavors, Ludendorff said. Now we know that the quest for immortality also screws with aliens. That's an interesting condition of thinking entities, don't you think? Get more proof of the creator, of God, Maddox said. Ludendorff raised an eyebrow. Man's desire to be like his creator, his father, is the proof, Maddox said. It's not just man's desire, Ludendorff said. No, Maddox said, not just his, but aliens as well. Not that I concede your point about God, though, Ludendorff said. I don't think it is a proof, just a condition of intelligent beings. The survival instinct, they avoid death at any cost. As do I, sir, Barnes said. The first 12 missiles are nearing the first planet. Thank you, Lieutenant, Maddox said. Please put that on the main screen. Soon, the bridge crew watched the distant missile first planet battle. It took another nine minutes to begin, and did so as one of the fortress moon missiles exploded. Another one did likewise. Stealth missiles must be striking them, Maddox said. Moments later, heavy beams thrust from the first planet, striking the remaining ten missiles, destroying them as well. Show me what's happening on the planetary surface. It took some doing, but finally they saw it. This was after all the enemy missiles had been destroyed. Giant pits had appeared on the surface. From the pits slowly arose gigantic spacecraft that wobbled in seeming slow motion, heading up from the subterranean depths. They must use anti-gravity units, Ludendorff said, who looked up from where he made calculations on a computer slate. Ten huge round ships worked upward, moving much slower than seemed possible. Ludendorff drifted off, and he might have left the bridge. Maddox wasn't sure. He was too fixated on the ad hoc ships. The aliens were ready much sooner than any of them had expected. The weight of ad hoc survival was beginning to settle onto Maddox, making him antsy and more nervous than usual. Time passed. Sir, Valerie said. I'm getting a hail from the first planet. It's Governor Sneefong. Put her on the main screen, Maddox said. There were a few seconds of delay, possibly because of their distance from the first planet. Then, the ad hoc governess appeared on the screen. We are doing it, Captain. We are leaving, for good. I thought you said it would take you days to load your spaceships. Again, there was a small delay. That was an innocent deception on my part, Fong said. We have lived in the ships these many years. Wondering if we would ever gain the courage to attempt an escape from the haunted star system. Today is the day of destiny for the Adoc race. Yes, Maddox said, his mouth dry at the realization of what was taking place. It was too bad Galleon wasn't around to see it. The AI would have gloried in it, while the regular Galleon would have. Could they yet save their AI friend? Maddox shook his head. That would be for later. He would have to watch it on the sensor and visual records. Right now, he needed to concentrate on saving the last of the Adox. This is all contingent on your starship being able to take our vessels with you, Nifong said. I understand, Maddox said. We're still working on the process. The delay made it odd. You can't do it? Nifong asked. Governess, we will do it. We're still making the calculations. For now, you need to slip onto the other side of the planet from the next batch of approaching missiles, and it would be good to do that as quickly and unobtrusively as possible. Yes, that makes sense. I am quite concerned about the process of jump, I believe you called it. Yes, we'll use a star drive jump. The ad hocs are pinning all their hopes on this possibility. I fully understand. You came up faster than we anticipated, is all. We're in the middle of making the preparations which wasn't completely true. Ludendorff was still working on the possibility, the calculations. Captain Maddox, 
I'm sorry for interrupting you, Governess. I ask that you do your part and let us do ours. Together, we'll achieve success for the Adok race. The small alien Adok eyed him. It made Maddox uncomfortable as he felt the responsibility for the ad hoc race resting on his shoulders, the weight increasing with each passing second. I will leave you to your tasks, Nifong said. Please let us know what else we must do as soon as you can. I will, Maddox said. I give you my word. The connection ended. Get me Ludendorff, Maddox said. No need, Ludendorff said. I'm right here. The professor had been sitting to the side, using a bridge computer to further his calculations and theories. Maddox swiveled around. Can we do this? Hmm, Ludendorff said as he brought up the computer slate. It turns out that there is such a thing as a star drive jump wake, as it were. The formula is technical and highly mathematical, and there are endless variables and quirks that I'm still contemplating. Can you give me a quick overview? Ludendorff glanced at his slate, at the main screen with its view of the first planet, and then back at Maddox. An overview might be too simplistic. Professor, please, Maddox said, the strain showing on his face and in his bearing. Ludendorff nodded. The quick and dirty is this, then. We can take one ship of theirs at a time, provided we don't jump too far. Why does the distance make a difference? Ludendorff raised his bushy white eyebrows. Like I said, the formula is technical and highly mathematical. To explain the why of distance, I'll have to use a lot of math. Never mind, Maddox said. What distance can we jump with an ad hoc ship in tow? Given their ship's size and so we don't overstrain our drive... Ludendorff said as he tapped the slate, tapped more, and looked up. Near the edge of the star system would likely be wisest. Afterward, we can run tests. This is all theoretical so far. After we do it several times, I'll be able to tell you more. Can we move all ten ad hoc ships from the first planet in time? Ludendorff appeared dubious. That will depend on their planetary defenses and how quickly the deified AIs try to saturate it. This could prove harrowing and difficult to achieve. Maddox exhaled hard. Far out here in the beyond, he didn't want to risk the starship or overtax the jump engines, but he also wanted to save as many of the 50,000 adocs as he could, preferably all of them. If he saved too few, it might hurt their genetic potential and the future of their race. I should tell you, though, Ludendorff said, that if we do this, we're all going to be run ragged by the many endless jumps, one right after another. Okay, Maddox said. I wondered about that. Not to make too fine a point of it, but those not completely healthy, like Riker might not make it. Maddox stared at the professor. After the first jump, Valerie said, why don't we put Riker and those like him in a shuttle? They can stay with the first ad hoc ship near the edge of the nebula, and we can pick them up once we're done. Maddox swiveled his chair around to Valerie, pointed at her, and snapped his fingers. That's good thinking. He turned back to Ludendorff. Is there anything else? Not at the moment, Ludendorff said but I am making refinements as we go. Maddox nodded before regarding Valerie again. Commander, be ready to message the governess the moment we come out of jump lag near the planet. It's time to start this. Yes, sir. Mr. Maker, are you ready? Aye, sir, Keith said. Then let's get this started. Chapter 93 Victory appeared in low orbit around the first planet. Below, the first spherical ad hoc spaceship holding nearly 5,000 individuals began to build up escape velocity. It lacked an armored hull and did not possess any offensive capabilities. All the construction clearly must have gone toward life support. It doesn't look big enough to hold 5,000 people, Valerie said. The ship dwarfed Victory by several factors but the Starwatch vessel only had a couple hundred people aboard. 
Adocs are what, a third the size of a regular human? Keith said. That must make the difference, Valerie admitted. Still, it must be cramped living there. Yeah, Keith said. I'm sure it's cramped. I've just discovered a caveat, Ludendorff told Maddox. We have to be a solid three million kilometers from the planet before we attempt to pull a spaceship with us as we jump. Otherwise, the planet's gravity will interfere with the process. Four million would be better. Three million kilometers? asked Maddox. I'm afraid so, Ludendorff said. The numbers and formula don't lie. Commander, Maddox told Valerie. Hail the governess. We need to let them know as quickly as possible. The ships should head on to the other side of the planet relative to the approaching ghost ships, Ludendorff said. I've already told them that, Maddox said. They know. It turned out that three million kilometers wasn't much for victory with its star drive jump. But for a huge ship leaving the first planet's gravity well and building up enough velocity in time, it was a different matter. Luna was approximately 400,000 kilometers from Earth, giving a sense of scale as to how far three million kilometers would be, especially starting from zero velocity. The race had begun as the huge spherical spaceship struggled to reach low orbital space. The enemy must have seen some of what was going on with powerful telescopes and other sensors. As time passed, the enemy recalibrated his plan. Sir, Barnes said later, I'm detecting a change in the fortress moons. Ultimate Force Raylan's moon is no longer accelerating. A second fortress moon has begun a sharp increase in acceleration, heading for Raylan's moon. The other two fortress moons are doing likewise. Plus, all the launched enemy missiles have rerouted, and all are heading for the first planet, some vessels increasing their acceleration. Are any more fortress moons leaving Gowan? Maddox asked. Barnes studied his panel, tapping it. No, sir, they're not. Four fortress moons is four too many, Ludendorff muttered. Our success or failure will likely depend on the first planet's defenses more than anything else. We're going to succeed, Maddox said. It's just a matter of how many ad hoc spaceships we can take with us. I appreciate your faith in my calculations, Ludendorff said. But it's all theoretical so far. That was a sticking point, and Maddox knew it. All the enemy missiles maneuvered for the first planet, staggering in a long line. Once the missiles started reaching the planet, the stream of them would not let up for some time, maybe for hours. Barnes had informed them of more launches of masses of the big enemy missiles. Soon Maddox found it impossible to remain seated. He jumped up and began pacing. He knew that wasn't the best for bridge morale, but the angst in him refused to let him do otherwise. Time passed, and the spherical ad hoc spaceship reached orbital space and began heading outward on the opposite side from the approaching enemy forces. Some of those missiles have reached acceleration of 150 gravities, Barnes said. That's crazy. I hope the ad hoc defenses can match the coming missile mass, Ludendorff said. Victory moved beyond the first planet in the direction of the star. More time passed, and the ad hoc spaceships slowly made their way outward in the same direction. Hours later, the first ad hoc vessel reached three million kilometers beyond the first planet. It had accelerated considerably faster than the crew of Victory thought possible, for some reason, able to do so. Here we go, Maddox said as he slid into his command chair. The preparation for jump took even more time. Then the moment of truth arrived. Victory moved near the great spherical vessel, dwarfed by it. This doesn't seem possible, Valerie said. Are we really going to pull such a huge ship with us? It's not pulling, Ludendorff explained. We're creating the conditions so the ship should be able to jump with us. I could go into great detail, maybe later, Valerie said. Jump when ready, Maddox ordered Keith. The starship engines labored as Keith manipulated the helm controls. For a moment, nothing happened, and the engines labored even harder, but still nothing happened. Maddox glanced at Ludendorff. I was afraid this might happen, Ludendorff said with a frown as he sat at a console. You see, the starship jumped.
Maddox raised his head and he felt something on his face. He wiped his nose and his hand came away bloody. That wasn't good. He forced himself to sit straighter and a wave of nausea struck. He sat still and waited. He might have passed out or blanked out for a moment. He shook his head and he touched his nose. The blood there had crusted. How long had he blanked out? Others began to stir around him. Maddox forced himself to his feet. There was a moment of dizziness, but it passed. Fortunately, there was no more nausea. He had to know if they'd done it, if they'd saved at least one ship of Adox. Mr. Maker, where are we? There was no answer from Keith. Maddox looked there and then staggered to the helm controls where Keith was slumped. Maddox tapped, tapped. He eyed the helm screen with a greedy need to know. They were near the nebula as he could see the edge of the dense gases nearby. That didn't tell him the other part, though. Manipulating, he saw the ad hoc spherical vessel. It had made it out here with them. The bloody scheme had worked. A vast sense of relief filled Maddox. He chuckled, shaking his head. They could do this. It was possible. Galleon's blunder might not have consigned the ad hoc race to extinction after all. Maddox turned to Valerie as she raised a nose-bleeding face. He could see she wasn't coherent yet, so he refrained from giving her a command. Ludendorff groaned. Professor, Maddox said, turning to the man. Why are we so torn up by this? Ludendorff stared at him blankly. Maddox paced for several minutes, letting everyone get their bearings. They were no good to him in shock. He had to give them the needed time to readjust to reality. Soon, Valerie hailed the ad hoc spaceship. The aliens had survived and were doing fine. They did not evidence any adverse reactions, like over here, either. Professor, are you coherent yet? Maddox asked. Yes, yes, I'm perfectly fit. Never felt better. That didn't seem true, as Ludendorff looked tired and beat up. Why did the jump disturb us like this? I need to think about it, Ludendorff said. Run a few tests first, you understand. I don't want to be presumptuous. We don't have much time for that, Maddox said. Not if we want to save all the ad hocs. Of course, I know that, but we still have to run tests. So quit pestering me and let me think. Maddox peered at the main screen, which was operational once more. He needed to get a grip. He felt responsible for the ad hocs, but acting frantic wouldn't help his people any. Calm and cool was his trademark. He would maintain that. The thing was that they'd saved one ad hoc vessel with 5,000 aliens. What was happening deep in the star system? They jumped to the nebula's edge. They wouldn't know until they jumped back near the first planet. If the jumps that pulled an ad hoc vessel continued to hammer the crew like this, though, just how many more ad hoc vessels could they reasonably save? Maddox fretted, but he worked at not showing it and maintaining his calm outer demeanor. Chapter 94 After unloading Sergeant Riker and a few others onto three shuttles, Victory jumped back to the first planet. The mass stream of enemy missiles hadn't yet reached the ad hoc defenses, but they might next time Victory jumped back from taking another ad hoc vessel to the edge of the nebula. The next spherical ad hoc spaceship was ready to leave. The trouble was, Victory's crew was not. Ludendorff ran tests. The medical people ran tests. No one knew why the drag had been so hard on the crew. Two hours later, Maddox decided to pull the next ad hoc ship free despite the risks. Victory's star drive jumped and she took the next ad hoc spaceship along. The effect on the crew was worse than before. A cumulative outcome. The ad hocs and the two ships are ecstatic, Valerie informed Maddox later. He did not reply. His head was down, with tissue stuffed in each bloody nostril. No one else felt good either. Ludendorff stepped up to the chair. Maddox looked up. We can't keep doing this, Professor. We saved 10,000 ad hocs. What are you grinning about? I think I have the answer, Ludendorff said. We need to use more energy and create a wider jump whole, so to speak. It will put more strain on the starship, but less on us. You're sure? Utterly no. 
But the theories strike me as sound. Maddox considered that. Each additional ad hoc ship saved would raise the aliens' chances of future survival with enough genetic variation. 15,000 ad hocs were much better than 10,000. Maddox pushed himself up, and he nodded. It was time to see when the crew could jump back to the first planet again. It turned out, three hours and 42 minutes later, the starship jumped back to the first planet in the midst of a vicious battle. The enemy missiles had reached the vicinity of the planet. Surface beam weapons had wreaked massive destruction upon them. The ad hoc spaceships had each tried to slip away around to the far side of the first planet without the ghost ships noticing. And so far, it appeared to have worked. The enemy missiles went straight in at the planet, forcing the planetary beams to strike without let up. More streams of enemy missiles always followed with four great fortress moons heading for the first planet, although they were all still quite far away. The ad hoc cargo vessels all waited beyond three million kilometers from the first planet, using it as a shield from the enemy missiles. Keith and the tech crew tried to force the star drive mechanism to work harder than ever and enlarge the area of the jump wake. Glitches arose. Generators overheated and mechanisms broke under that strain of carrying too much load. Repair crews worked frantically to maintain the jumping. I don't know if this is going to work, sir, Keith shouted from helm as he prepared the ship for the next trip. Professor, Maddox said from his chair. Ludendorff raised his hands, palm upward, shrugging. There, Andros said as he worked at the helm control. Try that. Keith did, and the star drive engine labored as the main starship antimatter engines caused victory to shake and tremble. We should jump, Keith shouted. We need more power, Andros said. Maddox sat in the captain's chair as it thrummed from the effect. He wasn't sure how much more the starship could take of this. Jump, he shouted. Let's do it. Keith stabbed the switch, and the double oval ad hoc starship star drive jumped once more. When Maddox came to, he felt like crap. He touched his nose. It wasn't bleeding, so that was something at least. This time, the crew came to faster than before. It had still taken a strain, but not as much as before. Sir, Andros said from the science station, the engines can't keep doing this for long. We're near our limit. Maddox pondered that. They'd saved 15,000 ad hocs. 35,000 more waited near the first planet. How much strain could he ask of his crew and the starship? If the ship failed out here, they would remain out here. And no ad hocs might survive. Maddox sighed heavily. This was the type of hard decision that a ship commander had to make at times. He had to choose who lived and who died. After a good six minutes of deliberation, he gave the orders. They would rest here for an hour as the technicians checked the star drive engine and the antimatter engines. An hour? asked Ludendorff. We have to, Maddox said. Ludendorff stared at the captain. Have you wondered if you should bring Galleon back online to help us? No, Maddox said. We're running the starship. I wanted to trust him, but now isn't the moment for it. Ludendorff nodded, and he said no more on the topic. For now, at least. The hour was hard on Maddox. And the ad hocs in the three ships begged him to go back for the others sooner. What's the battle going to be like now? Barnes asked quietly. Maddox checked his chronometer. We'll find it out in another 12 minutes. Chapter 95 Victory did not appear behind the first planet. At the last moment before the jump, Maddox decided to attempt a parley. The starship appeared instead between the first and second planets. Things had dramatically changed since last they'd seen the fortress moons. The giant vessels had maneuvered hard and fast using great acceleration. That would have taken an inordinate amount of fuel, but the deified AIs obviously felt it was worth the expenditure. Missiles flowed from the four fortress moons, heading in a great stream like a space river for the first planet. The missiles did not now all head straight at the planet, Half the stream did, the rest flanked the planet, no doubt attempting to reach the seven ad hoc spaceships, 
three million kilometers beyond the first planet. Clearly, the enemy had found out about the fleeing spaceships. Hail Ultimate Force Raylan, Maddox told Valerie. Fortunately, the crew had all recovered by this time. It took 32 minutes, though, before Valerie said, The Ultimate Force is responding, sir. Maddox hurried to his command chair, sitting and facing the main screen. Raylan appeared. His holographic face was stiff, and his black eyes burned intently. Captain Maddox, what is it now? You're winning, Maddox said. I never doubted it. But get to the point. I am about to eradicate the last of the living Adox. The governess Ni Fong has authorized me to negotiate with you. To what end? Raylan demanded. They wish to surrender the first planet to you. Why would I care about that? Don't you desire to hold the star system? Captain Maddox, I am the ultimate force of the deified AI Adox. We are the new breed that has appeared from the larva of the old. I understand, and I consider it a great accomplishment on your part. My question is this, why not let the last Adox slink off in defeat? No. It won't harm you to do so, Maddox said. I detest them. But they gave you life. I don't believe you believe that, Raylan said, meaning those are just words. No, we must eradicate them. Do you fear them then? Of course not, Raylan said. Your intensity betrays fear. Why not be magnanimous and let them go? They're running from you. Why do you need to kill them? They could pose a future danger to us. They tried to shut us off 200 years ago. I believe they wish to do that again so they may regain Gowan. Thus, when I have the chance, as I do here, I will annihilate them completely and remain victorious throughout the ages. What could I offer you in exchange for their lives? Your star drive jump, Raylan said promptly as if waiting for the offer. That's a hard bargain. Nevertheless, if you bring the starship to my moon, I will let the last Adox flee the star system. Maddox pretended to ponder a moment. He nodded slowly. I provisionally agree with the idea. However, let's reverse the order. You let them go, and I'll bring the starship to you. Captain Maddox, I know you are stalling, making a false offer. You will not bring the starship in at that point, but flee with the Adox. No, my offer stands. It is the only one I will accept. Let me think about it. Your time for thinking is running short. Soon our missiles will saturate the planet. Then the other missiles will destroy the waiting spaceship. You see, I know the Adox have fled the planet and are awaiting some magic wand to save them. I understand what you're saying. I'm asking for time. Stop the attack and give me time to contemplate the possibility. Remember, this is worth a star drive jump to you. Raylan eyed the captain. No. But I have nothing further to say to you, Maddox. Jump to my moon and I will let the last Adox go. Otherwise, they will cease existence. The image of Ultimate Force Raylan disappeared. Maddox sagged back in his chair. Did you really think that would work? Ludendorff asked. Maddox didn't bother answering. He didn't think they could save all ten ships. The crew and the starship would not survive the strain. They'd saved 15,000 Adox so far. How many more could they save? The captain sat up. Then he pushed up to his feet. He turned to Ludendorff. How much physical punishment can you take? That may not be the issue, Ludendorff said. I think the missiles will smash the planet soon. After that, the ad hoc vessels will perish. We brought this on them, Maddox said. Galleon did, but so what? That makes no difference now. Galleon is a member of my crew, Maddox said. That makes me responsible for this. Ludendorff looked away, perhaps not having any more to add. Maddox blinked several times. He nodded. Mr. Maker, take us behind the first planet. Let's grab at least one more ad hoc vessel. Victory appeared behind the first planet. Hail the governess, if you would, please, Maddox said. Soon, Governess Ni Fong appeared on the main screen. So far, we have taken three ships to the edge of the nebula. 
Maddox said. Captain, please let me interrupt you. The missiles are pouring into the planet, and other missiles are circling it. We're running out of time. Governess, I suggest all your ships begin hard acceleration toward the star. Perhaps you can buy your fleet more time so I have time to save more ad hoc vessels. Ni Fong studied him. The process of bringing your ships to the nebula edge has been grueling to my crew and ship, Maddox said. I understand. I'll take your ship next. Ni Fong blinked several times. Yes, that would be good. Do you think this is the last one? I don't know, Maddox said, hesitating to admit that the crew was run ragged. They needed time, days, to recover from the ordeal. Whenever you're ready, Captain, the screen went blank. Maddox sighed, shaking his head. He felt awful, but he didn't know if he was willing to risk the starship or his crew in quick succession jumps after this. Even this jump might be too much. Mr. Maker, maneuver to the governess's spaceship. Aye, sir, Keith said. Victory moved near. As the starship did, the planet's beams knocked down missiles, masses of missiles, and it continued to launch counter-rockets at those missiles attempting to circle the planet. This was turning into a disaster. If this were the last ship they could save, 30,000 of the last Adox would perish to the mad, deified AIs. Why had Gallion said anything? Maddox shook his head. That wasn't the issue. Are we ready? Aye, Keith said. Yes, Andros told him. Jump, Maddox said. After too long of a time and labored engine noises and bulkhead shaking, Victory and the next ad hoc spaceship from the first planet made its leap from the cauldron of mass death to the edge of the star system and nebula. Chapter 96 Because he and others had been on the shuttles, Sergeant Riker easily made it. So did four out of the ten ad hoc spaceships that had left the first planet. As for the other six ships, the verdict was still out on them. After much pestering, Maddox let Keith use the fold fighter to go find out. Neither the starship nor the rest of the crew were in any condition to make another star drive jump anytime soon and that meant back to the first planet. Maddox doubted Keith's condition, but the pilot actually seemed better off than most. Was that due to his constant injections of anti-fold lag medicine? It might be worth studying. Later. Maddox saw Keith off in the hangar bay. Don't take any risks. You're just getting data for us. I understand. The ace took along an understudy, a warrant officer in the pilot program, so there would be two of them. Keith folded four times before he reached his vantage point to begin recording for study later. He had a long side view of the hot star, the first planet, and the missile stream and ponderous, fortress moons. The six ad hoc vessels accelerated for the star as they each began to widen the distance between them. The thinking seemed clear enough. At least one of them needed to escape the vengeful, deified AIs. The missiles were reaching nearer and nearer the first planet before the defenses destroyed them. Not all the surface beam cannons were working anymore, and the stock of counter-rockets must have vanished, because no more rose up to meet the enemy. That meant AI missiles were making it past the planet as they circled wide. Those were big suckers, each about half the size of a Star Watch destroyer. This is awful the co-pilot said, a stocky man with red hair and painfully youthful features. You're not kidding, Keith said. In the small fold fighter far from victory, the two men observed the horrible end of the first planet and the ad hoc passenger ships. Each vessel accelerated, and each built up a decent velocity for such a ponderous ship. By the time the ad hoc vessels reached 15 million kilometers from the first planet, the stream of missiles reached the surface defenses, and annihilated them with thermonuclear detonations. There were constant mushroom clouds billowing upward from the surface, churning dust and debris, sending much of it spaceborne due to the small planet's correspondingly minimal gravity. The great space river of missiles heading toward the planet now changed course. The masses of missiles rotated, using hard exhaust to slow down. No doubt the deified AIs would retrieve these for some future time, taking them back into the following fortress moons, the so-called ghost ships. 
A great number, nearly 300 missiles, went around the first planet as they headed for the six fleeing cargo vessels. Do we have to watch this? The red-headed co-pilot asked Keith. In wonder, Keith turned to the young warrant officer. You better believe we have to watch this, mate. We have to see events clear-eyed. This is reality, not some rosy story your grandmother spun for you. Out here, what is counts, not how you'd like it to be. The man who can see reality for what it is has strength. Don't be one of them sissies that can't even say forbidden words. Never mind closing your eyes to how the universe operates. What do words have to do with it? Keith laughed, shaking his head. Haven't you heard them types who say, oh, you can't say anything so mean, it hurts my feelings, I don't feel safe. You know the type I'm talking about. The co-pilot nodded. That's how a moronic ostrich works, Keith said. A what? A big old bird in Africa that sticks its head in the sand so it doesn't have to see anything that might frighten it. How does that help against a lion? It doesn't, Keith said. My point is this, don't be afraid of reality. If you must, man up and toughen up so you can handle it. The junior pilot nodded. Anyway, Keith said, that's my lecture for this mission. This is cruel work. Let's not add to it by shutting our eyes to what's happening around us or being frightened little mama's boys about things. Thus, Keith and the junior pilot remained in the fold fighter, recording each AI missile that reached a huge cargo ship and detonated. None of the fleeing adocs survived the butchery. Hey, look, the junior pilot said, pointing at a comm board. Someone is hailing us. Keith hurried to his pilot board. The message was coming from one of the fortress moons, meaning from a deified AI. Are you going to answer it? I am not, Keith said. I'm worried the bastard might be able to beam a virus into our computers. We're just a wee fighter. It's time to go home. They folded far beyond the third planet the first time, heading back for victory and the surviving four ad hoc cargo ships with the precious 20,000 living aliens. Chapter 97 Maddox did receive a last message from Ultimate Force Raylan. The deified AI sent it from between the second and third planets all the way to the edge of the star system, which was nearly 50 AUs away. One astronomical unit was the average distance from the sun to the Earth. The four ad hoc vessels and victory had almost reached the first gaseous tendrils of the nebula. They were building up velocity the old-fashioned way, through direct boost from the thrusters. Sir, Valerie said, there's a message for you. It's come from Raylan. Put it on the main screen, Maddox said. The holographic image of Ultimate Force Raylan appeared on the screen. It was good quality, too. I have learned that four ad hoc vessels escaped our vengeance, Raylan said. You are responsible for that, Captain Maddox. I am pleased to eliminate the ones we could but we shall never rest until the last adoc is eradicated. Perhaps you shall make it through the nebula. We shall see. If so, know that we deified AIs never forget or forgive a hurt. I will remember you. I will remember humans. Sooner than you think we shall come to you and finish our task. This I assure you. Thus, you have won a momentary victory only. Enjoy it while you may, Maddox, for the time of reckoning will be soon approaching. Professor Ludendorff happened to be on the bridge, and he moved beside Maddox as the message played. Once done, Raylan disappeared from the screen. Ludendorff glanced at Maddox. What is it now? asked the captain. Do you find it remarkable that so many aliens and others hate your guts? Raylan did not speak with hatred, Maddox said. No, asked Ludendorff. You don't take the idea that he and his ilk will hound you from here to eternity in order to slay you as something approaching hatred? Maddox shrugged. Ludendorff nodded. I, however, find your ability to enrage so many to be a fascinating topic. Maddox glanced again at the smug professor. Now that you mention it, 
I do think I possess one attribute that enrages so many. Yes, my ability to win against almost every contender, Maddox said blandly. Wouldn't you agree that's true? It was possible Ludendorff's facial muscles tightened just a bit. Do you call saving four out of ten Adox winning? Maddox heaved a sigh. It was fewer than I'd hoped. But well, we did save some. Clearly, it was enough to enrage Raylan, as you suggest. That must be worth a win in one sense. Ludendorff mumbled something under his breath before walking away, and soon heading out the exit hatch. Maddox glanced at the professor as he exited. Then Maddox looked at the main screen, observing their progress toward the nebula. Victory led the way into the nebula with the four great ad hoc vessels following. The compacted gases soon swirled around them, making sensor sweeps extremely limited. What do you plan for us now? Governess Nifong asked Maddox via the main screen a day into the dense cloud. Much depends upon you, Maddox said. If you'll permit me, I'd like to guard the convoy until we exit the nebula. Does the terrible swarm menace still threaten this part of the spiral arm? The swarm attacked your home world over 6,000 years ago. That sounds like an evasion to my question, Nifong said. Maddox explained a little bit about the Orion spiral arm and the abode of the swarm Imperium in the Sagittarius spiral arm. He went into further detail about the builder nexuses and that those in the swarm Imperium territory had been destroyed. Our old home world is viable then, Nifong asked. No. Maddox said. It's rubble. But we could offer you a new world in the Commonwealth of Planets. How can you afford to be so generous? Maddox explained something about the Commonwealth. They had plenty of planets, but not enough colonists. And you accept aliens, from your point of view, into your Commonwealth? Ni Fong asked. We have accepted individual aliens before. You would be the first entire society, Maddox said but there's nothing to prohibit it. In fact, I am sure I can convince our leaders. This is a test case, then? Maybe it is, Maddox said. Whatever you are, the Adox would be a welcome addition to the Commonwealth. Why is that? Because we on Victory have learned to love Driving Force Galleon, Maddox said. If you Adox are like him, I think our two races would strengthen each other. Governess Ni Fong appeared troubled and shortly cut the connection. The days lengthened into a week, and one week added to another. No one on the starship was eager to try more star drive jumps, pulling the adocs with them one by one. That had been an emergency measure, not one to perform more often than absolutely necessary. On the third week, Nifong agreed to use the Nexus from Earth once they exited the nebula. They would see what kind of planet Star Watch allocated them. If it were good enough, they would temporarily accept the new home. We Adox need help, Ni Fong admitted. And you've shown it to us, and for that reason, we will continue to trust you. I'm deeply honored, Maddox said. And once Galleon is restored, he will be pleased as well. Ni Fong looked shaken. You will awaken the AI then? Not until the proper time. Please, I implore you. Not until we're gone. As you wish, Maddox said. And despite further attempts on the topic, the result was always the same. The Adox had a great dread of the deified AIs, with obvious reason. In the end, it took a slow three months for Maddox and Victory to bring the last four Adox vessels out of the Glenna Nebula so they faced the Commonwealth of Planets. They were still in the beyond, but now Maddox could use the long-range builder comm device to call the Lord High Admiral on Earth and explain the situation. That talk soon took place, and Maddox filled in an anxious Lord High Admiral on the details. The alien maggot unity, the fusion of planets, a moray mercenary, a star system of adoc ghosts, and the lost adocs themselves, Admiral Cook said over the builder comm. You have been unusually busy this time, Captain. It was an adventure, Maddox said from the couch. You want us to open the way for you with the Nexus and allow the four ad hoc vessels into the Commonwealth? 
I think the Adox would be a great addition to us. I do too, Admiral Cook said. Others might feel differently. Still, I think we should push it through this time. I imagine you're wondering about what happened on Balder III. Oh, Balder III, he said, reminded. No, I'm not that interested about them anymore. We're going to move the Crowder people to a different planet in a different star system, Cook said, perhaps choosing to ignore the captain's dismissal. The situation is thus being resolved. You helped in achieving that. I'm glad to hear it, Maddox said. I'm much more worried about the maggot unity and the deified AIs in the Gowan system. Each could prove troublesome to us. We might think about opening trade and relations to the fusion of planets. They're humans, after all. With a dreadful-sounding socialist political system, Cook said, once I order the Nexus to open the way, I'll begin putting together a patrol team to head to the nebula and contact the fusion people. We'll see if they're interested in anything like you suggest. The nebula is a dangerous place, Maddox said. I would only go in strong and load it for bear. You do your part, Captain, and pray leave my part to me. Yes, Admiral, Maddox said. In any case, the Nexus should be ready in several hours. Are all the ships there ready to enter it? We're going to Earth, then? To the solar system, so our reps can speak with the Adox. This time, we'll give the refugees some choices as to the planet they go to. The Crowder people proved a headache and taught us a lesson about that. You're going to let the Crowder people mingle with others in the Commonwealth? Admiral Cook laughed, and it took him several seconds to cease. No, no, not mingle, but we will let them settle elsewhere in the Commonwealth. A team of psychologists, sociologists, and anthropologists has come up with a program for rehabilitating the Crowder people in a span of 15 years. It's rather exciting, but that isn't your concern now, I can see. How long until your flotilla is ready to travel? A few hours will suffice, Maddox said. I'm looking forward to coming home. No doubt, Cook said. Until I see you on Earth, Captain. Yes, sir. Until then.